So uh, we do want to get started and get everyone in their seats. And uh, we've got a lot of folks coming over the course of the day. So uh, I'll get us started. Good morning. I'm Lisa Freeman, Dean of the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences here at UIC. Welcome to the LAS Faculty Research Symposium on Drug Discovery. This is the third LAS Faculty Research Symposium. Our first two last year were focused on climate change in a connected world and migration in a world of walls and borders. We are absolutely thrilled to convene this event on drug discovery today, which includes UIC colleagues in the College of Pharmacy and UI Center, and to provide this opportunity to the faculty, staff, students, alumni, and friends to learn more about the latest advances in drug discovery here at UIC and at other institutions around the country. One of the great privileges of being the dean of, of a college as intellectually diverse as LAS is the opportunity to support and encourage some truly groundbreaking, cutting-edge research. And the topic of drug discovery is one that touches everyone's lives, whether they know it or not. This is the field that continues to bring us novel treatments for cancer, neurodegenerative and other chronic and deadly diseases. It is work that can extend life and improve quality of life, and UIC is home to many researchers and clinicians working in this area. We are honored to have with us today as keynote and plenary speakers some of the most influential and accomplished researchers in drug discovery. Our session chairs will introduce our speakers more fully but I would like to briefly thank them for being here with us, all of our speakers. Our keynote speakers, Dr. Dennis Leota and Dr. James Wells, are truly giants in the field, and we're grateful that they have made time to join us today. And thank you, too, to our plenary speakers, Drs. Matthew Disney, Paul Hergenrother, Brian Scheuchert, and Christina Wu, as well as the UIC faculty who are presenting today, Drs. Alex Adebekian, Yuri Polikanov, Tom Driver, Paul Carlier, and Juan Juan Cho. And speaking of Dr. Cho, he has been responsible for leading the planning and organizing of this amazing event and is the driving force for bringing these luminaries to our campus and convening this day. Thank you, Juan Juan, and to the entire organizing committee. Thank you, too, to Vicki Bolf in the dean's office and the rest of the LAS staff who have made this event possible. I'm deeply grateful and look forward to what we will all learn today. Without further ado, I will now th turn things over to Dr. Cho, who has a few announcements before we officially begin. Please enjoy the symposium. Thank you. I have a very quick announcement. First, uh, we have a very tight schedule, so speakers stay on time. <laughs> if you don't, we're going to have to help you do that. <laughs> yeah. All right. And for posters, uh, poster presenters, uh, award ceremony will be held in the reception after the, uh, e the afternoon session. So, you know. Stay in the reception, and uh, you know award is pretty generous. So uh, make sure that uh, you stay until the uh, award is announced. Also, uh, the Chicago Biomedical Consortium staff members are present here, and they have a table, and they would like to introduce you a new, a uh, exciting uh, NIH-sponsored uh, the, the grant program. So it's uh, like. NIH CVC uh, joint uh, grant program. So, you know, stop by uh, CVC booth if you're interested. In. And we're going to also have a photo session, two photo sessions after the morning session and after uh, afternoon session. So, uh, when photographer comes, uh, make sure that everybody stay and, and, and uh, take pictures. All right? So, thank you very much, and we're going to get right on to the uh, scientific program. Good morning, and uh, thank you all for coming. And after that somewhat menacing warning from Wama, I'll keep the introductions pretty short because we have a very tight schedule today, as he said. So um, 
that's probably good because all our speakers, I think, really need no introduction, including our first speaker, who I have the, the great pleasure of introducing. Um, so our first speaker is Paul Hergenrother, who's joining us from this small school to our south, uh, the U of I. Um, and uh, uh, it's really a great pleasure to introduce Paul um, because, as we all know, he's really been uh, at the frontier of antibacterial and anti-cancer drug, anti drug discovery, making some fantastic um, discoveries and really trying to rewrite the rules, quite literally, of uh, antibacterial drug discovery. Um, I can also speak that including uh, being a, a fantastic researcher, he's also a fantastic mentor, having served in his lab as a postdoc. So um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Paul, and so please take it away. Thank you, Andrew, and thanks uh, to the organizers and, uh, for having me. It's great to kick off this event in uh, Drug Discovery Symposium. And so I wanted to start by just uh, orienting people about drug discovery and, and some things that I think everybody knows. I think a key part in medicinal chemistry, chemical biology, drug discovery is just your starting point, finding how, how, to, how, to, how does one find an initial compound. And the standard method, and this is, we, we do this as well, is screening, right? And in such a screen, there's typically little consideration for things that are, are not hits. So something in these other wells, maybe they're truly not a hit, but maybe the compound degraded, maybe the compound was there at a low concentration, wasn't soluble, whatever. It doesn't really matter. One is typically looking to advance hits. Um, we've been taken with a, a different modality of, of screening and assessment of compound collections where we're doing ho holistic, what I call here, holistic testing of compound collections. So here, uh, all the biological uh, results are utilized. And so uh, this can be different things. So I'll talk to you today about accumulation in gram-negative bacteria. So where we're looking for both compounds that get in and, and don't get in. And so uh, for this type of work, it's essential to have quantitatively pure compounds. We know what they are. They're in there at the right concentration. And then our, our general workflow is shown here where we're making assessment of these compounds and then both the, say, accumulators and non-accumulators go through computational modeling and we are able then to correlate this uh, to, to traits that are important for accumulation. And so this is related to gram-negative bacteria and uh, these are uh, becoming, they are now, a big problem. Uh, e. coli, drug-resistant E. coli, has now surpassed staph. So MRSA, for a long time, was the big challenge for um, antibacterial infections. And in fact, four of the top five uh, killers are gram-negative uh, bacteria. Uh, the nature of gram-negative bacteria versus gram-positive really dictates this challenge. Gram-negative bacteria have this additional outer membrane, and so for compounds to get in, they typically have to co-opt uh, an ion channel that bacteria use to take up nutrients. It's very difficult to traverse, and then they're subject to efflux pumps, promiscuous efflux pumps. So the, the reality is there hasn't been a new class of uh, antibiotics approved by the FDA for gram-negative infections in over 55 years since fluoroquinolones. And this is directly related to this accumulation problem. There's plenty of compounds that are active if they could get in, uh, but they don't. And so there's a lot of blood in the, the water in this field and, and really kudos to our, our friends and colleagues in industry for publishing what are negative results. And, and these are uh, notorious to those in the field. So GSK published this paper about their experience of screening three million compounds. And these are, these are experts at this sort of thing. Multiple dozens of high throughput screening campaigns, zero, zero gram-negative leads. AstraZeneca, very, very similar and, and sobering story. A couple million compounds. Uh, and Merck uh, has reported similar things uh, at, at meetings. And so, um, it, it's apparent from this type of uh, 0 for um, 7 million that uh, one needs to, that probably different types of, of compounds and different types of strategies. I, I think the, the, the light at the end of the tunnel is that there's actually a lot of uh, uh, compounds through these types of screens and others that have been discovered that have a lot of potential. These are, are I show some here. 
uh, I call these gram-positive only antibiotics. So these are antibiotics that were discovered through screening that really interesting, you know, linezolid, uh, it's been approved, fusidic acid, you know, 20 million prescriptions worldwide per year. This compound's in phase two. This is disapproved uh, for gonorrhea. So interesting targets, compounds, none of them are active against gram-negative bacteria, but all of them would be if they could get in, okay? And we know this from permeability defect strains. So if you have strains of gram-negative bacteria that, you, that have a permeability defect in their outer membrane, these get in and kill quite well. And so they all would be active if they could accumulate. So what we wanted to do, we set out a number of years ago to do uh, a prospective study of compound accumulation. A lot of the work in the field was, was retrospective and was looking really at antibiotics, antibiotics looking at activity versus gram-negative and gram-positive and trying to divine um, kind of the types of compounds. We really wanted to divorce accumulation from antibacterial activity and just, just look at accumulation just really try to understand what traits compounds need to have to get into bacteria. And once we understood that, try to build those traits back in. And so this is our workflow that we've used. So the, the compound collection, and obviously it'd be critical uh, what that is, and I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, accumulation assay, so being able to measure accumulation in, in some fashion accurately. Uh, and then we use a, a random forest classification model to help us make sense of the results. So we're gonna get data about accumulators, non-accumulation, non-accumulators, and we're gonna let the computational modeling, machine learning, point us to physical chemical traits and then uh, apply these lessons. Okay, so from, from that work, from uh, industry colleagues, our, our instinct was that the typical large screening collection, uh, industry style, uh, was not gonna be suitable, so we have a we bought a collection of a couple hundred thousand compounds at, at UIUC. It's hard to generalize, but typically, and those of you that have done screening of such collections know this, the types of hits that one gets, you know, have low fraction of sp3 hybridized carbons, right? Uh, many rotatable bonds, very few stereogenic centers, usually zero or one, and certain functional groups are just underrepresented. And so our instinct was that we needed a, a very different type of compound collection to do this experiment. Uh, and this would be something more akin to a natural product like compounds. So here, uh, you, you can have compounds that uh, have high fraction sp3 hybridized carbons, okay? And more rigid ring systems, so contiguous and over, overlapping ring systems. This has multiple stereogenic centers and, and greater range of functional groups. So, of, of course, the reason that people screen such collections is you can buy them, right? You can buy a couple hundred thousand compounds. There's a whole cottage industry around selling uh, compounds. These are, there's hundreds of thousands of compounds in there because they're easy to make, typically from condensation reactions or cross-coupling reactions. And, and so the a much bigger challenge is how, how do you get to hundreds or thousand uh, natural product-like compounds? So we set off first to devise a strategy for the synthesis of, of these compounds, knowing that these would be input materials for our key experiment. Okay, so we, we call this uh, complexity to diversity, and I, I, we publish a lot on this, and I won't go into uh, it in great detail, but basically what we do is we take a complex natural product that we buy, okay, something we can buy 100 grams of or so, and we use strategic application of organic chemistry, typically limiting ourselves to five or fewer steps, to convert these compounds to things that look very different from the parent and from each other, okay? So these, we're, we're really interested in making different ring systems, different scaffolds, and ultimately getting to a, a collection, or what we view as a value-added collection of, of novel, uh, diverse compounds. So Mother Nature basically is giving us the complexity and, and we are uh, diversifying. So the natural products are starting point for complex molecule generation. And uh, we've done this now on uh, close to 10 natural products. So I, I show these here. There, there's dozens, probably 100 natural products that you can buy 100 grams of or, or more. Uh, and there's others that, that you could isolate if one wanted to do such a thing. And so you can see, and there's different ways that one can assess or think about complexity as chemists. I think we know it when we see it. but Fraction of sp3 hybridized carbons, stereogenic centers, of course, are big ones. Uh, we've done this now and have made uh, uh, over a thousand compounds in this way. 
okay, and, and uh, hundreds of, of different scaffolds. And uh, like I said, we've, we've published on this, and so I won't talk about the production of this compound collection. But this is a, a tangible resource. So we make these uh, quantitatively pure, uh, try to make 25 milligrams of each of these. This is our, um, our solid stocks. And of course, these go into uh, plates that we can use for high throughput screening. OK, so uh, Andrew uh, here w was part of, of this uh, initial story where we took, uh, and this was led by my former student, Michelle, took this collection of uh, complex and diverse compounds and assessed it for accumulations, uh, one at a time in gram-negative bacteria, in this case, E. coli. So uh, this assay we developed um, it is, I'd say, a little painstaking. It's not a, a high throughput assay by any means, but we can do 10, uh, 10 or more a day. And so we've done uh, hundreds and hundreds of, of these. From this, we see compound accumulators or non-accumulators. And uh, we use that random forest model. And this is basically uh, looking within Mo, um, uh, we can calculate 300 or more physicochemical traits of, for all the compounds. Okay, so these are things that you've heard of, such as hydrogen bond donors, acceptors, rotatable bonds, et cetera. But there's a lot of traits that are much more inscrutable, right? Things that you haven't heard of, vectors from positive charge to hydrophobic regions and, and things like that. So this is really useful for us. And from this, we defined uh, what we call the entry rule. So the entry rule stipulate that if a compound has an ionizable nitrogen, and our experience is that primary means are best, uh, a low three-dimensionality defined by this globularity parameter, and low rigidity defined by rotatable bonds, it has a high likelihood of accumulating in E. coli. And so because we made all of these compounds ourselves, we could uh, systematically alter them to test these uh, rules. So this is just a few examples where we have something like this um, with an ionized full nitrogen. This is a high accumulator. The, the uh, anionic or neutral compounds are, are not accumulators. Three-dimensionality, we use the globularity parameter, which is basically zero for benzene and one for adamantane. Okay, that's your scale. Things like this uh, are not uh, uh, accumulators, whereas something with low three-dimensionality is an accumulator. And then uh, rigidity, and we use this uh, for uh, defined by rotatable bonds. And so uh, compounds with a high rigidity or low rotatable bonds uh, tend to be accumulators. So the, the role of the primary mean is something that, that uh, we and others have spent a lot of time um, uh, working on both experimentally and then other groups have jumped in computationally. The, this is the, the porin channel uh, defined by others. And you can see in this constriction region here, this is lined with anionic residues. And so uh, all the molecular dynamic simulations and also experimental studies uh, indicate that compounds traverse this porn channel uh, mediated by this key uh, salt bridge between the positively charged amine and these anionic residues in the constriction region. So um, to help others use the entry rules, uh, my former student, uh, Brian Drown, who's now a professor at Purdue, uh, built this web app that we call Entryway, okay, Entryway. And um, as I like to say, it's so easy, even I can use it. So all you have to do is take your chem draw structure, you right click on it, you get the smile string, and you paste, paste it in to this web app, and it will output uh, your compound and compare it to the entry rules cutoff and predict whether your compound will accumulate or not. Okay, it's a free uh, web app. And there's been uh, a great uptake on this. There's been over a million compounds put through this uh, just in the first couple of years that this has been up. And so a, a great tool. And the idea with, with all of this is that instead of spending time making hundreds and hundreds of compounds to find the gram-negative active, you can make just a handful of compounds get to your lead candidate, which then you can optimize. OK, so of course, this is what we want to do. We want to uh, enable others to uh, make new antibiotics, but also ourselves. And so uh, we've done this in, in several different contexts, okay? So uh, we've, we've worked on all of these, really, but uh, I'll highlight uh, these three here. And, and Andrew did this. This was actually our first uh, conversion, taking this DNA gyrase inhibitor that uh, 
meets two of the three entry rule parameters, low accumulator, no activity in E. coli. Andrew appended a primary mean at a position where we knew the, um, the active site could tolerate this compound now meets the entry rule criteria as a, a high accumulation and a good activity in wild type E. coli. My uh, postdoc, Steve Motika, took this compound, ribosyl C. This is a really interesting compound. Hits uh, RNA target, FMN ribose switch, uh, discovered at Merck. Uh, they had uh, tried for years to make a gram-negative active version. What Steve did was, uh, again, append a primary amine. This compound now is a high accumulator and uh, potent against wild-type E. coli. Probably our one that is advancing uh, the farthest, has advanced the farthest, and is continuing to advance and seen uh, the farthest, has advanced the farthest, and is continuing to advance is this fatty acid biosynthesis inhibitor. So this compound, WO1452, is in uh, phase two for staph, super, super potent against gram-positive bacteria, MICs uh, 0 0.008, uh, no activity uh, against gram-negative. So this compound meets two of the three entry rule parameters. Uh, Erica Parker and Brett Kane in my lab uh, developed this first generation version. Again, we just, we got to this within three or four compounds. We call this W1452 amine. This compound now meets the three entry rule parameters. It's a high accumulator and uh, kills uh, wild type E. coli. This was then in collaboration with Deb Hung's lab at the Broad and uh, Walter Reed and also the NIAID uh, optimized, <coughs> sorry, to fabamycin. Okay, this is uh, the optimized version of this. Fabamycin, uh, at the Broad, we, uh, they solved the uh, X-ray structure of fabamycin with its target. Has a very, very low frequency of resistance, likely because it interacts actually with the amide backbone of uh, FABI. Uh, this compound uh, has a very low range in, in clinical isolates. So this is a 100 panel screen done at Walter Reed something like levofloxacin, where there's a lot of pre-existing resistance. You see strains that are very resistant, suggestive of, of no pre-existing resistance, as you would predict for a novel target. Uh, together with NIAID, they did this very sophisticated uh, urinary tract infection model, uh, mouse model uh, infection, compared to colistin. For those of you that know, colistin is, um, was actually removed from the market in the 80s because of toxicity. About 50 to 60% of patients get uh, nephrotoxicity that take it. Um, reinstated recently because uh, of the lack of options. Anyways, we compared it to colistin in this experiment, uh, fabamycin, uh, different dosing regimens, and uh, CFUs in the liver. So as I mentioned, this compound is advancing um, in, as the way antibiotics really need to in, in kind of a, a, a public-private partnership. The actionability of the entry rules, it's been great to see others uptake this, and so these are just, there's several dozen papers on the use of entry rules by, by others. I highlight uh, uh, several here where, you know, typically one uh, does this by appending an amine on a, a compound that doesn't have one, but there are examples where you can reduce rotatable bonds. This uh, one just came out uh, last week from uh, Merck. This is from Genentech, from Christian Nylander's lab, uh, Seth Herdon. Th this is a beta-lactamase inhibitor. Um, from University of Oxford that is advancing toward clinical trial. Okay, well, what, what about Pseudomonas? So Pseudomonas aeruginosa is a different type of bacteria, very challenging, and our experience was a variable application of the entry rules in Pseudomonas. So cer certain compounds that uh, meet the entry rules did accumulate in Pseudomonas, uh, but we had plenty of compounds that met the entry rules that were not effective against Pseudomonas. Uh, this was not too surprising to us. Pseud uh, e. coli has uh, general porins, okay, so a general porin that enables it to uptake uh, the nutrients it needs. Pseudomonas has a bunch of very specific porins, so 40 porins tend to be very, very sp specific for low molecular weight um, nutrients. And so uh, it wasn't clear that uh, there could even be uh, rules for uh, Pseudomonas. So uh, we set out to, and we just recently completed this story to redo this whole uh, workflow for Pseudomonas. And I give my uh, former student, Emily Geddes, a ton of credit for taking this on because at the outset, like I said, it wasn't clear that one could actually develop rules for Pseudomonas given uh, the, the diversity of, of mechanisms they use to take up um, nutrients. Okay, so uh, what we did for this, we expanded our compound collection. So we have a great collaboration with Roche. Uh, they gave us access to 21,000 compounds of, of their collection, okay? So this enabled us to both have natural product-like compounds from the complexity to diversity, but also compounds from Roche. So we selected 
150 uh, of these, um, and we put them through this accumulation assay. And, and so here's the initial results. So we assessed uh, close to 350 compounds. These are graphed according to C log D, which is not really relevant for accumulation. It doesn't matter too much what the C log D is. Uh, what we saw, again, was that neutral compounds, basically none of them accumulate. Uh, negatively charged compounds don't, uh, but positively charged compounds, certain ones uh, will indeed accumulate. And so uh, positive charge seems to be a significant factor uh, for accumulation in Pseudomonas. Uh, and so this, of course, invites comparison to the entry rules. So if we uh, look at something like E. coli, where a compounds with low globularity and rotatable bonds and a, a po positive charge, about 80% of those will accumulate. Uh, but same compound, same assay, 40% uh, in Pseudomonas. So we weren't capturing really what we wanted with the entry rules for Pseudomonas. Again, not surprising based on the bacterial physiology. Uh, so what we did is, is redid our random forest model. So again, taking our accumulators and non-accumulators and within Mo calculating uh, 300 plus physical chemical parameters for these compounds, developing this random forest classification model, again, where the uh, com uh, computationally looking at traits correlated with accumulation and not non-accumulation and then interpreting it. And so what the random forest model pointed us to was traits uh, associated with degree of positive charge, which uh, we knew, but also hydrogen bond donor surface area. And so we could validate when we get traits suggested by the machine learning, we validate these by side com by side by side comparison. So formal charge was something that was suggested by the machine learning model. So here's an example where we can modulate formal charge and uh, this compound is a high accumulator, this one is not. Again, uh, structurally related compounds, uh, this compound is a high accumulator, higher formal charge, uh, this one is not. Based on a number of these comparisons, we established a formal charge cut, out, cut off at greater or equal to 0 0.98. Hydrogen bond donor surface areas, again, is one of these less scrutable parameters. It's the sum of the van der Waals surface area of hydrogen bond donors. Um, and, and again, one can, uh, can calculate this and, and see the importance of, of this parameter in side-by-side -side, uh, comparisons uh, uh, shown here and uh, also uh, shown here. Uh, based on uh, this, we established this hydrogen bond donor surface cutoff. And so if we look at the, uh, the, um, the graph then of, of hydrogen bond donor surface area versus formal charge, there's a green box here uh, that where if a compound is in that uh, green box, about 80% of those compounds will uh, accumulate in, in pseudomonas. And so this formed an actionable uh, set of guidelines and, and rules. Um, and, but we were, we were scratching our heads and trying to understand the molecular basis of this um, because of this thing with the m multiple porins and we weren't sure how, how compounds could uh, interact with those in, in this way. At this time we saw this paper from Dirk Bunman at the University of Basel and what he did, uh, Dirk developed these strains of pseudomonas including one that had all porins knocked out, so delta 40 strains, so every porin is knocked out. What Dirk did then was to assess antibacterial activity in these strains, and, and what he saw was very striking, and it's in this title, antibacterial activity seems to be independent of porins. So with the exception of the carbapenems, which do seem to go in through porins, really one doesn't see an MIC chain. And this started to make sense to us, thinking of, of the self-promoted uptake pathway in uh, Pseudomonas as possibly the reason for our own uh, accumulation. Antibiotics are leveraging it, and so uh, these non-antibiotics, uh, we thought, are as well. And so we assessed a subset of our compounds. Dirk was nice enough to send us his strain. This is the parent strain and the Delta 40. And indeed, that we were really um, interested and, and uh, surprised to see that there's no difference in accumulation. So in, in, in Pseudomonas, these compounds are not going in through porin, but instead leverage the so-called self-promoted uptake pathway. And so... Uh, a poor and independent mode of uptake, which enables us to define uh, more general, uh, generalizable rules. So you can see that these are uh, uh, applicable. So compounds, uh, we can just look back. This was a Genentech compound and compounds that are not active versus those are, are active. Uh, and you can see this across a, a number of different uh, target uh, chemotypes, uh, drug classes, this is a tetracycline, 
Um, and, uh, and we converted also in this manuscript fusidic acid to a version uh, that has gram-negative activity. And so uh, we're uh, interested and in, uh, continue to, to apply uh, these rules. So entry rules for uh, E. coli, these seem to work for Klebsiella and uh, Acinetobacter as well. This is through uh, PORNs. For an independent accumulation, so this is a self-promoted pathway uh, for Pseudomonas. We're calling these the passage rules, Pseudomonas originosa, self-promoted um, uh, entry. Okay, so in the last uh, 10 minutes or so, I want to tell you a story about uh, in a more standard uh, screening manifold, and this is an uh, anti-cancer story that we're really uh, intrigued by and uh, excited by. The, the thing that we've been um, really focusing on in, in um, anti-cancer work is you know, the, the, the challenge is always, like I said at the beginning, how do you identify a hit and what compounds are worthy of continued pursuit as far as trying to understand their mode of action but also advancing them translationally. And something that we've really latched on to is this selectivity in cell culture, okay, for s killing certain cancer cell lines over others. So as opposed to things like, say, Taxol and Vincristine that kill everything, we're really prioritizing compounds that have a, a considerable selectivity in cell culture. And you can see this in target therapies that are out there. So bemorafenib is uh, V600D mutant BRAF inhibitor. And if you look at, this is just cell death now, okay, different cancer cell lines. And these are um, cell lines that have the V600E mutation. They're very sensitive to this compound, IC50 is a 50 or 100 nanomolar. Other cell lines don't respond at all, okay? Gleebeck, of course, is a poster child for targeted therapy. Uh, this compound, again, very, very sensitive in cell lines that are driven by bcr able translocation, you know, uh, below uh, sub-nanomolar and, and really no activity against these other cancer cell lines. So, of course, these compounds were discovered in building ki specific kinase inhibitors. But what we're looking to do is, in a phenotypic screening sense, try to identify compounds that have such a selectivity to us that portends uh, translational success and also novel modes of action, okay? And so uh, we've set up a, a system at the University of Illinois. Of course, we have our own uh, compound collection that I alluded to, and we have others. And more recently, we've um, built this device where we can it's not all the way up yet, but when up and running, supposedly it'll be able to assess 100 compounds against 100 cancer cell lines simultaneously. Right now, it's very challenging for students, those of you that do this, even you know, getting up and running three or four cancer cell lines. Uh, and so this, I think, will solve a lot of those problems where we can assess compounds, thousands of compounds against hundreds of cancer cell lines. Um, we've had an initial success story with this kind of screening and thought process. This is a compound that we call Urso TFPY. Uh, I'll tell you about this, selected for ear alpha positive breast cancer cells. This has been a, a really amazing work by my former student, doc, Dr. Matt, Matthew Boudreau, and my colleague in UIUC uh, biochemistry, uh, David Shapiro. And so uh, estrogen receptor positive breast cancer was really the first uh, type of cancer that was one of the first anyways treated as a, with targeted therapy. So, one can block estrogen synthesis, so these are aromatase inhibitors. Um, uh, one can uh, block the estrogen receptor, these are serms such as uh, tamoxifen. And then uh, the these are SERDs, fulvestrin is one of the original degraders, degrader of the estrogen receptor. These compounds are, are frontline uh, therapy, but um, as we know, they are uh, not perfect, certainly. Even in cell culture, you can see these are cytostatic, so they don't really kill. Uh, this invariably leads to resistance, including mutation in the estrogen receptor. And now that's a challenging situation. Those cancers are no longer driven by estrogen, so blocking estrogen doesn't work. Estrogen receptor mutation on cell growth is on uh, in the absence of estrogen. Uh, and, um, and these compounds, you know, the, the, the lack of efficacy is translated in, in animal models. So even the, this is fulvestrant, and this is, I just pulled from the literature, but even the, the kind of most recently approved combinations are static in, in animal models, and uh, you, you, you really don't see uh, regression in these types of experiments. Okay, so the, the big challenges then are lack of cell kill leads to these mutations. These are the key mutations in the estrogen receptor. 
This leads to metastatic disease, met metastasis to the brain, very, very challenging situation, eight month uh, or less survival. So the interesting thing to us is the estrogen receptor is still expressed in, in these tumors. So this was a patient uh, before and after treatment. You can still see the staining for estrogen receptor. This now has a, a mutation, okay? And so now it does not respond to endocrine therapy. But the ideal therapy would be one where uh, you could take advantage of both the wild type and the mutant. Okay, so my colleague Dave Shapiro in, in, uh, in screening our collection found this compound BHPI. This compound was really interesting to us as it, it had great selectivity for estrogen receptor cancer cells in culture. It had uh, a number of other problems as far as wasn't really cytotoxin, toxic, uh, no blood brain barrier penetrance. So my student, Matt Boudreau, worked and, and made um, several dozen versions and hit upon uh, this compound here. I show the racemic mixture here. This is a flow cytometry assay in uh, ER positive breast cancer cells. And what I show is cell death. So you can see um, tamoxifen, fulvestrin, no cell death, BHPI, the progenitor compound, no cell death. But this compound does indeed kill. Uh, we were able to separate the enantiomers and, and came to this compound that we call Urso. So this was our, our first generation compound. This compound is uh, really remarkable in, in many senses. So the, the, all the activity resides in this enantiomer. And this is just a crystal violet stain. Again, BHPI, fulvestrant, uh, tamoxifen. This compound uh, uh, against um, these breast cancer cells, IC50 of about uh, 20 nanomolar uh, in culture. The thing that's interesting to us is the selectivity in cell culture. So again, uh, I show here a, a flow cytometry assay looking at ER positive MCF7 cells and ER negative MBA232 cells, where we see very potent cell kill in, uh, in this cell line and, and no cell death in, in the ER negative cell line. And as I'll show you uh, in a second, this is consistent across uh, 30 plus cancer cell lines. This is a kind of phenotype that we really like and, and want to chase down. So we can make this compound uh, on scale and very easily, a uh, lithium halogen exchange, nucleophilic attack, and then a cradle craft type alkylation to give us the racemic mixture. Uh, we can separate this. We have a, a prep chiral HPLC, prep column, uh, that we can put several hundred milligrams over. Uh, this has been licensed, and our CRO has done this on a, a kilogram scale. So uh, this, uh, this preparatory separation is uh, viable on, on a commercial scale. So this is the assessment of Urso against uh, uh, several dozen cancer cell lines. And, and so these are uh, estrogen receptor positive uh, cell lines, and these are ER negative cell lines. So I see 50 in cell culture, 33 nanomolar versus uh, 12 micromolar. And I'll just point you to a few things. So these cell lines here are mutant cell lines. So cell lines that have the estrogen receptor mutation. Uh, these cell lines are ovarian cancer and other, other uh, cancers where endocrine therapy is typically not useful. And then these are very low expressors. So uh, this is where, uh, you know, we can't even see it in this BT20 until we overexpose it and, and it's still sensitive. Okay, so the, the remarkable thing about these compounds is their activity in vivo. And I'll just close with this data. So um, this is a, a standard mouse model MCF7 uh, treatment. Uh, with fulvestrant, uh, don't see much. This is ur urso, oral urso once a day, 10 megs per kg, 40 megs per kg, and we have uh, basically full tumor eradication in this experiment. Uh, this is now the mutant, so we can um, uh, form tumors. These are uh, luciferase tagged, and so three treatments were down 92%, 99% regression at seven days. We stopped treatment at day 21 and let the mice uh, monitor the mice and we see no tumor regrowth. In this manuscript, we did this in uh, 10 plus of, of these orthotopic models. The, this is a metastatic model. Again, this is the mutant cell line. We tail vein inject. And so these cells will form tumors at lots of different sites. So the lung, bone, head, uh, and then we treat uh, with Urso. Again, uh, we can't detect uh, any cells with this very sensitive imaging. Uh, this is a brain met model, so where we implant these cells in, in the brain. So our, our measured blood brain barrier uh, penetrance is 42 to 58. Uh, we intracranially implant these cells. Uh, oral or so, we retard tumor growth. We don't induce regression, but injection, we're down uh, close to 90%. Uh, and then this is a patient derived xenograph. And so a CRO did this to us, uh, did this for us, where 
Uh, you can get a chunk of a tumor from a patient. This was a patient that was fulvestrant resistant, low ER expressor, uh, mutant cell line, or mutant uh, uh, cell population. And again, you can see uh, fulvestrant, tamoxifen, or so 10 mg per kg, oral, or so 40 mg per kg. Uh, and again, um, uh, six of, of 10 mice uh, had total eradication. We started thinking about, I mean, the compound is quite remarkable, and, but thinking about 2.0 versions, the nature of medicinal chemistry, of course, is there's always a, another compound out there. And, and a couple of the things that we noted about this is a time-dependent, what I call time-dependent erosion in ER alpha-dependent selectivity. So at six or 24 hours, we see this big window between ER positive and ER negative. But as we go to longer times and culture, some of these cell lines start to become sensitive in a way that we didn't really understand. The other thing is, is IV injection of Urso at, at the MTD, oral, we can give mice uh, huge amounts, but IV 20 mg per kg in mice or 10 mg per kg in rats, we had an MTD. And so I think the obvious optimizable parameter was the lipophilicity. So this is measured by C log D. And so this was a, a little bit high and we wanted to have a, a lower C log D, which would be associated with less promiscuous uh, activity. And so um, this B ring was a, an optimizable position for us. Uh, Matt and, and my student Michael made a, a number of N-linked versions and hit on this difluoropiperdine, okay, as a racemic mixture, this compound is an IC50 of 35 nanomolar, this um, uh, enantiopure compound, urso DFP, 17 nanomolar, and then uh, ultimately optimized this compound, urso TFPY, four nanomolar IC50 in culture, single enantiomer activity. Uh, this compound now, uh, uh, as opposed to urso, where we see this erosion in activity, this we can go for, um, three days, five days, seven days, and see this huge uh, window. This compound's now tolerated in mice at 150 mg per kg IV. And so this enabled us to do these experiments where we treat mice a, a single time. So we've been treating mice once a day or once a week. And so with this compound now, we said, well, what if, what if we just treat mice uh, a single time, single dose? Uh, and so uh, in this initial experiment, we grew tumors like we normally would to about 300 cubic millimeters treated with fulvestrant, according to its normal schedule, single dose of Urso 1550, uh, Urso TFPY 1550 or 100 mg per kg, and uh, we saw a complete tumor regression. And so you can see the, the mice at the beginning and the end of the experiment. So then we said, what, what about uh, these tumors here? So these mice, these vehicle mice, so huge tumors, 1500 uh, cubic millimeters. What about these mice? Would they respond? So we took these same mice, and these have these really uh, massive tumors, 50 mg per kg dose of uh, Urso TFPY, and we saw this uh, amazing uh, tumor regression. And it doesn't go all the way to zero, but if we dose them again, it, it does go to zero. And so we've really been thinking about, I mean, the compound is an hour or so half-life in mice, and so how, do, how does a compound that has a short half-life in mice induce this regression over the course of several weeks? So we did this experiment, we grew tumors about 500 cubic millimeters treated, and then sacrificed the mice at one, five, and 14 days and harvested those tumors. And again, you can see the remarkable uh, response, even at, at day one uh, to Urso, TFPY, uh, day five, and, and day 14. And so we've just been getting this data back, so we're looking for uh, immune infiltration, cell death, et cetera, and, and trying to understand this pr um, pronounced in vivo effect. So the, the mode of action of this compound, so uh, there's, there's certain things that we know and there's certain things that we, we don't know. So we know that the compound induces a, a really profound uh, calcium release from the endoplasmic reticulum very, very quickly. Uh, we did a, a whole genome CRISPR screen, uh, published this last summer showing that this TRIP-M4 channel is essential for activity. Uh, sodium uh, um, comes in, uh, water uh, comes in, you get cell swelling and cell death. The upstream part of this is still unknown. I mean, we, we know the, the correlation with estrogen receptor alpha. There's a complex that we think it forms with CERC and, and phospholipase C leading to IP3 uh, release and stimulation of this channel. Those details we're still working out. So the mode of action uh, via proteomics, we did this PRISM screen, which is great. I really recommend this. If you have an anti-cancer 
drug, the Broad, for $10,000, they'll screen it against uh, 1,000 cell lines, and you get a very high-quality data set back. All the dependencies, TRIPM4, jumped out. Uh, obvious to us in this, which was good since we had already um, discovered that. But the translation of this is, has, uh, is going forward. So this is compound and classes changed hands back and forth and is now um, owned by Oncotech. Uh, they've announced uh, their plans to do a phase one clinical trial in, in women with breast cancer um, in the summer of 2025. Okay, so that's what I wanted to say. Uh, I've mentioned the, the people that have done this throughout. This is a really uh, amazing and talented group of students. I'm grateful to, to all my uh, collaborators and funding agencies. Uh, and thank you again uh, for the opportunity to speak. I'd be happy to take any questions. Yeah, thanks, Paul. Um, great talk. Uh, maybe we have time for a couple questions. Sorry, can you use the mic for the people on the live stream? Yeah, thank you. That was a very interesting um, talk. Um, I'm curious to, for the, anti, the antimicrobial compounds, um, how, how does putting the positive charge, how do you think they actually get into the cells? And did you investigate whether there's still efflux pump substrates or that sort of hinders that? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, definitely efflux is still limiting for many of these. And that we've redone our whole uh, workflow with efflux, trying to understand how to evade efflux. So, um, so the primary immune uh, does not re uh, result in efflux evasion. We think it really helps the influx. Yeah, thanks. Good question. Uh, great talk, Professor. I had a question about the compounds that you selected from those rules, entry and passage. So did you try to isolate resistant mutants against the compounds that you prepared from these rules? Because I was curious how easy it is for the bacteria to become resistant to these new compounds. Yeah, the, the, you know, with antibiotics, the resistance one sees is almost always on target, and that facilitates target identification that's so hard in, in anti-cancer. It's really easy in antibiotics, and so one uses it as a confirmation of the mode of action. So FABI inhibitors, we see mutations of F FABI. Andrews gyrase inhibitors, we see mutation in gyrase, ribosyl, same thing. The, the, sometimes I get asked about porin mutations, and, and the interesting thing, when you, when you mutate the porin, it actually opens it up and allow, and we've seen this experimentally. And in the clinic, you know, the, to, to other antibiotics, sometimes, There'll be small changes in forms, but that's not typically seen. It's almost all on target mutation. So, uh, there, there, another one over here? Over there. Here, can you use the mic? Sorry. It's so loud. Uh, sorry. Have you looked at Urso uh, compared to Elisestrin and also? with and without a CDK4, 10? So we haven't, I, I'm not sure if you mean in, in, uh, in, in mouse models or, yeah, yeah I, mean it, I mean in mouse models the compound works so well that it's, it's uh, we, so we haven't done that. With the progenitor compound they did look at in ovarian models in combination. I think, you know, the, the, maybe the future in the clinic is, is combination, but we have to do different mouse models where you won't see such profound single agent activity. Yeah, so I think that's something still to do. Okay, maybe one more from Jim. Paul, that was a great talk. I wondered in, in the first part, where you're looking for compound accumulation in bacteria, do you also look for compound accumulation in mammalian cells? Because you probably don't, I guess you don't want that. And I also wondered, um, you know, some people would see primary amines as a potential ERG channel problem. Yeah. But, uh, and I guess you screen for that as well. Yeah, 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 I get asked that a lot. <laughs> so there, there's a lot of drugs that have primary means, 7.8%. Uh, uh, so primary means themselves aren't problems. There's a lot of antibiotics that have primary means uh, shown here. Um, but, um, you know, the, the interesting thing about, about mammalian cells, I mean, a, a lot of the antibacterial targets are typically orthogonal, right? So like gyrase inhibitors, you do see, that's why you have black box warnings for Cipro. It will get into mammalian cells, but like FABI, it's a totally different fatty acid biosynthesis pathway. So there's not really a priority on uh, avoiding mammalian cells just based on the orthogonal nature of the targets. Of course, they have off-target effects. That's, that's where the, the med chem comes in. Yeah. 
With that, um, please join me in uh, thanking Paul for kicking us off strong. Maybe in the interest of time while uh, our next speaker gets set up, I'll just introduce him from down here. So I have uh, the pleasure of introducing our next speaker, uh, Professor Matt Disney, who's joining us from what was Scripps, Florida. I forget the, the actual name now. Um, but uh, you, you know, his group uh, for, for a very long time has really been instrumental in uh, performing research at making RNA a, a real drug target, you know, moving past just proteins. Um, and so I think we're in for a, quite a, a treat here. Um, telling us about uh, his research. So please take it away. Thanks, now. Andrew. Thank you. Uh, really pleasure to be here. Um, really am amazing to talk after Paul. Really amazing work by you and your group, Paul. Congratulations on that. I really hope, you know, one of the things about science uh, that I want to talk about here is what's amazing is to see your students really uh, develop and work on areas that are really important to people. I mean, that's why we're all here. So I'm going to talk about using uh, RNA as a vehicle to train people in my lab. And so I think all of us that are in academics, the main thing that we produce is the people. And uh, the science is the vehicle for doing that. And uh, I start my talk by saying all this because now we're in a day, an age, where we don't sort of embrace the diversity of people as much as I think we should have. And us as scientists, we're tackling really difficult problems. And the way that we do that is we all work together. And so, um, I, many of you that have heard me talk before, first off, my apologies. Uh, second off, as I start off, you know, I'm one of seven kids uh, from Baltimore, and every time when I go home at Thanksgiving, I realize that my brothers and sisters don't have the perspective that I have that's given by working with people like Sai Vilagapudi, who's from India. So Sai was an original graduate student lab. Uh, I'll talk about the work that he did to develop computational methods to identify folded RNAs and ligands that bind to those RNAs. Um, they didn't get uh, to talk to people like Raphael Benhamu, who's a faculty member now at the University of Jerusalem, nor people like Amir, uh, who's from Iran, or Zainab, who's an Iraqi refugee in the United States. And I think that's all, always really important, and it's especially important nowadays given that I'm talking about RNA, which we're in an era now where RNA is both, has been both the disease and the cure, right? SARS-CoV-2 has an RNA genome. Uh, the vaccines uh, are made of RNA. And we wouldn't have been able to do that, or I, I say the we, of course, you know, it's BioNTech and the companies that produce those medicines without decades of work that was funded by the U.S. taxpayer. So we should all thank, be grateful for the U.S. taxpayer for funding basic research, because you don't know when the application is going to occur, which includes figuring out how uh, T7 RNA polymerase, what its sequence is by Bill Studier at Brookhaven, Aki Uhlenbeck and his group figuring out how to use templates for DNA, which were synthesized by Marv Carruthers and the students in his lab to make the vaccine. And I'm not even talking about last year's Nobel Prize. All right, so that's important. Now I want to talk to you about RNA. RNA is my, it's easy to spell, hard to drug. So if we look at the human genome, one of the things when I was a graduate student is they published the draft of the Human Genome Project. And one of the most striking things for me, given that I was a graduate student studying how RNA folded, is that it turns out humans have a lot less open reading frames than you, you would expect. Um, in fact, and this is broad strokes, but the number, the amount of your DNA in terms of base pairs that makes protein is about 1%, yet the amount of your DNA that gets made into RNA is about 80%. And so these and other studies have shown that RNA plays very important and fundamental roles in biological processes, including things like deciding your sex. So RNA, non-coding RNA exists, will silence a chromosome. Uh, Non-coding RNAs do a whole bunch of things, including affecting splicing isoforms and integrating with proteins that can do things like allow you to have a higher affinity binding form of hemoglobin to take oxygen from your mother when you're inside of her, right? RNA is a very important 
biomolecule, and I think it's really important in terms of drug discovery, in part because, you know, I'm starting by the basic science of RNA, which I think is, you know, really important. There's one, one more thing I want to say. If you go and look at organismal diversity and you look at open reading frames, actually the diversity of organisms better scales with uh, the number and sequence of non-coding than coding RNAs. Right, so I told you about my history. My best friend growing up, not surprisingly, was the family dog. And uh, if you wanted to figure out if it was my hair or the dog's hair, you'd look at the non-coding RNAs. <laughs> All right, and so RNA also plays, I sort of told you about SARS-CoV-2, but influenza has an RNA genome. RNA plays really important roles in a wide variety of diseases, uh, from cancer to diabetes to heart disease. And, and also, the most common forms of adult onset muscular dystrophy and also ALS are caused by toxic RNAs that are inherited within families. And so given all this, when we um, started out uh, in the lab in 2005, we had a, what we wanted to do was figure out how we could take genome sequence and be able to determine RNAs that are folded and very rapidly pivot to making a probe for those RNA targets. And what we really wanted to do, given the complexity of the problem that I in illustrated in the beginning, is he wanted to develop an omics-like approach to enable small molecule discovery for RNA targets. And this can not only allow us to put forward, you know, potential insights into making medicines that target human RNAs, but also can help us to study the biology that RNA plays. And this is not, you know, uh, necessarily a new thing, where one would want to take a genome and figure out the RNAs that cause a disease and make a medicine. So I introduced ALS at the beginning of this, and so Bob Brown and his group, Bob Brown's now at UMass, uh, they discovered that mutations in superoxide dismutase cause about 1% or less uh, cases of ALS. And so that was discovered or published in Nature uh, March 4th in 1993. I was still well in high school at that point. Um, I need to stop this because now you're like, how? Oh, all right, that's, anyway. So despite that uh, work, it took 30 years for an FDA-approved antisense oligonucleotide medicine to treat these patients. Uh, that was April 25th of 2023. But this is really important because you can demonstrate in the case of ALS, which I would say is probably one of the worst diseases you can get because you're mentally there, but your body is uh, disintegrating. Uh, where people are able to have this gene to RNA to paradigm. And this is an antisense oligonucleotide that targets the mutant form of SOD that recruits ribonuclease H to degrade it. And so what our overall goal was we wanted to figure out if we could determine RNAs that not just had a sequence that would have a biological implication that could cause a disease, but RNAs that had a structure that would have a biological role that caused the disease, and then be able to rapidly use computational approaches to not just identify those toxic or those RNA structures that cause toxicity, but also to be able to identify lead compounds and optimize compounds that could bind to these structures to modulate their function. And so if we wanted to do this in sort of an omics-like scale, we thought that there were three general problems uh, that we needed to try and address. And so one is we need to identify at scale uh, small molecule RNA binding partners. And so I, I paid attention to all the work that Paul had done even when he was a postdoc with, with Stuart. That'll be, I think, maybe two slides from now. Then once we could, if we could identify at scale small molecule RNA binders, we needed to then use computation to identify if there were biological targets that these compounds could bind. And then we could figure out ways to affect function. Um, now, I, what we wanted to do is we wanted to have an unbiased way to try to use computation to find what could be RNAs that could be bound with a small molecule and new ways to perturb function. And so one of the bigger problems that we had going into this that we had to address is the selectivity. So RNA is only built of four bases. We'll come hopefully back to this at the end. And so there is a perception, which I believe probably is not 100% reality, like most perceptions, that RNA couldn't form thermodynamically stable structures within human RNAs, and those structures couldn't be bound specifically with small molecules. 
And so in order to address identifying binding partners, we looked at uh, selection or evolutionary uh, approaches where what we could do is we would take libraries of RNA structures like here. This is in one uh, unimolecular hairpin structure where in um, this light green, each N is a mixture of A, C, G, and U. And this is four to the sixth or 4,096 combinations. And we would label this RNA and we would basically hybridize this library for small molecule ligands to try to identify members of the library that would bind to a ligand in the presence of massive excess of these unlabeled competitor oligonucleotides, which mimic the constant region in this library. And so the way that we did that initially is it's very easy, I think, for you to understand in the era of next generation RNA-seq how we could encode and decode bound RNAs. You just sequence the binders. But how would we be able to encode and decode the small molecules? So initially what we did, and this is work uh, that Paul did with Stuart when he was a postdoc, is we used small molecule microarrays. And so what that allowed us to do is we could then spatially encode compounds on a surface. So we would take a glass microscope slide and we would spot this would be compound one, uh, this is compound 16, this is compound uh, whatever, I get a 12, right. so you gotta do math when I do this. This is compound one, this is compound six, compound 12, compound 18. All right, and then we'd hybridize, the, hybridize this with our labeled library in the presence of unlabeled competitors and basically where that signal was on a spot, it would tell us that a small molecule that we knew where it was based on its position on the array was binding to some member of this library. And then what we could do is, and we developed all the informatics for this because there wasn't informatics at the time, we could then excise all of the RNAs bound to each one of these spots and then subject it to next generation sequencing. And what that allows us to do in an unbiased way is to survey the landscape of two, two I think, really important Things. One is, what are the types of RNA structures that can bind a small molecule specifically? And if we have a diverse enough library, which, you know, we continue to increase the diversity, what are the types of small molecules you can get that can bind RNA with high affinity and specificity? And that next generation seq for each one of these, it not just identifies what binds, we can then use uh, sequencing, where I'll just very rapidly tell you what this means, but I'll come back to it later, is we can do next generation sequencing of our starting library, so we know based on a million reads what's the frequency of all 4,096 members, so we know what's the bias in being able to deconvolute by sequencing. And then we can compare those frequencies in the unselected library to the RNA motif frequencies in the selected library, and if something has a higher frequency in a selected than a starting library, it's gonna be higher affinity. And we know all the scores in between. And so by doing this, we've been able to find new RNA targets by using computation where we can show that you can inhibit protein binding to RNAs in cells and you can have an impact in their biology. You can inhibit translation. You can actually, this is one of the advantages of RNA targeted small molecules, as many of these non-coding RNAs actually repress translational events so if you inhibit the repressor, you can increase translation. So we, I'll show you this in, in a slide today where you can we use a RNA binding small molecule to increase translation. We can also affect epigenetics. So Sami Jaffrey, who's at Cornell Weill and I, we're developing methods to target uh, CGG repeats in Fragile X syndrome. And by using chemical probes that target those repeats, we could understand that was, there was a RNA-induced epigenetic modulation that silenced FMRP which is the single gene, only known single gene cause of autism in patients, children that have fragile X syndrome. And we can degrade, I'll tell at the end, degrading, destroying RNA with small molecules, which has many different flavors. Okay, but in this assay, we have to basically spatially encode by using microarrays positions on a chip. And that can be very laborious. And so we worked for quite a while with my colleague, Brian Pagel, in collaboration with my group and, and Raphael Benhamu's group, where what we did is we asked the question, could we encode the binding molecule not in this position on the surface, but could we encode it in a DNA tag? Okay, and so what we did is we built DNA encoded libraries using the expertise that Brian developed, but we did it in a manner where we did this on solid support. So what we do is we have um, a solid, oh, there it goes, we have this solid support where the solid support is about 10 microns in diameter. 
And then about 1% of the molar loading onto this bead is the DNA tag, where we can literally encode this red module, the green module, and the blue module. Now, we've done a lot of DNA-encoded compound screening over many years for nucleic acid targets, and it turns out that's very difficult to pull off, in part because in the standard DNA-encoded uh, library format, you have in solution a DNA tag coupled to a small molecule binder. And when you're screening nucleic acid targets, or any target for that matter, but it's amplified with screening nucleic acid targets, if you have any nonspecific interaction with that ligand and the DNA tag that it's appended to, or that DNA tag itself binds the nucleic acid, you can't do an affinity selection. And so what we then did is we could hybridize uh, this solid phase DEL with uh, our RNA libraries. And so we did it in a way where we coded what we wanted, the three by three library in blue, a DY647, uh, and then in red, a base paired RNA. And then because these, compound, these beads are 10 microns in diameter, we could basically do affinity selection across a flow cytometer. And so each one of these dots is a bead that we pass on a flow cytometer. And then we can score how much does it bind to the base paired RNA versus how much does this compound bind to the uh, RNA motif library. And then what we can do is we can gate it. And so we say collect each one of the beads individually in this position. And then we can collect them and use DNA sequencing to then identify what are the compounds on the bead and what are the RNAs that are bound to the bead bound by the compound. And by doing this, we're, here's three ligands of many, many, many ligands. Um, that, what's the numbers game here? Oh, it's three times 10 to the eight interactions that we screen in this. So it's pretty diverse library versus library screen. Here's some examples that we have. So these are very simple compounds. We've advanced beyond these. But one of the advantages with DNA encoded libraries versus say mass spec deconvolution of compounds is you can use a DNA tag to encode stereo center, right? So what we're able to do is we found these compounds that the S, S stereo center were bound, but the R basically did not. And then here's our affinity landscape. That's based, this Z-OB scores a higher frequency in the selected library it's these compounds versus uh, not as high um, frequency in the selected versus the starting library. So, okay, so we have, this is one example that I'll go through here. So uh, basically I'm giving you data from a DNA encoded library against three ligands. How do we find the target? So this is work that uh, Cy and I uh, started coding in uh, 2000, uh, a long time ago. And so basically what we could do is there's a lot of um, RNA structure prediction software that we had experience in coding and writing, uh, namely RNA structure. And uh, what we would do is we would put onto RNA structure RNA sequences that we could pull off NCBI or GenBank from the human genome. And here's how any old RNA looks like. And here's what we did with that data from the DNA encoded library. So here's what an RNA looks like folded. Uh, this is a, any old messenger RNA or non-coding RNA. In broad strokes, uh, there are regions of the RNA that are not folded or have a low probability of being folded. You want to target that with an oligonucleotide to form base pairing interactions. But there are regions within an RNA that have a high probability of structure. That high probability of structure can be determined based on thermodynamics, but the other thing that we can do is, which I'll come to later, is also couple that to evolutionary covariation. So if messenger RNAs are conserved through evolutionary time, you can look at them and not just identify if they have sequence conservation, but you look at them to determine if they have regions that have structure conservation. And it's that structure conservation that is more important often than sequence conservation. You can pick it out. We have software to be able to do this. And so then what we do is we upload, uh, in an automated sense, the folded RNA structures, and then we mine them against these uh, ligands, these RNA fold small molecule partners that we identify from our library versus library screen. And then we can computationally determine if a small molecule binds to a certain RNA motif. Now I'm giving you sort of the one-off here, but the one-off isn't really a one-off. So this not just tells us if a ligand binds to an RNA, it tells us are there other RNA targets in the genome that have the same motif? What are they? Are there other RNA structures in the genome that have a different motif but bind to that ligand with a similar affinity, and what are they? Right, because we're doing this library versus library selection, 
where it's telling us in an unbiased, we think an unbiased way, what are the affinity landscape between this small molecule and a library of RNA folds. So we can, I'm gonna give you a cleaner, less messy version of the talk where we can use this for, to find selectivity. Okay, so I'm gonna come back to the DNA encoded libraries. So one of the things that we did is we mined all human microRNAs. So microRNAs are small, that's why they're called microRNAs, that basically are produced in a wide variety of settings. It could be developmental timing, it could be cancer, it could be fibrosis, it could be, a, you know, uh, inflammation, where basically what happens is these RNAs get produced where they turn down the amount of a protein that's translated. And how microRNAs work is they get transcribed by these primary microRNAs in the nucleus, and they get cleaved by the nuclear nuclease drosia at this site to liberate and translocate to the cytoplasm the precursor microRNA that gets cleaved in the, in the cyto, uh, cytosol by Dicer to liberate the mature microRNA that binds to three prime UTRs of messenger RNAs and against, basically turns down how much gets translated. So again, what we did is we took, and in this case it's microRNA uh, 27A, which silences PDCD4 and it stimulates cell migration of cancer cells. And so if we overlay this data against the selection experiment that we did from this Dell, and this is one of about a dozen examples that we have, these three compounds that have a similar structure all cluster for binding to this site within uh, microRNA21 precursor at the Drosia site. And so what's interesting is the S compounds are active, the R is inactive. In fact, this compound uh, 5 is a perf, so 4,096 combinations. This is the highest affinity RNA motif that that ligand could bind. We could computationally identify the RNA target. Um, this compound, it's chiral recognition of RNA. It's like, no kidding, Matt, okay, but there's not a lot of chiral studies of ligands that bind RNA broadly, unless it's like aminoglycosides and things like that. So this, this ligand has a KD of 10 nanomolar to the target and inhibits the processing of this microRNA between 101 micromolar and triple negative breast cancer uh, cells, and then it basically disables an invasive phenotype, okay? These are binders. And so uh, we've had a lot of work on identifying binders that bind RNA targets and ways in which they can affect biological function. So here are more binders. I don't want to bore you to tears. Um, so, but here, here this will tell you some example of what the mode of action, mode of actions can be for small molecules that bind RNA. So what I told you is that uh, we targeted this microRNA 27A and uh, basically, we, this binder was bioactive because it bound near and in a processing site, so this, this site. Um, this molecule increased the production of proteins because you inhibit the repressor, so it increased PDCD4 and these other proteins. Um, we also have a lot of work, including a paper that I don't have cited here that came out, I don't know, last month or so, where we can look at not just non-coding, as we can look at coding RNAs, and identify computationally, thermodynamically, and evolutionarily conserved RNA structures near start codons. So here's an example. This is an RNA structure in alpha-synucleans messenger RNA called an iron uh, regulatory element. So what happens is this RNA binds to iron regulatory protein here, and when it binds, you don't get translation of alpha-synuclein. And there are many RNAs that have these iron responsive elements in their 5' UTR where iron regulatory protein binding turns off their translation. Under conditions of high iron, iron will bind to the protein and then initiate translation. Okay, these include even HIF2-alpha, uh, amyloid precursor protein, there's like 30 of these targets. They are not the same RNA structure. They are similar up here where they bind to that protein. They are dis distinct in these regions. And so we used Inforna to identify this non-drug-like compound that binds to this RNA structure here, and this is near the start codon, and when that compound binds to this structure, it doesn't allow properly assembled ribosomes to acquire the start codon to initiating tr initiate translation. So we'll basically pause an assembling ribosome at the five prime end of a message and inhibit alpha-synuclein messenger RNA from being 
added into polysomes, basically. So we can bind to that structure, thermodynamically stabilize it, and limit the ribosome for binding to messages. And uh, we have another compound that's an RNA degrader, which will be the last part of my talk here that was in, uh, published last month or something, I don't know. The other thing we can do is we can change protein coding content. So there are many RNAs, as in, and I'll talk about an FDA-approved drug that does this, uh, where their protein coding content is altered by splicing isoforms. So if you include or exclude exons, you change the protein that's coming from a given messenger RNA. And so this is an RNA structure in uh, tau pre-messenger pre RNA. And if you have a genetically defined Parkinson's or dementia, FTDP linked to mutations in chromosome 17, you actually have a mutation in this RNA structure that destabilizes it thermodynamically. And when you have a destabilization of this structure, the spliceosome will recognize this exon intron junction and include exon 10 in the mature messenger RNA. So the result of that is you produce a toxic aggregated form of tau that's uh, present in these deposits that patients that have Alzheimer's of this genetically defined dementia and Parkinsonism have. And so what we did, and this was a large collaboration with Pfizer, is we designed and developed uh, small molecules that can bind to this RNA structure to thermodynamically stabilize it, to limit the spliceosome from binding to that RNA, which results in not, in excluding, not including exon 10, and converts 4R tau to 3R tau. We've done a lot of structure biology on this, uh, which um, will be published soon. And so we've been able to take those molecules and make them orally bioavailable blood-brain penetrant compounds that can lower 4R tau in primary uh, neurons from mice and also affect behavioral phenotypes. And so I think there's a lot of ways to screw with RNA with binding small molecules. And I think... Uh, there's one more thing I want to say about splicing. There's an FDA-approved drug called Ristoplam that works in patients that have uh, spinal muscular atrophy. And so that molecule was identified by phenotypic screening. It was a partnership between PTC Therapeutics and Roche. And what they did is they, they did phenotypic screening to try to identify molecules that would not exclude exons but include them. And basically, that molecule acts as a glue that can stabilize interactions between the spliceosome and an exon intron junction to include an exon. Our ligands are, are RNA-only binders, and they cause not inclusion, but exclusion. So there's even different ways that you can have with molecules that act on RNA in terms of changing protein coding one way or another, at least in the form of exon inclusion. Okay here's, okay, here's the hook for the last part of the talk. Okay, only about one in 10 binders are bioactive, and I'm being optimistic. Actually, most uh, RNA targets, and, and we've done this by unbiased uh, approaches where we've taken lead-like compounds and also fragments where we have uh, various cross-linking modalities on them, electrophilic or photoreactive molecules, or we can, in, in the human transcriptome, we can unbiasedly profile and I can talk about that more if you'd like, what are the RNAs that small molecules bind? But only about one in 10 of these things are bioactive. What about the rest? So um, this is a, a paper that we published uh, late last year, and this is a collaboration with many groups, uh, including Herbert Valdemann's uh, group at Max Planck Dortmund, Sonia Sievers and Frank Lorius, but also my students and Alex and Daniel. Um, and so basically what we wanted to do is in everything I told you before is we were purposely identifying small molecules that are bioactive as binders. But what we wanted to do is two things in this study. One is, uh, as, as Paul talked about, uh, natural products are really rich sources of chemical diversity beyond what you could get uh, from these commercial libraries. And so Herbert Valdemann over the course of many years has built what's called the COSMOS library, which is basically a natural product-like library. And so what we wanted to do is profile that library to see if uh, what are unique structures that could bind RNA targets, and then figure out if we could take inactive molecules that would bind to a target with high affinity and make them bioactive. 
Now, the way that we're doing this is we're making hetero bifunctional compounds um, that degrade RNA targets. And so one of the advantages of the degraders here is whether or not we bind to a site that affects its function as a binder, if we eliminate the whole RNA, it's going to be bioactive. Right? So what we're trying to do is figure out new ways where we can affect RNA function, but we've worked on degraders in various flavors throughout the years, and these are some of the later work. But the, what I'm going to talk about today is these heterobifunctional compounds. Uh, this was work by Matt Castellas, who's now at Dicerna, and this was an in vivo uh, demonstration. Not the first demonstration, I think, was 2017 in JAX. I'll, I'll talk about that. So basically what it is, is we can take a heterobifunctional compound, one end binds an RNA target, the other end binds a ribonuclease where we can uh, unnaturally control what, by, by using chemistry, what are the RNA targets that are bound by the ribonuclease to affect targeted degradation. And we have a lot of flavors of this that'll be coming out soon. But the initial, actually the third flavor that we started on was ribonuclease L. So ribonuclease L is a ribonuclease that's present in all cells as an inactive monomer, but it's activated upon viral infection. And so what happens is you can get a viral infection that forms these highly structured viral RNAs that turns on the synthesis of 2 prime, 5 prime oligoadenylate synthase. And short oligoadenylates bind to an active, mono, an active monomeric RNA cell to dimerize it and then supercharge its ability to cleave RNAs. And so, so fortuitously, Silverman and others did a high throughput screen to find uh, this heterocyclic compound that we did some medicinal chemistry on, and we have a lot more uh, going on, including using DNA encoded libraries, where this compound acts as a less potent mimic of 2 prime, 5 prime oligoadenylate. And what we can do is we can hook that heterocyclic ligand up to RNA binders, and we can recruit RNase L to then destroy RNA targets, both in cells and in mouse models. All right, so back to Germany, where we were with uh, Herbert. So my students uh, went to Germany for six weeks. Uh, I, I checked on in, on, in, on in on them to make sure they were okay. It was during Oktoberfest, after all, and I felt I was responsible to be parental for them. I wasn't too clingy, but I did call them every week. And so what they did is they took uh, RNA structure libraries like this, and they could then take 1,500 uh, of the, or 15,000 of these, these nature, natural product like small molecules to then decode RNA binders. And there's a lot of information on this. Natural products bind RNA like crazy. We have a, well, streptomycin was the first compound that was put into a modern, modern clinical trial to treat tuberculosis. Uh, the first person in that clinical trial, we don't know who it is because he didn't survive. The second person was Bob Dole. I'm aging myself as I continue. So anyway, um, look up who Bob Dole is if you don't know. Okay, so then what we did is we went and rather, we took all of these binders from these compounds and rather than search for molecules that could bind in bioactive sites, we actually searched for the highest affinity targets. And we, what we did is we basically took and found ligands that would actually bind to non-functional sites, if this is the microRNA, and then we next said, okay, if it binds in a site, is that site near an RNA structure that would be sensitive to being cleaved by RNA cells? So we overlapped that with the overlaid the binding informatics with does it bind an RNA structure that has pyrimidine rich loops that's in some distance where we think we can cleave it? So there's two things we're searching for a binding site near a cleaving site. And then we basically took the molecules and made them heterobifunctional to degrade targets. Okay. So here's one target we went after, which is microRNA-155 precursor. microRNA-155 is an upregulated microRNA. It's pro I, I would, of all the non-coding microRNAs that one should aggressively pursue for therapy, this would be number one. Why do I say that? One is it's massively upregulated in uh, uh, cancer and uh, not generally present in healthy cells. Its increase in expression is between 10 and 100-fold. It's the unicorn in microRNAs in that regard. Um, and furthermore, one of the earlier biotech companies that worked on targeting microRNAs with um, antisense oligonucleotide had actually a favorable phase two clinical trial, but they did not continue uh, that study. So we'll see if it gets picked up. And uh, it also is involved in inflammation broadly. Okay, so here's, so you're asked, here's the compound. They, we're not going to go to the natural products, but here's, here's a molecule. 
So this is a compound that was a binder to 155. These are actually Frank Loria's molecules that uh, bind to form, catalyst, form asymmetric catalytic reactions that were part of this COMAS library. I'm using this as an example. There's many others of this. But this is a compound. It's probably not surprising it binds RNA. It has a formal charge. As a binder, that molecule has no effect on microRNA-155 levels, even up to uh, five mic 50 micromolar. And then what we could do is cut off the grease from it, and it still it didn't have any activity. But by using cross-linking, we knew it bound to the RNA target, and we knew the site of binding. However, when we hooked it up to the degrader, that molecule at 100 nanomolar uh, would degrade the RNA target at about 60%, but when we took those cells and then ablated by siRNA, RNA cell, we would lose all the activity. This is supportive that this molecule is degrading this RNA target by recruitment of RNA cell. And then here's some selectivity experiments. Um, one is, um, here's microRNA 155 is the most silenced microRNA, but then we put a binding site mutant. So we didn't change the cleavage site, which is here, we changed the binding site and the molecule loses all of its activity. I gotta hurry up, right? Damn, Paul. If I ignore you, can I keep going? No, all right, I'm gonna hurry up. All right, so uh, the molecule selective on, uh, against all microRNAs, so this is the binder, and this is the degrader. It only inhibits 155, and then this is work that we were really uh, gratified to work with Daniel and Alex in that what we did is we did full proteomics and we looked at all messenger RNAs that have a microRNA 155 binding site to see if they were turned up. And they were, increased in their expression, whereas if they don't have a 155 binding site, they're not affected. This will be the last slide I talk about. Uh, and then last, what we did is we delivered these compounds into uh, mice. And what we did is we compared the exposure in the free fraction in the lung uh, for the degrader in the binder, where we had to match the exposure and uh, what you're seeing here is this is colonization of breast cancer in the lung. Uh, this is vehicle, this is a colony, this is the binder by itself, and this is the degrader. So we can decrease lung colonization, and then we can limit microRNA-155 levels um, in this. Um, so we're pretty aggressively working on this in a bunch of different areas, including targeting undruggable uh, proteins, quote unquote, undruggable proteins by looking at the RNA level. And I think one of the challenges that we have to do with the degrader work is we really have to expand the palette of effector proteins that we can recruit. We're doing that pretty aggressively. Uh, and also, really upfront and in an unbiased way, address the selectivity issues. Because once you have a binder, uh, maybe binding to other sites, as long as they're not functionally relevant, is not such an issue. But when you have a degrader, you really start to um, assess that. So that's what we're, we're working on, and I, I thank my students for putting me in position to talk here. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Matt. Um, I think we have time for maybe like one question. Yeah, okay, maybe I can get um, into that. So sure. you kind of mentioned in the beginning you talked about like there's so many more RNA that you can drug. Uh, than proteins, but then this also has this selectivity issue. So can you maybe tell us a little bit about how you're thinking about, you know, that problem? Is now selectivity the bigger yeah. issue? Um, so we've done, there's some surprising things that we've done outside of this talk, which is this unbiased uh, fragment profiling and cross-linking experiments. And so one of the things that we've, we've, we've done is we've taken probably five to 600 fragments that have a cross-linker append to them and just unbiased pull down in different cell states the RNAs that bind. From 22,000 genes, we're only pulling down about 50, and that's without affinity enrichment. And so there's not this huge uh, effect of non-selectivity even up front with these compounds. But the way that we're really addressing it is we're trying to figure out, especially with the degraders, and we'll have a paper coming out uh, soon in this, in JAX, where we're basically taking what are all the RNAs that compounds bind to, and then when we make them a degrader, what are the binders that are degraded? And so you can do that by making a cell line that's knocked out in the effector protein and one that has a control. And then you can do the next generation sequencing to track it. Um, so I, I, the reason that I think they're probably more selective than one can imagine is because if your RNA is not coded with a protein, it's likely degraded. And so the protein coding compartment 
RNA was made to die, basically, right? The 2' hydroxyl group, it was selected as a biopolymer because that was 2' hydroxyl group to, to cleave its backbone. And the protein binding capacity of RNA is pretty dramatic to the point where I think it, it's a buffer for a lot of occupancy. So, um, I mean, that's how we're going after it. We'll, we'll see how it, how it turns out. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Fantastic. And uh, please uh, join me in thanking Matt for a great talk. Thanks, Andrew. Yeah, so our next speaker is going to introduce himself, but uh, while he's getting set up, I'll uh, just say that we're very fortunate to, uh, to have Alex now on the, on the faculty here at UIC, um, and he's going to tell us more about what he's been doing here, but also in his, his previous labs. So, uh, hi everyone, my name is Alex Atipekian, and I'm a professor here at UIC in the chemistry department. Uh, we are a chemoproteomics lab, and uh, we're applying chemoproteomics uh, for target ID and also drug discovery. We, you know, more recently we became interested in uh, targeted uh, protein degradation, and today I would like to show uh, a little bit about our work towards uh, uh, kind of uh, miniaturizing uh, light tags, so the slices of targeting chimeras uh, to target uh, uh, membrane proteins and extracellular proteins. So uh, we, of course, you know, the long-standing goal in uh, drug discovery is uh, uh, to uh, kind of expand the drug proteome and uh, to increase the overlap with the, you know, with the proteome of the disease-related genes. And so currently the overlap is rather small. and. Uh, so one of the approaches uh, that people are currently trying to take is, of course, the uh, targeted protein degradation, hoping that uh, they can expand the drug wall proteome. Just uh, why? Because, uh, you know, with the classic inhibitor discovery, uh, you mostly target the old known, uh, you know, and <coughs> well-established uh, classes of proteins, such as enzymes and receptors and so on. Whereas, you know, if you, uh, that's, uh, for example, talking about protax, uh, you can imagine then uh, developing small molecules which then uh, don't, need, uh, don't essentially need to target the active sites of uh, proteins and then still uh, lead to a degradation and biological effect, right? So that's a long-standing goal. And uh, obviously, uh, uh, when people talk about target protein degradation, protax comes uh, to mind, but, you know, protax also have several limitations, right? I mean, so products don't work on the extracellular proteins and also don't work on the membrane-associated proteins simply because there's no availability of E3 ligases to degrade those uh, classes of proteins. And there are certain, uh, you know, uh, several other problems with products. You know, there's limited uh, membrane permeability simply because of the uh, molecular size of a protax. And obviously, and every, every lab that is dealing uh, with a product synthesis will tell you how, my, how tricky is the rational design of actual products, mostly because, you know, uh, the linker geometry, linker length, and the linker chemistry need to be meticulously optimized just uh, to get a functional product, right? And uh, so for the uh, membrane proteins and extracellular proteins, uh, you know, uh, people have developed uh, several lysosome targeting uh, 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 TPD methods, and uh, there is really a, a whole series of these methods now published. You know, there is uh, obviously, you know, the LITAC method by Carolyn Bertozzi, which was uh, published uh, in 2020s, uh, several other methods, you know, for example, you know, the uh, GIMS APTAC and several other methods, you know, which all uh, target the membrane proteins and extracellular proteins and try to bring them into lysosomes for degradation. So our goal is to uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, develop the LITAC technology and to miniaturize it, so to replace 
uh, the, this uh, uh, antibody conjugates with uh, maybe small molecules just to make them a little bit more attractive for, for uh, you know, for pharmaceutical industry and for drug discovery. So the classic LIHTC, uh, the way it works is uh, it's an antibody which is bound to a glycopolymer, and so the antibody binds to the uh, protein of interest that uh, you want to degrade, and the glycopolymer creates a bridge to a receptor, for example, Mato's, um, um, <coughs> Mato's 6 uh, phosphate receptor, and then when there is an endocytic uptake of the Mano 6 phosphate receptor, uh, it uh, drags the whole cargo inside the lysosomes and degrades uh, uh, the protein of interest which is bound to the antibody, right? So we're trying to uh, replace uh, piece by piece uh, these components of the light hack, you know, by small molecules just to kind of uh, turn them into molecular glue type uh, uh, small molecules. And so back in 2017, uh, my group has discovered this uh, uh, <clears throat> these uh, small tags, these uh, cyclic disulfides, which actually work by reacting uh, with, the, uh, with uh, surface cysteines on the surface of uh, receptors and enable uptake of cargos. So you can take uh, this tag and you can conjugate, uh, for example, a long peptide or even a nucleic acid, and then it will form this uh, mixed disulfide, uh, get taken up into cells, and inside the cells it will get reduced and release the cargo. So the main purpose of this technology was uh, uh, cellular uptake. So you can, for example, take these uh, long unprotected peptides and put at the end terminus this uh, tag, the asparagusic acid, and you'll see that uh, these peptides, for example, these uh, uh, cytotoxic beam and back peptides, which usually don't go inside the cell, but they start penetrating the cell and killing uh, cancer cells, right? So, uh, the way uh, this tag works, and we have determined this uh, by a series of chemoproteomics experiments, is by reacting with the transferrin receptor, and it reacts with two different cysteines on the surface, uh, of the, on the extracellular side of the transferrin receptor, is this uh, uh, cysteine 556 and 558, so th those are two vicinal cysteines. And uh, when you mutate both cysteines, you see that uh, there is no uptake anymore. So, uh, this was a great technology for uptake, but now for LIHTAC, we needed something where uh, it would uh, basically uh, enable the uptake, but then also get trapped in the lysosomes, right? But essentially, what you're trying to do for LIHTAC is to trap the proteins in the lysosomes so that they get degraded. And so we uh, recently identified this scaffold here, this uh, ketoboronate scaffold, which uh, enables uh, <coughs> exactly this. So here you see a series of uh, uh, these ketoboronates with different substitution patterns, and you see that some of them, for example, this compound six with the parafluoro substitution and the methyl group here, uh, how it uh, effic efficiently uh, traps the fluorescent cargo in the lysosomes. And so the way these uh, tags work is by actually uh, uh, reacting with lysines on the surface and then forming this semi-stable shift base. And then when there is an uptake, since this shift base is semi-stable and acid label, you know, it uh, slowly gets hydrolyzed and releases the cargo, right? And um, so how big of a cargo can you uh, take up? For example, you can take a streptavidine, which has uh, four binding sites for biotin, and then you can functionalize it with this uh, uh, Four, four biotins with ketoboronate, abbreviated KB, and then you see that you have an efficient uptake and trapping in the lysosomes, as you see uh, by, you know, this colocalization with the lysotracker that we used here. So you can really take, you know, these uh, larger proteins up to 60 KB and uh, they will still uh, will get taken up. So how does this work? Uh, our strength is uh, chemoproteomics and target ID. So of course, that's uh, one of the first questions we're always trying to answer. And uh, to find the targets, we actually had to do reductive amination to form a stable covalent bond and uh, perform the LCMS analysis and then uh, do filtering of the heats uh, simply because we wanted to narrow it down to plasma membrane proteins, which are known to shuttle between the plasma membrane and the, 
and the lysosomes, right? And so our, our analysis identified two proteins. Uh, once again, we had the transfer receptor, so that was not surprising because we actively searched for something binding to the transfer receptor. But what was more surprising that as the second hit was this uh, HLA class of antigens, so the human uh, leukocyte uh, antigens, which are also known uh, to get endocytosis and, you know, and that kind of uh, opens uh, completely new opportunities also for this tag. So, uh, you know, once we run a proteomics experiment, first thing we do is, of course, uh, confirming the results, and that's what we did here. We overexpressed uh, both uh, proteins, the transfer receptor and HLA, and confirmed that uh, ketoboronate indeed uh, binds uh, these proteins. And we also showed uh, by you know, a series of ex experiments that this binding is acid labile. So as it progresses uh, through late endosomes into lysosomes, uh, the, you know, there is a release of, uh, of, of the cargo you know, simply because uh, the, the shift base gets hydrolyzed. And uh, just to show you that it's really, uh, uh, you know, th this mechanism is dependent on these uh, two proteins. We knocked down the transfer receptor, and we had around 50% decrease in uptake of uh, fluorescent cargo. And we also knocked down the, you know, uh, with a pan HLA sRNA, we no knocked down HLA, and we had around 40% decrease. And when you take a double sRNA, so when a dual sRNA treatment, where you knock down both transfer receptor and HLA, you have around 80% decrease. So this uh, shows that the uptake is really being uh, uh, primarily promoted by these uh, two proteins. And uh, you know, so these, uh, the proteomics experiments, they showed the protein ID, but not the site. And so to determine the site, we also made a bite probe of the ketoboronate and determine the site. So here's, for example, the site on the transfer receptor, and it's this uh, lysine 193. And what's interesting about this uh, lysine is that it's actually uh, located far away from the transferrin binding site. So this is a transferrin independent uh, uh, binding. So, uh, which is a good thing because you don't have a competition between the transferrin and uh, uh, the cargo that you are trying to, to bring into cells. And uh, when uh, you mutate uh, this lysine, you see that the uptake is actually diminished by 70%. So this shows that it's really uh, A, that it's a lysine dependent uptake and that it's really just uh, one single residue on the surface of the transfer receptor which promotes this uptake. So obviously our goal was uh, to use uh, such a small tag and show you know, that we can use this uh, for light tag applications. And here we took cetuximab, which is a clinically approved antibody for EGFR. And uh, to functionalize uh, cetuximab with our ketoborne tag, and then you see that you can degrade the EGFR in a time-dependent fashion. And just like in protag field, also with light tags, uh, the degradation is uh, linker dependent. So what it means is that we have to really painfully optimize the linker length and the linker chemistry to really, and it can really go from uh, no degradation at all to uh, you know, 80, 90% degradation just, just by changing the linker. So here, for example, you see that we uh, uh, explore three different uh, peg uh, linker lengths and it was the peg 15 which gave us the best result. Uh, next, we took uh, trastuzumab, which is this uh, clinical antibody targeting HER2, and uh, turned it into a, a light tag by simply conjugating uh, this uh, one small tag uh, to trastuzumab. And once again, you see that uh, we de de efficiently degrade uh, HER2 in a time-dependent fashion. And uh, once again, we, we show that when you knock down transfer receptor and HLA, uh, actually, when you knock down both, you almost completely prevent a degradation of uh, HER2. Right? And so, uh, what's interesting is that when, when you degrade HER2 versus just uh, uh, treating with trastuzumab alone, you actually achieve a better inhibition of phosphorylation of the downstream kinases, right? So, of ERK and AKT. You see, uh, uh, that you know, you obviously you want to affect both branches, and that's what we showed here. So the AKT phosphorylation is um, stronger affected, as well as the ERK phosphorylation. 
using uh, uh, our KB trastuzumab versus trastuzumab alone. So uh, uh, for how long can we actually achieve a degradation of HER2 with one single dose? So here we uh, treated cells uh, with uh, our KB trastuzumab and monitored recovery of uh, HER2. And you see that it takes around uh, two to three days uh, for HER2 levels to recover to the, to the <coughs> initial levels. And this is most likely dictated by the protein uh, neosynthesis, but also by the stability of the actual, you know, KB conjugate. And here, you know, as a comparison with trastuzumab, of course, you don't have degradation of HER2, but here as a comparison, we have HER2 sRNA, and you do get a, a slightly better, uh, so slightly prolonged uh, degradation of HER2 or, you know, down regulation of HER2 using sRNA as with uh, trastuzumab, but it's actually pretty comparable. So, you know, by this chemical means, we can actually mimic uh, sRNA. The big difference is, of course, that, you know, we want to go in vivo, which is not as straightforward with sRNA, and that's what we did next. So we, uh, uh, in collaboration with uh, Nisim Hay from, uh, <coughs> from uh, UIC Medical School, uh, we, uh, uh, explored uh, this uh, uh, LITAC conjugate in BT474 uh, tumor xenograft model. So BT474 is this uh, uh, triple positive uh, breast cancer cell line. And we, we uh, established a regimen where we were injecting every three days. And uh, for example, after eight days when you collect the tumors, you see that uh, uh, the treatment with uh, three mg per kg uh, KBTTZ actually downregulates uh, HER2 levels by 90%, whereas you have only 20% uh, downregulation with uh, trastuzumab alone. So clearly, it works in vivo, and you have a strong downregulation of uh, HER2 also in vivo. And uh, based on this, we also performed uh, full studies, uh, you know, tumor growth, and as you see, there is a significant effect. Uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, positive effect achieved uh, by KBT uh, trastuzumab versus trastuzumab alone. And here you see, after 75 days, you know, the excised tumors. You see that the tumor size is uh, most definitely smaller with, uh, you know, after uh, KB trastuzumab treatment versus uh, trastuzumab treatment alone. And so this was done at uh, three milligram uh, per kilogram dose. And uh, you know, we were currently. Uh, <coughs> also exploring the higher doses of, of this kanjiki just to see the effects of, on tumor size. And so with this, I would like to uh, finish my short talk and uh, thank my group, of course, you know, who, uh, especially my postdoc, Danny Pesharu, who has done uh, most of this work and, uh, uh, you know, our sponsors. And thank you uh, for being here today and uh, looking forward to your questions. Great talk, Alex. Uh, we have a couple questions or time for some questions. Very beautiful. Uh, I'm wondering if that boronate is interacting with glyca glycans on the, on the cell right. surface as well, and if that's participating as those types of chemistries are often used for enrichment of yeah, glycans. Yeah, yeah. So, so, yeah, uh, that, that. That's what we thought as well, you know, that it could be also uh, kind of like a, second, a secondary effect, right? But when you take gly glycosylate, uh, with uh, PNJSF, you actually see that there is no decrease of uptake. So we, we at this point, we don't think that you know it uh, interacts with. Uh, so at least you know it's not a productive interaction, you know, which leads to uptake. So we believe it's really through through the lysine interaction. Alex, very exciting um, uh, talk and and new modality there. Um, I wondered, um, have you, what is the, the drug antibody ratio that you need to have on there? Is it like an ADC that might be two to four, or is it more? And then also, do you see the, um, the degrader itself being degraded? So does the, you know, once that's internalized, does that then, de does the HER2 conjugate also get degraded? And that goes for the, the transferrin receptor too. So two questions. 
Uh, yeah, so, so we, we have around uh, five to 10, uh, depending on the antibody, we have uh, five to 10 tags per, per you know, antibody molecule, and uh, which is uh, p uh, pretty comparable to, you know, to the original LIHTC uh, uh, <coughs> uh, composition. And regarding second question, that's not something uh, which is uh, very straightforward to, to answer, you know, so, but uh, we don't believe that uh, the, the light hack actually gets degraded. So we have studied, uh, you know, plasma stability and uh, so uh, in the end, you know, we would have to probably uh, do a better, more in-depth uh, LCMS studies just to see, you know, how stable it remains, you know, also after the lysosomal uptake. But, you know, currently we don't believe it gets degraded. Yeah. Okay, thank you. All right, I think that actually brings us about right for time, so uh, please join me for all our speakers, yeah, for the first session. Uh, off for a coffee break, so be back at 20 minutes, is that right? 20 minutes, okay.
Hello, welcome back to the keynote session for the Drug Discovery Symposium. My name is Ying Hu. I will be introducing our keynote speaker for my colleague, uh, Alison Andres. Okay. Our keynote speaker is uh, Dr. James Wells. Uh, Dr. Wells is a professor in the Department of Pharmaceutical Chemistry and Cellular and Molecular Pharmacology at the University of California, San Francisco. Dr. Jim Wells received his bachelor's degree in biochemistry and psychology from University of California, Berkeley, PhD in biochemistry from Washington State University, and then postdoctoral training at Stanford University. Dr. Wells started his independent research career in 1982 in industry as a co-founding member of the protein engineering department at Genentech. Uh, his group pioneered the gain of function engineering of enzymes, hormones, and antibodies. Several biological products derived directly from these efforts include therapeutic uh, human growth hormone antagonist and VGF blocking the antibody for cancer treatment. His group developed fundamental techniques including cassette mutagenesis, alanine scanning, uh, and protein phage display, and protein design principles that have been commonly used for engineering enzymes, hormones, and antibodies, and protein-protein interfaces. 1998, Dr. Wells co-founded Sunices Pharmaceuticals, uh, where he served as a CSO and president. Uh, his group developed a novel technology for targeted small molecule drug discovery, among others. 2005, Dr. Wells joined the faculty at UCSF. He founded the Small Molecule Discovery Center and serves as the chair of pharmaceutical chemistry. Dr. Wells' lab now investigates how cell surface proteomes change in health and disease by applying mass spec, protein antibody engineering to understand and disrupt human disease associated signaling processes. He has co founded half a dozen other companies, and he is an elected member of the National Academy of Sciences, National Academy of Investors, American Academy of Arts and Sciences. And I learned quite a bit from the dinner last night. And among them, um, Wang Hua Cho told me that uh, Dr. Jim Wells was his scientific idol. So without further ado, let's welcome Dr. Jim Wells. Wow, no pressure, huh? Um, that was great. Thanks, Ying. And thanks, uh, Wang Hua, for this really kind invitation and assembling this great symposia. Those three talks uh, to start with were just outrageous. Uh, it's a hard acts to follow. Um, so let me explain this first slide here, the, the, the image of that ball with a bunch of hair on it and that pirate ship. Uh, the pirate ship is meant to connote when our style of, we do a lot of protein design work, uh, protein engineering work, and un unlike uh, smarter people like Bill DeGrotto or David Baker who do it from scratch, we always grab things from nature that are close by what we want, and we engineer them using old-fashioned engineering uh, ap approaches to, make, to fashion them for what we like. I'll give you a few examples of that. And then the, the, the hairy ball is meant to uh, connote the cell membrane proteome, what we call the surfaceome, which is an amazing compartment. Uh, cons consists of about four to 5,000 different encoded gene products. It's the home of half the small molecule drug targets and, um, and virtually all of the biologics uh, these days, for which represent about 50% uh, of the major pharma rev revenues come from this compartment of biologics, antibodies and, and uh, 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 hormones and, and growth factors, et cetera. So, but interestingly, there's only 29 uh, uh, extracellular targets which have been drugged with antibodies despite the vast number of these proteins that are out there. So our goal is uh, to try to find more of these targets and, and be able to attack them. Um, so our work was really inspired uh, 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 when I saw at UCSF the seminar given by a colleague, Asra Bandopatiai, that uses isogenic cell lines to understand how uh, oncogenes change cells, change their, their drug sensitivities and the like. And in this particular example, um, shown uh, here, I call a, uh, a fried egg. <laughs> you go from this normal cell, uh, looking like a fried egg, to when egg 
to when transformed with KRAS, single oncogene goes from that to this croissant-like structure here. Um, and that to me was just incredibly inspiring because it suggested that there were a lot of changes that happened on the cell surface that we should find out about should we be able to then sort of begin targeting new, uh, new proteins that appear on the cell surface or upregulated on the cell surface. And in fact, that's been the paradigm for uh, identifying HER2 as a drug target or EGFR as a drug target or trope 2 and other things as these changes in expression. And so um, uh, we wanted to ask, can we find KRAS-induced new KRAS-induced surface targets, and enter these two folks. Uh, uh, left there is Alex Martinko, a graduate student on the right, Kevin Leung, a postdoc in the lab, who really pioneered this work uh, that we embarked on to use isogenic cell lines and cell surface capture methods, which basically grab proteins by their carbohydrates and uh, purify them because they're by uh, the, uh, the, with biotin hydroside, uh, pull them down with, uh, with avidin. We can do this on isogenic cell lines in SILAC mode to identify then the collection of surface proteins that are upregulated or changed in oncogene transformation. In doing this, we get this sort of familiar volcano plot um, where on the, on the right of this diagram would be proteins that are upregulated when that KRAS goes into it and proteins that are downregulated because these are bidirectional changes. The oncogene actually causes some things to go up and some things to go down. Among them uh, were a bunch of proteins we were interested in, and Alex and the team went about expressing the ectodomains of all of these and then subjected them to um, uh, uh, this process of phase display. So on the left there, you see the target that's been expressed as an FC fusion, the ectodomain of these, 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 these proteins. We then have a library of about 10 billion antibodies on phage. We allow them to bind to the target, wash away those that don't bind, enrich and grow up those that, that, that do bind, and recursively do that three or four times to uh, identify hits. And then we take those antibodies, we take them off the phage, we express them, uh, and then begin a whole series of uh, uh, tests, cellular binding being amongst them, for instance, knocking down the target on cells and showing these antibodies no longer bind, suggesting they're highly selective, and beginning to then fashion them with ADCs or bites and things like that to see can we kill cells with them. Um, we identified, and, and so we've expanded this technology of cell surface proteomics, um, and I should say that because the cell surface proteome, the skin of the cell, the proteome of the skin of the cell is only 1% the, the, the abundance of cytosolic proteins. So um, you have, in a sense, if you want to study the surfaceome, as we do, we need to use enrichment methods, pulling out those membrane proteins. I described the first one there that was pioneered by Bern Walshie's lab and in, in, uh, in when he was with Rudy Abersold. Um, we developed another version of this that's even more sensitive that uses this WGAHRP method to look at Josh Kuhn's group using AIETD methods that he developed, we're able to actually keep the carbohydrate on the, protein, on the peptides that we find um, in the isogenic cell lines to identify what are the glycans that change on those upregulated or downregulated proteins. Um, more recently, we've been able to then identify not only what's outside the cell, but what's inside the cell using what we call a cell portal or a soluble HLA complexes. So we can secrete uh, allele-specific HLAs that will go through the, 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 the um, loading process in the ER, and you come out with a, uh, a soluble HLA, because we've made it as an FC fusion with a tag on it. It'll grab those immunopeptidomes, and we can characterize those and, and learn about what is KRAS-induced versus not induced. Now, I'm going to tell you in more detail uh, two other methods that we've been using to characterize uh, the extracellular proteome. What is, uh, one is the What's Cut project, because it turns out that extracellular proteolysis is probably the most dominant uh, PTM that regulates uh, proteins on the outside of cells. And we want to find out what those proteases are cutting. I'll tell you that, how that works. 
And finally, uh, another thing that happens during uh, uh, oncogenesis is that protein neighborhoods change. Uh, and we know very little about these protein neighborhoods. And I want to tell you about newer um, uh, proximity labeling approaches that we've been taking to understand those. So let me start off with the proteolysis uh, part. Proteases are super important in, um, in causing uh, the regulation of activities out there. Uh, proteases themselves are made inactive, uh, and they have to be processed by prote proteolysis themselves to be activated. Many receptors are known to be proteolized to be activated. We know that shedding, for instance, shedding of growth factors is a major mechanism by which, for instance, TNF is released from cells to then do its, have its soluble activities outside. So we want to understand those. And they drive all kinds of different biology shown here from, from growth, uh, survival, angiogenesis, you name it. And uh, this, this phenomenon has been studied um, uh, for decades uh, in, the, in uh, the literature and in industry to, to uh, focus on, on extracellular proteases. Now, we know a lot about, actually, through knockout studies and inhibitor studies, which proteases can drive these things. What we haven't uh, understood is what they actually cut on the surface of cells um, or shed. And so can we discover proteolytic cleavage sites on the surface of cancer cells? And to tell you how we did that, I first have to describe this enzyme, an, an enzyme near and dear to my heart that started off uh, my love affair with this enzyme, subtilisin, which is a secreted bacterial bacillus subtilis uh, enzyme. Uh, started uh, uh, 35 years ago when I was at Genentech, and we made variants of it that were much more stable, allowing it to work in this product. This is actually our first product, the Genencore. Uh, this enzyme is now sold in Tide liquids and powders. You're probably wearing this enzyme now. Um, so we w wondered, could we make this enzyme into a peptide ligase? And it turns out with two mutations, we could, by installing a catalytic, the catalytic serine change to a cysteine, allowing it to go through a thioacyl enzyme intermediate, which is prone to amylize for ligation, and making more room for it with this, pro this uh, proline to alanine mutation. And we've used this enzyme, as we call subtle ligase now, so changing this uh, ferocious tiger, this, this uh, uh, shredder, protein shredder, into a pussycat, a ligase. Um, and it does not, it will not proteolize protein, so it only will ligate peptide tags, for instance, onto the end terminus of proteins um, using a, uh, a peptide ester substrate. Um, so we've used it for a variety of things, and one of the things we've used it for is something we call N-terminomics, or which Chris overall would call degradomics. He uses a slightly different technology. But basically what we can do is tag the N-terminus of proteins with a biotin tag, and it only goes on the alpha amine and not the epsilon amino group of lysine, because this enzyme was born as a protease that used a peptide tract, so you can't get the epsilon amino group of lysine into it. Um, so, uh, and the way it works is that we have this, uh, this tag we call TEVS it, or, or, that has a, uh, an ABU on it. I don't know if I can get my pointer over here. Yeah, okay, this tag here. Um, so what happens, subtle ligase will then react with it, forming this thioacyl enzyme intermediate, and then an amino group from a protein or peptide will come in and displace that to then give the ligated product. We can, th there's a really simple mass spec workflow for this. We capture the biotin. We can cleave off using TEV the, this tag. And what we're left with is an, as an aminobutyric acid remnant that serves as a wonderful mass tag that tells us we've labeled it. And moreover, when we sequence that, Everything to the right of that ABU tag tells us the exact sequence of the protein and the precise place that that protein was proteolized. So very pow powerful technology. We've used it a lot for uh, studying apoptosis and identified lots of different as aspartate cleave proteins. We wanted to apply this to the outside of cells. So we'll, uh, uh, enter Amy Weeks, a really talented uh, postdoc now at University of Wisconsin with her own lab. She engineered a bunch, of, bunch more variants of this, improved their efficiencies, and the workflow to actually do this on cells. Um, but what happened when she first tried this is that if you just add subtle ligase to cells, 
we got very few surface proteins labeled, and we were puzzled by that, like only a couple dozen, whereas we study apoptosis, we're getting 1,500 proteins. So we wondered, what, how could we increase the efficiency of it? And uh, Amy, uh, uh, clever as she was, realized that if we just immobilize subtle ligase on the surface of cells, maybe we would increase the efficiency of labeling. Uh, my analogy would be like trying to mow a lawn using a helicopter, namely just adding it outside, versus on the ground with a lawnmower. And doing that, dramatic improvements in the, in the, the labeling. We were finding now hundreds of cleavage events using this enzyme. And it's very rapid, as you can see. Within 10 minutes, it essentially saturates. It mows the lawn very fast. Um, I guess mowing the lawn is exactly right, because it's not cleaving the lawn, it's tagging the lawn. But um, uh, so enter uh, Katie Schaefer, another postdoc, and, and Irene Louie, uh, who's a graduate student. And we wanted to not only have uh, this work on the surface of cells, which we did, but we didn't want to use it as a genetically encoded construct, because that's the way we would need to use it on all cells. We'd have to put a, a construct in that had that transmembrane domain. So what uh, these, uh, these two did is cleverly develop uh, covalent chemistry by uh, some, some cool uh, um, protein chemistry to put an amino oxy group on the N-terminus of subtle ligase, and then mild pyridate oxidation of cells of the glycans would generate aldehydes, which amino oxy groups uh, or hydrazides will rapidly um, uh, bind to. And you can see when we did that, we get really nice cell surface labeling uh, of, subtle, uh, of subtle ligase on the surface of cells. So this is looking at the labeling of subtle ligase itself. And then when we did this uh, on, with the biotin uh, tag, indeed, uh, you can see here that on this, uh, this gel, just the soluble ligase, all you see are these couple of different intrinsically biotinylated proteins. Uh, if you add uh, the uh, cell ligase that has either a hydrazide on it or better, the amino oxy nucleophile, we get a much, a very robust labeling. You see just in that simple 1D gel. So then we went on to start studying these in a proteomic fashion. And for, for um, these now six different cell lines, we've now done over uh, 22 different cell lines. We routinely get find three to, uh, to 600 different uh, proteins being proteolized on the cell surface. That was absolutely amazing to us. Um, and in fact, there's a really nice database that Chris Overall's group has assembled it's called TopFind, which compiles all the examples of proteolysis. And you can see that um, we've identified, there's only about a handful, you know, uh, uh, 61 and termini, three dozen proteins that are in that database. We've now expanded that to more than 1,500 cleavage events and more than 500 proteins which are in that database. So most of these are novel things. They're being cut, interestingly. We do see the signal sequence cleaved. You'd expect that because the secreted proteins have, or membrane proteins, uh, type 1s, have uh, signal sequences on them. We see those events, but the majority are actually extra in the extracellular domain. So these proteases that are being activated or on the cell surface are actually remodeling these proteins uh, um, post-translationally after they're made and now in a, uh, in a myriad of different ways, some on, most on type 1 uh, receptors, but also uh, GPCRs and, and, and multi-pass receptors which had never been seen before. So we wonder, do oncogenes induce differences? And in fact, they do. This is, that, again, that same isogenic cell line with and without KRAS. And you can see that um, if we look at this, here you see on the y-axis the upregulation or downregulation that KRAS imparts in the expression levels of proteins. And on the, the x-axis, you can see the up, the, um, the up enrichment or down enrichment of proteolytic events on those same proteins. Now, as you see in this plot, it's a scatter plot. There's very little correlation, meaning that proteolysis is orthogonal to expression. Um, and uh, what that means is that in addition to thinking about targets from the point of view of what is actually being expressed, upregulated, we can start to think about, well, what about the ones that are upregulated and 
proteolized on specifically on disease cells and non-disease cells. So there's an, a, there's an AND gate we can impose based on this. We found a bunch of, as I mentioned, there's a few of these things which have been identified, in fact, uh, before. In fact, we've found them. These are literature examples. You can consider them positive controls. We find exactly the same cleavage site as reported in the literature. And uh, a target that I'll come to next, CDCP1, which is one of the favorite targets of one of our audience members, uh, Gia Joe here, who worked on, on, on what I'll tell you about next, um, is, in this, uh, is in this group. Um, that's also upregulated in, in uh, KRAS. If you compare now different oncogenes, KRAS versus HER2, you can see that the cleavage events uh, are, there's a lot of commonality in what these oncogenes are actually doing, but each one has a private set, somewhat different set, and there are things that are both upregulated and downregulated in this process. Keep in mind, these are autologous experiments. The cells themselves are generating the proteases that are doing this work. So these are not, these are not tumors. Um, so enter uh, Jia and uh, her, her uh, lab mate, Xian Lim, and they, they wondered about this protein CDCP1. In fact, they wondered about it before we had even done these mass spec data because that, this protein was upregulated by KRAS. And when they studied it in detail, they found it in, uh, interestingly that it was being cleaved uh, in the KRAS transform cells. So um, you can see here that this is a normal uh, or a cell line that's immortalized uh, a pancreatic cell. You don't see CDCP1 because it's not upregulated. But in, in all of these different pancreatic cell lines for which KRAS is the dominant oncogene, you see it upregulated. And in more than half of them, you see this cleavage event. In fact, that is exactly uh, where we found it being cleaved by our mass spec studies. Well, they wondered, could we target this, um, this, this um, cleaved antigen, which means that they had to first produce the cleaved antigen and made a discovery in the process that was really fascinating that even though this thing is being cleaved, there's an N-terminal domain. This is an alpha-fold uh, alpha model of CDCP1. There's an N-terminal domain, a C-terminal domain, cut sites on the left here, three of them, um, all identified by the mass spec uh, 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 results. Um, but interestingly, the N-terminal and C-terminal domain are actually held together, and this model shows how that could be because the N-terminal and C-terminal domain have this beta sheet interleaved interaction site, and the cleavage site is on, the, is on one side. So they made these antigens, um, the cleave form and full length antigen, and they asked the question, could we build antibodies that would bind to the cleave form? Um, and using uh, one of the advantages of uh, phase display is you can do everything in vitro. So you can control the antigen state you want, so what they did was they built a full-length antigen, they built the cleave form antigen, and then they differentially selected, first removing, uh, taking the pool that would bind the full-length antigen over here, keeping that aside, and continuing to develop those full-length uh, antibodies, but then taking the leftovers and, 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 and uh, uh, selecting for those phases that bind the cleave form. And doing this recursively several times, they identified these antibodies, single-digit nanomolar antibodies, that bind really well to actually all three cut forms they tested and does not bind to the full length uh, uh, form of CDCP1. Importantly, they were able to take these, uh, it turns out that then we wanted to do mouse experiments, turns out these antibodies built on the human antigens did not react with the mouse forms. So they had to repeat the same process on all, both the mouse full length and mouse a cleave form because we wanted to do some syngeneic mouse studies with them, Tox uh, and we looked at them based on their, to their toxicities of these molecules. And with, um, for instance, if you load them up with MMAF, um, the full length antibodies and put them into a healthy mouse with its normal uh, immune system, you can see you start killing these mice at, uh, at a high dose of them. Uh, it's dose responsive. But antibodies with the same toxin on them are, there's no loss, weight, uh, weight loss in, in those, um, for those mice. They, they, uh, they don't even, you know, the, it seems to be of, have no toxicity whatsoever. Yet these antibodies, when laden with, with my colleague, um, uh, uh, Mike Evans, a really great collaboration we had with him, when we um, uh, uh, 
put on these, these uh, radio ligands on them, lutetium in particular, these very aggressive tumors which untreated grow like this can be significantly reduced in, in, uh, in tumor growth when treated with this, uh, this RLT. So that was very exciting. So this is a really exciting opportunity for target discovery. Novel targets on the surface of cancer cells, which are even some of the things we already knew to be upregulated, but now we can target them with antibodies. Lots of questions still left. The last two are really interesting. Are these loss or gain of function events? Does proteolysis uh, trigger things? Actually, most of the ones that have been annotated are gain of function, so they trigger pathways. And what do the shed, there's a lot of shed uh, products that are generated here too, and we're very interested in deorphanizing what those do. I now want to turn to uh, the, the cell uh, surface ohm and look at not just the, the CLE products that are out there, but, um, but what are the interactomes that are out there? What complexes are there and how do those change uh, with different oncogene transformations? Now, we know that neighborhoods change in signaling. Um, uh, these, for instance, in the, the classics are the, uh, the cytokine receptors, for instance, which cause oligomerization, like growth hormone, uh, uh, the EGFR um, uh, growth factor receptor, and HER2, and the cytokines. Um, but those have been found to oligomerize using bespoke studies where people deliberately look at them that way. So we want to study this proteomically, um, but the surfaceome is a difficult place to study protein complexes. Why is that? Um, these are some of the key properties of the surfaceome. First, the surfaceome is an incredibly crowded place. Everybody is within about 65 angstroms of each other. That's actually the girth of a normal, uh, of a normal protein. So think about it as a, instead of a hike in the park with your buddies, you're at a Taylor Swift concert with everybody sitting next to it. In fact, the density would be higher than this audience right now. Everybody's bumping into everybody else. Um, the volume, I already mentioned this, that the volume of the cytosol is about 100-fold lower than the volume. The, the volume of the skin is about 100-fold lower than the volume of the cytosol, yet the protein density is the same in the membrane and the cytosol. Everybody's about... 60 to 70 angstroms apart from each other. Um, that has consequences. For instance, that means that you lose three of your six degrees of freedom when you're in the membrane, right? You can only translate in two dimensions. You can only rotate in one dimension on the axis of the protein itself. Um, so that dramatically changes the dimensionality. That means that you, for actually regulated and important interactions, have, can have KDs up to 100 micromolar and still be very meaningful in terms of saturation, showing saturation binding and functional consequences. The other one, and this is one of my favorites, is that while the, um, the viscous drag in the membrane is about the same as in the cytosol once you're above the phase transition, because it's like olive oil versus water, um, you fly, you can find a partner in the cell surface, Jim uh, Farrell's group has shown, you can find a partner in the cell surface about 15 to 25 times faster than you can in the cytosol. So think of it like driving versus flying. If you hook your wagon to something on the cell surface and you wanna find another something else on the cell surface, you're going to find that uh, way, way faster than you're gonna find something in the cytosol. Okay, all these things are important and, 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 and convenient because there was a major breakthrough in, in the area of proximity labeling. It really means that we need to use proximity labeling tools where you can do a, a photographic view of, of cell membrane proteins. And this was a massive breakthrough from the, uh, the Merck group, uh, um, uh, Nihi Fadehi and Ra Rob Osland at Merck who were developing photocatalyst approaches to triggering carbenes, which they then collaborated with the Macmillan group at Princeton that brought in this new iridium catalyst that was even more efficient than the ones they had been using. And you can affix this iridium catalyst. They were using secondary antibodies onto a, onto a, a secondary antibody, bind a primary antibody to the target cell of interest, target protein of interest, shine blue light on it, which does not normally trigger uh, diazerines. Um, uh, to generate these highly reactive carbenes that have half-lives on the order of 
five nanoseconds. So there are you know, some musical chairs where the music is turned on instantly and then off, and you have to find a, a, a target. And we wondered, what was the distance dependence to this carbene labeling? So enter um, uh, Thomas Bartholo and Paul Burroughs, and enabled with uh, us, uh, these reagents from Rob Osland and Nihi Fadehi at Merck, we then went about site-specifically labeling antibodies and looking at, in, in a defined complex, namely HER2, the uh, trastuzumab complex, the distance dependence to labeling, finding out what is the maximal distance these carbines could fly. So in doing that, we get this histogram here where on the left you see uh, labeling that's self-labeling on the fab. Makes sense. It's right there. It's local. It's going to be hitting that more. But it, this labeling on HER2 can go all the way out to about 110 angstroms, out to the very, almost the very end of HER2, and then it stops. So that's, that gives you a sense, like, you know, like the, the R0 in fluorescence energy transfer, you want to know what are the distance dependence to these, these labelings. Um, in fact, we get very democratic labeling. Um, uh, Christina Wu here in the lab has done a lot of uh, diazerine carbene labeling of, of, of proteins and studies some of this. We find that basically all side chains can get uh, labeled and actually uh, consistent with her data, we find, do find a bias for arginines uh, uh, or aspartates, glutamates over lysines and arginines, for instance. But by and large, it labels, uh, labels across the board. We then started looking at complexes. This, we took, chose two nodes that I'm going to tell you about. Um, one is uh, the HER2 node, which is a critical uh, uh, oncogene. And so we added our uh, trastuzumab labeled with the iridium catalyst. Um, and as a control, we had a fatty acid version of this that can just float around in the membrane. Because remember, the membrane is crowded. You, you can get a lot of bystanders, ships in the night, that, uh, that are labeled what's real and what isn't. It's important to have these kinds of controls for that. So um, they did that, and lo and behold, we got very specific labeling of, of uh, HER2. Um, and, and I mentioned that we put the labeler, the catalyst, in different places on the fab, and we, and we looked at how do the diff, you know, depending on where that photocatalyst is on the fab, how would that affect the labeling on cells? It does, it has mild effects, but by and large, we found about uh, 20 or so targets, uh, and I'm showing an XY plot here. This would be labeled by the fatty acid control versus labeled by the, uh, uh, for uh, HER2. And you can see these off-diagonal targets. All of these we'd consider to be high-confidence labeling events that are on HER2, and most of these were never identified before. HER2 is like one of the most important oncogenes there is, and, and yet we, we, almost none of these had been identified as being right nearby. I want to point out just a few of them. Um, uh, um, th these, these here. Um, these two in particular are really interesting. PTPRF is a phosphatase. Now, HER2 is a kinase. Something has to turn it off. So this, this work identified what that phosphatase might be. Also, TGFR uh, uh, receptor um, had known to co-signal with HER2, but it wasn't understood what that relationship should be. We're seeing that it's right within this labeling distance of HER2 itself. There's a lot to follow up here, as you, as you might imagine. But, an, but then uh, enter these, these two folks, uh, uh, Lindsay Lin, a graduate student with Christina Wu. She comes from a photochemistry background. As our iridium reagent was running out with, um, with Merck, and that, that, that's a 10-step synthesis. Now, no challenge for the, 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 uh, some of the audience here, but kind of a challenge for, for some of us that uh, are studying more on the biochemistry uh, protein engineering side. So we wanted something that was more generic. She looked through a whole catalog of other organic photo dyes and found one called Eosin Y, which turns out to be a generic um, photocatalyst that's able to trigger not just the diazerine transi uh, uh, transition to a carbene, but also um, equally efficient aryl azide to nitrine transition, singlet oxygen, and phenoxy radicals from phenol transitions. So with one catalyst, 
the, and these different uh, photocatalytic probes have different ranges because of their, their lifetimes are different. Like this goes about 120 angstroms. The, the aryl nitrines go uh, on the order of 400 angstroms. And these phenoxy uh, radicals, which the Macmillan group has, has studied their range, goes out to about 3,000 angstroms. So you can, you can study the, the, the opportunity here is with one photocatalyst on an antibody, you can look at neighborhoods at different ranges. I, I use the, the, the analogy of Google Maps uh, at different re resolutions. What do we find here? Um, I won't roll through all of these things because we're prob I'm probably running out of time, um, although, yeah, maybe it's okay. Um, uh, in, 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 in these experiments, we just wanted to show the labeling of EGFR with our cetuximab, which is a, the therapeutic antibody that inhibits binding of EGF to the EGFR. So we loaded up our labeler on that, our, our, our cat catalyst on that. That's a little dot there. And then we looked at biotin uh, labeling of EGFR and the parent antibody. This can be competed off with EGF. So the control is what labels with the antibody and what labels when we compete it off with, with, uh, with EGFR. And you can see in the simple gel that, in fact, that worked beautifully. Um, if, you add, if, if, you, if you put the components together without EGF there, you get nice labeling of, uh, of EGFR uh, in vitro. If you add EGF, you can block that labeling um, uh, completely. So we then went to cells, and uh, uh, we could see that these antibodies lay, uh, that have the catalysts on them, they bind just as well to, um, as the native cetuximab, so our conjugation is not disturbing binding. Um, we then showed that if we add the different photoprobes, we have now the diazerine, the uh, the azide or the uh, uh, phenol, you can see, boom, this, the, this quadrant gets pop the upper right quadrant gets populated, which reflects both antibody binding and uh, biotin labeling. Uh, do proteomics. In fact, EGFR, you can see, is the, the dominant labeled uh, material because it's, it's the one that's closest to the antibody. But there's a tremendous uh, number of other things that are being labeled as well. Um, in fact, there's a Venn diagram for these different labeling things. The ones that we're most interested in are the ones that are the, the, the highest resolution labelers and the ones that are in common. All these things are done in biological triplicate with technical duplicate, um, very rigorous uh, mass spec standards. And so we found 29 high confidence neighbors that are near EGFR. Um, this experiment blew me away. Lindsay went and bought antibodies to all 29 of these proteins. And we did an IP Western where we asked, if we pull down on EGFR, um, can we see the partner protein there? And for 20 of these 29, they survived that pull down. I thought that might be five or six because of the, the strength of these interactions. Um, and that was validated this way. Um, the other thing, the other dimension they brought in, this was from Katie and, and, and Lindsay's work, is this new method of AlphaFold multimer. You've heard of AlphaFold? AlphaFold multimer is a newer version of that that predicts binary complexes from known structures. And they've established what the, uh, based on, on, on uh, you know, true positives, what the scoring metrics should be for this. And so, of when we applied alpha-fold multimer to these complexes, let me go straight to this here. Um, basically, of these 29 proteins shown in this, uh, this, uh, um, this histogram, uh, 15 of them had well exceeding the 1% false discovery rate that the PDOC, it's called a PDOCQ score for those. If you use a, a more conventional buried surface area, which structural biology fans like me would have more intuitive understanding of, kind of the Joel Janine and Cyrus Chothia me metric would say about 500 angstroms is kind of the minimum thing. If you apply that, actually 28 of 29 come out with plausible complexes. And when you look at the, the, these colored bars represent what came down with the, uh, with the uh, pull downs, you can see that actually if you apply this BSA, the sur buried surface area, uh, uh, criteria, you can see a, a very sh large shift in ones that co-validated uh, by pulldowns. 
These are some of the complexes we get. This one here is the PTPRF that I told you about for HER2. It's showing up again for EGFR. And the ectodomains, this is the EGFR ectodomain. This is the one for, uh, uh, for PTPRF predicted from AlphaFold. You can see that there's a tremendous surface area buried, something like 2,000 square angstrom, super high P.Q score. It would be well, it's one of these, these up here in this histogram. Now, you know that those are just the ectodomains. The kinase and phosphatase domains are underneath. Um, and so when we applied alpha-fold multimer to the kinase and phosphatase domains, they also gave a really high P.Q score. And uh, so I was blown away by this. By the way, the, the C terminus of EGFR is here. The N terminus of PTPRF is here. This, the N terminus of the kinase and phosphatase domains all point in the right directions. So these are, this work, I think, suggests that we ought to be doing a lot more structural biology. We ought to be rampantly applying this technology to understand these uh, amazing uh, signaling nodes. So there's a lot of next steps for this, uh, including moving into even organoids and tumors, solving structures, et cetera. One last thing, and I know uh, I'm close to time, just to mention is that using the longer range uh, radicals, we can actually see cell-cell uh, junctions. And this is a bite study where uh, we bring a, a, a victim cell to a T cell and look at what, um, what is in the vicinity. And we can use an ecto tag rather than the, uh, more recently, where we can put a flag tag, we have an antibody to that with the catalyst on it, and we can look at what's being tagged um, outside. So um, th we actually found a lot of the reset things that you'd expect to see around EGFR as well as the things around the T cell receptor. So th this we think is gonna be really exciting for looking at cell-cell interactions. So that's why I like this analogy of Google Maps because you, know, you, can, uh, you can be short range with like the, uh, 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 the carbene labeling or you can go long, mid range. Uh, this, is, this is our building, Brian. Brian Shoykett and I live in this building about 20 yards from each other, um, and it's got a catalyst attached to it. You can see that there. Um, and then, uh, yeah, further out to get a restaurant, you can go out here, or if you want to know where to go in the Bay Area, you can go to a longer range labeler. Okay, so I'm really excited about these other ways of probing the surface zone, because I think, you know, RNA levels are really important. We know that those don't correlate, frankly, well with expression. But even though knowing that something is expressed does not tell you about the PTMs and the opportunity to target those, we're left with only a small number of targets that we currently have. But I think looking at cleave products and the interactomes, we're going to be able to dramatically increase that, that, that target landscape. And now this is a, we have an annual offsite here. Um, this is our, our, our current group looking out, uh, the peaking out over the Golden Gate Bridge. Uh, these people are awesome to work with. I'm so blessed to be able to, uh, to be part of their careers and, and excited about their science. So um, also my collaborators want to mention Andre Sali, who's been do working with on the AlphaFold Multimer, Mike Evans, who I mentioned, uh, Ian Seipel, who's been working with us on uh, making antibody drug conjugates, Tony Kaziakoff and Dev Sidhu, uh, two of my former Genentech colleagues who are part of the RAN and help with, on the antibody uh, engineering side. I mentioned the Merck Group and these guys for funding. So thank you very much. Happy to take any questions. At the thank you for the amazing talk. We have time for maybe two to three questions. I guess I can ask Jim any time if there's someone else who wants to go first. I'll, I can okay, count okay. on so, this being the hardest question I'm going to get, Brian. Yeah. And well. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> so many things go through my mind. So for, <laughs> can you imagine, like, for the AlphaFold Multimer, I'm guessing it predicts more good complexes than, than meet your cutoff for, for the experimental. Like, um, can you use that? Like, well, I guess there's two yeah. questions there. One is like, are there false positives, or can you use that as a different way to to prioritize things, to to believe in more, or to go hunting for? 
Yeah, use the computer, sort of flip the workflow around, have it predict what good complexes would be going, uh, uh, Venn diagram that against interesting biology, and then focus the neighborhood detailed studies on, that's exactly one of the directions we're going, Brian. Thanks for that, yeah. Great talk. I have a question. Can you measure the uh, distance labeling when you deliver unbiased fatty acid with the radium catalyst? And yeah, is it possible? Yeah. So that iridium cat. So I mentioned the cell surface capture method at the beginning, where we grab things by their carbohydrates, label that way. Also, the the other one that went by kind of fast, the the wheat germagglutin and HRP method, where we just bind something to carbohydrates on cells and then look at labeling. And that iridium fatty acid thing, so we've compared all three in just general surface omics, and there's amazing overlap between those three methods. So yeah, you, it, it, we can use that, um, and uh, we're excited to. <coughs> Great. <clears throat> Great talk. Um, I was just wondering, from a structural perspective, where, would you imagine using cryo-EM or something like cryo-ET? Just what you were thinking. Uh, oh, man, that's, yeah, I'm talking to our colleagues, Clem Verba and Natalia Jura, who study uh, EGFR and HER2, respectively, about using that. And also my buddy Tony Kozikoff here at University of Chicago about doing some of these structures. I think this is really ripe for sort of hypothesis generation. I haven't gotten into also, uh, you know, doing knockouts of these neighbors and looking at the function. Um, other sort of biological validation or mutagenesis methods, which would also tell us so, some more validating information, all would be on the table. Yeah. Maybe last question. Thank you very much. It's, it's truly inspiring. And I'm just wondering about the um, neighborhood project and oh, whether you have thought about improving the resolution of the technology. Perhaps we can identify regions of interactions instead of uh, only at protein level. And have you um, have any like, ideas and ways for improvement there? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and uh, we're very uh, interested in, in using uh, uh, Lan Huang at Irvine has developed uh, mass spec cross-linking uh, approaches. Now those are, you really get a, a very complicated pro, uh, proteomic analysis for that, but we're very interested, we're actually going to be collaborating with her uh, to develop other cross-linkers, and the resolution there would be more like 15 to 30 angstrom, so we were, we're interested in pushing the resolution down. And there's other things we can do with the photoprobes themselves that would sort of, uh, uh, you know, build intermediate distances in between. So I think all of those, uh, you know, right now there's four different kind of levels of looking, uh, depending on the photoprobe. And I think that we could generate a whole bunch more. Yeah. Okay. Let's thank Dr. Jim Wells again. Thank you. Next, we have Dr. Wang Hua Chou from our very own UIC Chemistry, and he's going to be talking to us about lipid-targeting cancer drugs. Okay, again, my name is Wan Wa Cho, I'm in USC Chemistry. I have one question. Who put me between highly anticipated Jim Wells talk and even more highly anticipated free lunch? <laughs> I guess my only chance is just being short and sweet. So that's what I'll do. Oh, it's not showing up. I thought it was up already. Yeah. All right. 
So, let me see. Okay, it works. Yeah, uh, you heard about uh, you know, EGFR and growth factor receptors. So a growth factor uh, signaling pathway, a hyperactivation of such uh, by a drug mutation or epigenetic control uh, lead to various cancer. For that reason, proteins in uh, EGF signaling pathway, uh, any growth factor signaling pathway, has been a major target for uh, cancer drug development. Unfortunately, uh, many of these drugs, mostly uh, kinase inhibitors, don't work for all patients. And even, they when, uh, even when they work well initially, tumors rapidly develop the resistance and leading to uh, cancer relapse and in, in eventual death. So drug resistance is, is a major problem. So what caused this uh, drug resistance? Uh, there has been intense research on the mechanism of uh, cancer drug uh, resistance for the past two decades. And these studies have indicated that the cancer cell has intrinsic ability to withstand uh, this onslaught and survive under uh, extreme condition. So the question is, what is a secret weapon? And I belong to a small uh, school of people who believe that it's a lipid. And as a matter of fact, cancer cells need lipid and lots of lipid, right? Because uh, lipids serve as a cell building block and they also serve as uh, energy sources. So uh, cancer cell typically reprogram their lipid me metabolism to produce many lipid molecules. Now, what's less recognized is the fact that many of these uh, the oncogenic proteins are directly regulated by membrane lipid. That means that if cancer cell can increase the amount of lipid in particular location, they can constitutively activate oncogenic pathway allowing them to survive under extreme condition, right? And perhaps more importantly, if you block that process by you know, blocking the lipid protein interaction, maybe you can suppress the uh, tumor growth under extreme condition and, and, and suppress their uh, drug resistance. Does it actually work? So I'm gonna show the example of this uh, lipid protein interaction uh, approach using uh, this uh, one on target. And before that, I'll just mention that the conventional uh, problem of a conventional uh, targeted approach using this uh, well-known kinase called SIG, uh, uh, SAG, I'm sorry. And the SAG is activated by EGFR uh, uh, activation. And it binds to a uh, phosphorylated EGFR undergoing conformational change and, and its active site is opened up. So typical uh, kinase inhibitor approach is to make a molecule that binds to these uh, active sites called APT competitive inhibitors. The problem of this uh, approach is even when act activity of the protein is uh, inhibited, it can still serve as scaled scaffolding molecule that leads to a uh, resistance mechanism, all right? And so there are two major problems. One is a specificity problem because ATP binding pockets are very similar among kinases. So many kinase inhibitors are not very specific. And also you have, you have this uh, uh, you know, scaffolding rela uh, related resistant problem. This is a very common problem. It's for, it, it works for uh, Gleebeck, for uh, ABL kinase, and a bunch of other uh, kinase inhibitors. Now, we believe that uh, LPI inhibitor or lipid protein interaction inhibitor can overcome this uh, limitation because LPI binding site, unlike the ATP binding site, are highly variable. So you can make an inhibitor and it will be very specific. Also, 
there is a multiple uh, line of evidence suggesting that this lipid protein interaction is important for scaffolding function. So LPI inhibitor can, can serve as a magic bullet to uh, take care of the specificity problem and prevent uh, scaffolding uh, uh, issues. So as a kind of pilot studies, we uh, made a LPI inhibitor for a sick kinase which play a major role in the uh, most common type of leukemia called AML. And this molecule is the most potent and specific sick kinase inhibitor ever known, blocks the catartic function as well as the scaffolding function, and most importantly, AML cell cannot develop resistance to our compound under the condition where it readily developed the resistance to ATP targeting inhibitor like endosplatinum. So inspired by this uh, success, we decided to apply this technology to a most common type of lipid, cholesterol. So cholesterol has been associated with cancer for many, many years. And so when you know, your blood cholesterol level goes up, and it enhances the chance of uh, tumor relapse or uh, resistance to uh, tumor uh, uh, therapy, especially in breast cancer. So based on this uh, early finding, there has been numerous attempts to repurpose uh, cholesterol-lowering drug like statin into anti-tumor uh, reagent. So there has been uh, you know, explosion of the uh, papers uh, related to this topic. Unfortunately, Critical benefit of this uh, statin-based uh, uh, cancer treatment has not been demonstrated, so it doesn't work. Now, one uh, positive outcome from this study is a, fi is a finding that actually tumor cell has much higher concentration of cholesterol and cholesterol derivatives than normal cells. So, you know, again, approach to reduce the cholesterol level in the cell to uh, shrink the tumor has not worked so far. It's because we don't really know the mechanism by which cholesterol-induced cancer, all right? So this underscored the uh, need to really understand the cholesterol-based uh, you know, oncogenic signaling and develop a new approach to block these uh, processes. So why, why does this obvious approach doesn't work? If you look at the how cholesterol level is regulated in, 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 in the cell, it's, it's, it's become very, very uh, clear. So cholesterol can be taken off by the receptor-mediated pathway, and it goes to the uh, lysosome for processing, and cholesterol can be also synthesized within the cell, and using, using this bunch of enzyme and statin inhibit uh, late limiting step of this uh, de novo cholesterol biosynthesis. Cholesterol can be also uh, stored as a cholesterol ester, and it can be uh, transforming, uh, it can be exported out of the cell using this uh, ABCA or A1 uh, transporters. And cholesterol can be also converted into oxysterol, which are also very active uh, compound. And finally, cholesterol can be trafficked and transported into the uh, different uh, cellular organelles. So it's a very complex process. And cholesterol, cellular cholesterol level is tightly regulated. So if you just block uh, cholesterol biosynthesis by statin, cell will find a way to increase the concentration somehow, all right? So what you need is really, un and this is also a cell-specific process. You know, different cancer cells work differently. So you have to really study this in a, a single cell uh, in a level analysis, and you have to understand where are all these cholesterol molecules and what do they do in different locations. So to address this uh, problem, we developed a new technique of cholesterol quantification using uh, this ratiometric imaging. And so uh, we, have the, we made a sensor that changes color when it binds cholesterol. And we can use this one to measure the concentration of cholesterol in different cellular locations, including two leaflets of the plasma membrane. So for example, in the outer plasma membrane, you see the concentration here. And like 40 more percent, which is very high. So, you know, out of replet of the uh, plasma membrane has a very high concentration of cholesterol. However, in the inner replet, we were very surprised to found, find that cholesterol level in the inner replet is extremely low, especially for primary cell, normal cell, is almost undetectable. However, tumor cell 
have much higher concentration of this so-called IPM cholesterol that leads to a, a, all the, this uh, hallmark of the uh, cancer cell, including drug resistance. And you can also measure the concentration in intracellular, like, uh, like a, a lysosome here. All right, so what does, what does all this mean? When cholesterol concentration is high, that leads to oncogenic signaling. What, what does that all mean? I'm going to show you a, uh, what this means using one uh, cancer as an example. It's a colorectal cancer, which has become a societal problem because many people under 50 are now getting this uh, you know, CIC, cholesterol, uh, colorectal cancer because of this uh, you know, kind of behavioral problems, diet related and all those things. So there's a, a signaling pathway called WINT signaling. And uh, normally, this protein called beta-catenin is degraded con uh, continuously. So the cellular level of beta-catenin is very low. But when, is it already time? OK. <laughs> well, was, yeah. All right, anyway, so I'm going to go fast anyway, yeah. Uh, so when the wind receptor binds, then beta-catenin is released, and that, that goes to a uh, nucleus and, you know, promote the cell growth and uh, proliferation. It's important, extremely important for embryo development. But in adult cell, uh, wind signaling is tightly regulated, except for stem cell. And do you know that your uh, intestinal cell has to be renewed every week? And it, 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 requ it requires a wind signaling, because intestinal stem cell has to re continue to renew your, your, your uh, uh, intestinal cell. Now, what's interesting about this wind signaling is about 90% of colorectal cancer patients has mutation in wind signaling pathway. In particular, about 80% of all patients has a, a mutation in one protein called APC, and they have a, a, a truncation, which leads to a constitutive activation of signaling pathway causing colorectal cancer, right? Now, Despite intense research for the last two decades and in, in, in both academia and, and industry, there is no FDA-approved wind-targeting CRC therapy because mainly because of the uh, you know, toxicity. Because if you inhibit wind signaling, it causes a lot of uh, problem, you know, intestinal problem and all those things. We are inspired by a recent reports indicating that cholesterol biosynthetic uh, pathway inhibitor can selectively uh, inhibit APC truncated CIC cell under very uh, limited condition. So we, we wanted to exp uh, extend this thing. And so we actually first measured the cholesterol concentration in APC truncated CIC cell. Initially, we measured the total concentration in collaboration of Stephanie Colonna. There was no difference between normal and colonial cancer cell. So we look at the different uh, places. And only difference was found in in a plasma membrane, as I mentioned before. And look at here, uh, APC truncated CRC cell has much higher concentration than normal colon cell. And if you look at it in detail, there's actually at least tenfold difference in concentration. Right? And what this uh, elevate, local, locally elevated cholesterol does is bring the protein involved in this uh, wind signaling pathway together through this uh, uh, cholesterol D bear interaction, and that uh, constitutively activate the beta signaling pathway. And so we demonstrate this thing by using single molecule tracking experiment. You can see that without stimulus, in the constitutively, DVL protein and fragile receptors are co localized, and you can do measure their co localization time. And then if you uh, deplete the cholesterol from the plasma membrane, site specific manner, that's gone. And if you measure the uh, beta catenin level, it's consistent with this finding, All right? So I, I know that I don't have time for a joke slide, but I just wanted to show that, do you really think that cholesterol can bring these proteins together, right? Eh? Anyway. Uh, okay, so um, uh, more, more, more importantly, so if you block the cholesterol protein interaction, you, you should be able to block, uh, uh, suppress the, uh, you know, this uh, wind signaling in, in this uh, CRC cell. And that's exactly what happened. So we made a cholesterol 
uh, DBL interaction inhibitor is called WC522. And this compound potently suppressed the wind signaling in uh, CRC, uh, I mean, the APC truncated CRC cell. But it did not inhibit wind signaling in, in normal co uh, colon cell. Right? And in in vivo experiment with a xenograft, demonstrate that WC522 is a potent anti-tumor uh, agent, and it did not uh, cause any uh, side effect on intestinal cell. So uh, the manuscript received a very positive view, and hope, hope that this will be uh, published pretty soon. But we may have first ever a safe uh, wind-targeting CRC drug here. All right. Anyway, so question is, is it just one case, or is it a really general uh, phenomenon? And just to show that this actually uh, cholesterol-mediated process is happened, it's a very universal process, is we actually measure cholesterol concentration, especially the inner plasma membrane cholesterol concentration in a bunch of uh, you know, cancer cells. I wish I had access to your 100 uh, cancer cell, but we have to buy one, $500, you know, try one more time, you know, and we, we, we try. And, and so we, we got all this data, and it consistently showed that each cancer cell has cancer cell-specific, subtype-specific cholesterol concentration. That leads to activation of a particular set of protein, all right? And we also found that by through this proteomic uh, proteomic scale uh, screening of cholesterol binding protein, there are a bunch of protein that interact with specifically and directly interact with the cholesterol. And using this uh, turbo ID uh, proximity based method, uh, in collaboration with Jeremy Baskin and Alex Ed Beckin, we actually have identified that many protein interact with the. Uh, plasma membrane cholesterol in a concentration-dependent manner. In certain range of the uh, cholesterol concentration, certain type of protein in track. So just to put everything together, I mentioned that there's a uh, you know, gross factor signaling pathway, major target for cancer drug development. There are problems, right? Uh, resistant problems, specificity problem. Now, we discovered that there's another signaling pathway. It's mediated by cholesterol in the plasma membrane. Cholesterol level is very tightly regulated by this protein called ABCA1 that usually pushes the cholesterol uh, to the outside. So inner lip blood has a very low concentration, but cancer cell has a high concentration. I showed the example of colon arterial cancer having this particular concentration that leads to the activation of uh, this protein, DBL, and, and downstream pathway. I didn't have all the uh, time to show all the, all the data, so if you're interested in detail, uh, Ashtosh has a poster outside, and you can see all the details. And then we also uh, found that in, in two types of most lethal breast cancer without the targeted therapy, so uh, TMBC, you heard it a few times, triple negative breast cancer, and IBC is uh, inflammatory breast cancer. They have a unique level of cholesterol, and they have actually, they, which specifically uh, regulate downstream pathway that all leads to a cancer cell stemness and drug resistance. And these are mechanism, metabolism-driven processes. No stimulus is necessary, and it doesn't depend on mutation. So this is an intrinsic pathway that allow cancer cell to survive without having to undergo mutations or you know, rely upon uh, growth factor or any, 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 any uh, uh, nutrient. More importantly, uh, by developing this uh, cholesterol protein interaction inhibitor, you can suppress this process, especially resistance to uh, extrinsic growth factor signaling pathway. And this also, uh, this cholesterol concentration in the inner leaflet of the uh, plasma membrane can serve as a biomarker, and you can, you can actually uh, serve to, uh, it, it can predict the success of the particular targeted therapy, or it can, it can even suggest a particular type of targeted therapy. So this, we call it intrinsic growth factor signaling pathway. And this intrinsic pathway, extrinsic pathway work to, uh, in, 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 in together, uh, leading to a, a, uh, this uh, drug resistant problem. And I hope that in the next few years, we'll come up with something to do, to do something about this uh, drug resistant problem. 
Thank you. And I also thank my students, collaborators, and everybody. For a few questions. Beautiful talk. Do you see the same effects from wind uh, active cells? I guess, it, do, do you require having an active wind pathway um, intrinsically in the cell, or, does the, or, or, or can you get, differentiate based on whether the cell signaling is active in, in yeah, the wind so pathway or not? Yeah, so normal cells require wind ligand to activate the wind signaling. The tumor cell, especially that uh, colorectal cancer, they don't need wind ligand to activate the signaling pathway. They just need the cholesterol. So if you just block the cholesterol protein interaction, then you can, you can selectively block the uh, wind signaling in, in colorectal cancer cell. I mean, the story is a little bit more complex than them. I have to really oversimplify it, but details probably in the poster. And also, uh, another student, Hung Gi Kim, has a poster on how uh, high cholesterol in, in, in uh, in uh, I, uh, inflammatory breast cancer, activate AKT in a completely PIC kind of independent manner. That's also a very new story. All right, so I assume that there's no more question. And so there will be portal session now? Poster session and lunch now. No, no, what about taking pictures? Oh, <laughs> yeah, photos, yes. Yeah. Okay. Is, is there a, you want to take pictures? Yeah, I mean, everybody would be happy to go to lunch now. <laughs> we can do it later then, right? Yeah. All right, enjoy your lunch then. <laughs> Thank you.
continue with our afternoon session and our first talk will be uh, by Tom Driver and Paul Carlier and both will be representing the UI Center which is our campus-wide uh, initiative for drug discovery and drug development and they will share a little bit about you know what's going on in terms of uh, both discovery and development you know and also collaboration between the LAS and the UI Center and so please the stage is yours. Great. Thanks for the kind introduction. Uh, I'm on study section right now, so it's, it's, it's nice to be able to step away from it for a few minutes. I can put this timer up, so instead of 15-minute countdown, I get to see a nine-minute countdown. And so uh, the title of our talk is Some Partnerships Between LAS and UI Center. And so I wanted to talk about sort of where this, this, this really started. Um, in 2011, so the interesting part that we wanted to sort of figure out was how to leverage all of the expertise in doing synthesis. And this is just sort of a cartoon of... Oh, we got um, it for the live stream. A cartoon of sort of an, a normal drug discovery uh, proposal, and this is the one on our pulmonary arterial hypertension one. And to highlight sort of the synergistic sort of activities between how do you identify a lead and how do you use and leverage synthesis to come up with a novel composition of material that you can use for, uh, to apply for, for a patent. Um, and so I would argue strongly that method development creates novel shaped molecules that explore new kinds of space. We all are very well aware that increasing the number of SP3 hybridized carbons seems to lead to better clinical outcomes for the types of uh, compounds and wanted to sort of, again, highlight UIC's a strong tradition of drug discovery and development by the organic division. And so I think the natural place to start with is, Tom, is from really sorry, uh, Mo but they can't Moriarty. And so Mo uh, was an exquisite entrepreneur. He published uh, more than 90 patents, and I want to draw your attention to one patent that just came out in 2022 that was uh, published posthumously from him. So after Mo passed on, he still is uh, publishing patents, which I think is a, is, a, is a real cool aspect to his legacy. Um, and so he founded a company, Steroids, in 1989 and sold it to United Therapeutics in 1999 and, and helped fund a lot of things. This tradition of drug discovery and excellence was continued on by Aaron Ghosh, and I'm just showing a picture of our favorite molecule here at UIC, which is Prezista, shown right here, um, which has really provided funding for a great deal of uh, new development and, and, and drugs and drug discovery. In addition to his beautiful work with Persista, while Aaron was here, he also did some beautiful chemistry uh, to de develop some new inhibitors of BACE1 um, to, to, to target uh, Alzheimer's. So in addition to Aaron, David Kreitsch, um, who, who I basically passed in the night, in addition to being an absolute expert in the uh, harnessing of radicals and the development of new methods to create carbohydrates, also engaged in drug discovery, and I've shown a patent of his shown right here, in which um, he was interested in inhibiting the efflux of drugs out of, out of, out of uh, cells. And along those same lines, Vlad was a key instrumental port of this $11 million Chicago Tri-Institutional Center for Clinical Methods and Library Development to speed drug discovery. And so it's against this backdrop that in 2011 that uh, Skip Garcia, Greg Thatcher, and one of Skip's lieutenants, uh, Dr. Roberto Machado, and I met to try and target uh, the development of a small molecule therapeutic for the disease that uh, Roberto was observing in his patients pulmonary arterial hypertension. So this is a, a relatively minor disease that doesn't affect that many people, but there is no cure for it. Um, if you uh, get PAH over the course of about five years, um, it will develop from a mild case into a severe case, which will dramatically increase the pressure in the right ventricle of your heart, and then you will die. Um, the current treatment for pulmonary arterial hypertension are just vasodilators. So there's no cure for this particular disease. And what Roberto had discovered or noted in his patients was that those that suffered from pulmonary arterial hypertension had an overexpression in their plasma of this enzyme called uh, NAMPT. And so we had this idea 
that we could leverage the expertise from our side of campus to make in heterocyclic containing molecules with the expertise in the College of Medicine, and Skip at the time was uh, the Vice Chancellor of Research. And Greg had this idea to set up this sort of nexus that would serve as this sort of meeting point to make connections, so sort of like uh, high-speed dating for people on east side of campus with west side of campus to establish collaborations that might lead to something cool. And so what we uh, did over the course of a few years um, was uh, use uh, this sort of project to, 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 to really showcase what you can do with a little bit of seed funding. And so we obtained some seed funding in 2014, um, which enabled us to design molecules. And this was done um, by one of my graduate students, is Xin Yu uh, Guan, who's on, on our patent, um, in Pasha Petakov's class. Um, and so he was looking at doing some docking studies of molecules into NAPT. He designed a suite of molecules and he made them. Um, we also uh, used uh, Kira Ratia, who's also on our patent shown here, um, in her high throughput screening uh, facility to examine their activities against NAMP to identify a, a number of nanomolar uh, inhibitors. Uh, Kira was able to grow a crystal structure, and it's shown right here, showing that our inhibitors are allosteric uh, binders to NAMPT. And then after going through the cellular assays, uh, Roberto, who had now moved on to, to become the chief of the pulmonary uh, division at IU, uh, showed in his preclinical rat models uh, that treatment of our compounds to these rats uh, seemingly prevented PAH and also cured them of PAH. Um, and so with that, we were able to leverage the seed funding from UIC to obtain a contract from an HLBI and a DPI award, which allowed us to establish uh, a company that uh, Roberto and I uh, co-founded a few years ago. And, and excitingly, our, our, our patent was just issued uh, a little over a year ago now. And so what is really kind of cool about these molecules is that you simply make a small change to their structure and you can turn them from an inhibitor into an activator. And so we were able to continue our collaboration with Thatcher and Leon Tai, uh, publish a, a provisional patent, and then we've just uh, disclosed this in ACS Medicinal Chemistry Letters um, to, to show that you, you can uh, increase the amount of NAD in a, in a cell um, by turning an inhibitor into an activator. And so I wanted to highlight, in addition to us, some of our other, and I still have two minutes, successful partnerships with chemistry. And so we have had seven UIC C grants from 2013 to 2019, um, totaling 200K. Um, we've uh, enabled to turn these into uh, really nice collaborations. Um, this is a, a tri-school uh, big U grant between the University of Chicago, uh, IIT, and us to develop a small molecule uh, CSE inhibitor uh, to potential cure of sleep apnea. Um, what kind of grew out of this project was controlling the concentration of H2S, um, which we uh, used to establish a collaboration with Dave Evington and Jolly Raymond uh, to look at the effect of H2S on the morphology of cancer cells using microfluidics. Um, and then uh, separately, uh, the synthesis of novel single lipids, um, which is uh, a project headed up by uh, Professors Nataran and, and Thatcher a few years ago and us to make some of these really cool phosphorus-containing molecules. Um, I want to highlight the work of Duncan, particularly in um, the development of CSC inhibitors for sleep-disordered breathing, which he published with Thatcher. Um, just a few years ago, and what they're currently investigating is reprogramming macrophages to identify new HDAC inhibitors. Um, and finally, I want to end on what I think is a really cool success story uh, for UI Center, which is uh, the use of some seed funding to, to help uh, Professor Leslie Aldridge establish, I think, uh, some truly amazing chemistry and work uh, using and leveraging autophagy inhibitors and modulating the activity of autophagy uh, to establish multi-PI projects that resulted in two multi-PI jumbo R01s with a variety of collaborators on both east side and west side of campus. And so I think uh, these success stories is uh, what make me uh, be just absolutely thrilled to be, continue to be a part of UI Center, uh, which has truly been the highlight of my professional career here at UIC. So thank you, and I'll turn the floor over to Paul um, to tell you about some of the cool th new things at UI Center. You can take the mic with you. The tag team continues. Uh, Tom's uh, been at UIC uh, for longer, longer than I have. I came in 2022, and um, I, 
I'm glad to sort of tell you about the next chapter of UI Center. And I guess just to put it out there, why is it spelled that way? Um, R-E. Um, the founding director of UI Center is Greg Thatcher. You've heard him. He is British, and so there you have it. And it actually, it's, a, it's, it's an acronym, but it's a word sandwich. I'm not going to go there, OK? We're just going to not ask what it means. Um, so we are the campus-wide drug discovery enterprise of the university, and I'm really proud to be appointed in two colleges, liberal arts and sciences and pharmacy. And I wanted to do that to sort of reinforce that message that we exist for the benefit of the whole university. And maybe different from some drug discovery centers, we really exist to um, catalyze the formation of multidisciplinary teams. We don't have a particular therapeutic focus. We just look for the best science and try to go from there. So again, just uh, reinforcing my message, you can see who supports us. It's really terrific. Um, we get supports from several deans, the provost, um, the Vice Chancellor for Health Affairs. And uh, so together, I think we're able to do much more than we could do otherwise. And I have uh, excellent staff. And so you see here 10 pictures, but it ends up to be about nine FTE. And I just want to point out my Associate Director, Laura Bloom, she was at Lilly for 15 years. She's an expert quantitative biologist. And she's retiring, and we'll soon, we've identified her replacement, and we'll soon announce that. Um, and then we have expert medicinal chemists. You'll hear about Irina in a little bit. Um, uh, bioanalytical folks, um, uh, bioassay, it's really a great team. And we not only have our sort of full-time staff in the center, we're very fortunate to work with expert faculty across the university. And so Alex Adebekian introduced us. He is one of our uh, tech leads, our technology leaders. Um, in his case, MassSpec enabled discovery. Tom is another one of these uh, tech leads. We rely on his expertise in synthetic chemistry and other aspects. Jeremy Johnson is expert pharmacokineticist. Pavel Petchkov, you heard his name. He is expert in computer-aided molecular design. And then Lee Jun Rong, we've worked with for many years. He is a very well-known virologist. So uh, we also have fantastic core facilities here at UIC. And so Hyun Lee um, of the Biophysics Corps and Kira Ratia, you heard her name as well. Just doing my time check. All right. So of course, we all want to discover drugs, and that's our goal. But we have a lot of intermediate milestones, which I think are worth, um, note, worth um, uh, recognizing. So we've done statistics up to 2022, and over that period, we've made 45 of these collaborative seed projects. And as you heard, seven of them went to chemistry. And follow-on total grants. So these are grants that were won from the federal government or a foundation where we can trace a very seminal contribution from our seed funds, $41 million. Um, so that's quite a good return. And uh, well, we know the university has invested other things in us as well, personnel equipment. So if you include the total expenditures of UIC in UI Center, our return of investment is about six. So we're quite happy about this. You can see the large number of patent filings and the number of compounds that have entered clinical trials. Of course, we want that to be higher, but we're working on it. So as I mentioned, and this is really for the people that are here at UIC that have not, that don't know much about UI Center or who would like to work with us, how do we work? We are not a cost center. Um, we want to hear your idea, and we want you to, uh, um, <clears throat> we want you to tell us what you'd like to do, and if we think it's a worthy idea and we can contribute, then we'll make seed, uh, seed grant to you. We are funded by MOUs from various units on campus, external grants, and indirect cost return. And so that's our goal, to sort of be the engine for collaboration and ideation. OK, so I'm going to skip through this slide. You probably have a good idea of what we do, and just talk about our current early stage portfolio. Right now, we're working in many areas of cancer, infectious disease, inflammation, cardiovascular disease, and neuropathic pain. And uh, yeah, it's, it's really exciting, and I'm very proud of what, what we've been able to accomplish. Uh, as a highlight of something that's just come out, um, so recently, UI Center, um, Irina Gaisina, and College of Medicine PIs, as well as Terry Moore and College of Pharmacy, 
uh, have a paper in Science and Advances on a new orally active antiviral. So that's quite exciting. We funded a lot of um, grants in the last two years, about 210,000. That may not sound like much, but it can be influential. One of those went to Dr. Cho here in chemistry. And so I just wanted to let you know that we have two upcoming RFA deadlines, and they're not on our website yet, but they will be, and so you're the first to see them. So new, new RFA is being funded in the next fiscal year. Um, so I think I just want to acknowledge Colleen Pearson and Kim Huang, uh, my fantastic uh, administrative help um, at UI Center, and uh, thank you for your attention. Glad to take any questions. Tom, where are you? Thank you. Tom and Paul, thank you so much for this uh, excellent overview. And sadly, for the sake of time, you know, we don't have uh, time for questions. So uh, if you have any questions, you are welcome to ask after the session is over. So we'll move on to our next uh, talk, which will be given by uh, Brian Schuchert, who is one of our distinguished speakers. And so if you are in drug discovery field, you really do need an introduction for uh, Brian Schuchert. You know, but, so we were told to, to introduce uh, within uh, one minute the time frame, which is impossible in this case because there are so many <laughs> different achievements and uh, uh, amazing, yeah. Okay, I'll use the microphone, yeah. So, you know, just a uh, uh, couple of key words, you know, structure-based uh, drug design and ligand discovery, uh, chem informatics, especially we'll focus on uh, GPCRs, and then also interestingly, uh, you know, clustering of proteins not based on sequence or structure, but based on the ligands which bind to these proteins, and so much more. But with this, you know, I'll stop and give the word. Right. Stop and see if you can figure out how to do this. So does this guy go in here? Is that what have you got an H? What, what have you got here? No, we want to use this other one. Okay. thinking. You got it. <laughs> okay, uh, uh, thrilled to be here. Just amazing talks. Uh, great colleagues. I've uh, been very impressed, Jim. I think they've uh, set the standard for what we were, we'll try and do at UCSF with the Center for Drug Discovery. Um, okay, so uh, I'll, I'll just take, I, you know, I don't know, maybe you're not as bad as me, but I, I um, sometimes I space out in talks, so uh, I thought I'd just, um, you know, give you <laughs> what I'm going to try and uh, pitch to you today, and then if you want to space out, you'll have, at least you'll have seen it. Um, so I'm going to introduce ultra-large library docking, which is the sort of disruptive innovation in our field in the last few years. Um, I'll take you briefly through, uh, you know, where it's led us to in terms of getting better molecules, sometimes directly out of the large library structure-based screen. Um, in terms of animal efficacy, and I'll uh, I'll take you a, a, in the slightly more detail about why, you know, there's, uh, some of you um, might have been told 10 years ago that docking doesn't work, and uh, that's the last thing you remember about docking, but uh, so I'll try and um, convince you that there's uh, reasons to believe, for all of its problems, which are legion, um, there's reasons to believe that it actually, uh, not only that it does work, which I'll, I'll, I'll show you some examples of, but there's reasons to believe that it should work. Um, and then uh, I'll take you through, um, so most of the talk is unpublished. Uh, I'll, I'll take you through uh, a um, recent work, uh, now in review, on you know why we've invested a lot, we and others, but a lot of it's from us, have invested a lot in growing the library um, that we're docking into the billions. And um, I'll try and convince you that that's been very important to the success, the growth of the chemical space. That's genuinely accessible, um, both computationally and experimentally. And then I'll take you through um, some other unpublished work um, 
where we've um, uh, looked to see how useful alpha fold models are for templating living discovery. There's, there's this, um, there's, since the alpha fold paper came out, there have been about 20 papers that have said, you know, alpha fold is great, but it doesn't really work for structure based ligand discovery because everything has to be right and they're not perfect in the binding site. And actually, our experience is very different, and I'll tell you about that. Okay, that's the talk. Um, these are my conflicts, which UCSF says I have to show you, so now you've seen them. Um, okay, so um, this is a large library document, at least as it was four or five years ago. We would start, and we still start with the structure of a target. This is a GPCR and uh, a library of, um, I don't know if my, does my mouse appear? Oh yeah, and a li library of um, small molecules uh, that we're gonna screen. It's important, I said there's three million available molecules, it's important that they be readily available uh, because uh, docking has lots of failures and uh, we want to make the cost of failure cheap. So if we predict that the first molecule will bind and it doesn't bind, then it's, it's cheap to go to the next molecule. And, um, and so uh, they have to be readily available. For us, that means commercially available. And uh, we screen them, we, we fit them into the binding site in multiple orientations and multiple conformations of each molecule on the order of about a million configurations are sampled for each molecule. And we score it using um, uh, a physics-based uh, scoring function which has lots of approximations and leaves out important terms. There's no relaxation, for instance. And um, it's, we don't do that because we don't think it's important. We do it because we have to be fast. And, and, um, and, and the big thing, the reason we still have to be fast is that the, the library, the big change is that the library has gone from three million to five billion molecules. And, and, and that's, um, that's just what we can dock right now. The, the actual library is much bigger. Okay, so um, how do we get to five? What's driven us to these large libraries? So, um, so virtual libraries. We, for years, decades, we restricted ourselves. The field restricted itself to um, molecules that somebody somewhere had made and was in a vial and would sell you. And that's because we didn't want to dock molecules that you couldn't actually get. Um, meanwhile, this idea of virtual libraries, much bigger than the molecules you could actually get, had, have been around for 20 years, but we never, we never bought into them. And the reason we didn't buy into them is we didn't think you could get the stuff. If you can't get the stuff, it's, it's literally worse than useless. Um, because you could dock a molecule that scores really well, and it, but you can't get it. And it, meanwhile, it, it pushes down the ranking of some other molecule that you could get and test. So that was a problem. Um, but um, meanwhile, these guys at um, Enamin, uh, this company in, in, in Kiev, um, led by Yuri Moroz, um, ha had um, invested for decades, really, in building up this uh, library of building blocks, um, which by now has grown to about uh, a quarter of a million molecules that they have on site in 10 gram quantities uh, in Kiev. And, um, and they developed. Uh, reactions for putting various subsets of the building blocks together in two or three component, typically single purification reactions. And um, that has led to, you know, when you enumerate them, really over, by now, over about 60 billion um, possible molecules that they've enumerated and, and they think that they can make. Um, they're actually careful about what they, they don't, not everything that they can enumerate goes into the library. They, they really think they can make it. And the, because the building blocks are sort of tricked out molecules, lots of stereo centers, spiral rings, fuse rings, interesting looking molecules. The, the products are interesting too. And we were pretty skeptical about this uh, library because of our past experience with virtual libraries. But um, we found over, before we dove into it, we, we spot checked it and said, well, can you get us this one? And they would get it to us. And can you get us that one? And, and, and um, they were, it turns out they were pretty good at making the molecules and our experiences, they claim, they, they will stand behind an 80% fulfillment rate for any particular molecule that you order. Our experience is that it's actually better. Um, so anyways, we bought into it and, um, and then our problem was, well, we have to, because we're docking as a physical uh, simulation, we physically fit the molecules into the site. We have to have physical models for each molecule, which means we have to have we calculate 
hundreds of conformations. We have to calculate uh, partial atomic charges and desolvation energies and physical properties, and blah, blah, blah. And, um, and that takes time. And when you start getting into the billions, um, uh, you, you know, uh, we basically we're lagging behind the enumeration of possible molecules in terms of our ability to build them. Um, nevertheless, we, we have by now built about five billion of them. Um, and we started docking them against targets that we were interested in. And, and at least anecdotally, the, the growth of the library has led to interesting molecules. So um, we have this story on melatonin receptor where we got right out of the docking in actually sub-nanomolar molecules that, that we were eventually able to progress into efficacy studies um, with uh, Margarita Debokovic and Brian Roth's lab and um, Sigma-2 receptor, which I'll come back to, um, also got into, you know, potent, you know, low nanomolar molecules that advanced into, you know, pharmacology. And uh, um, the story on, uh, we have a big campaign for new analgesics. Um, so against the alpha-2A receptor that Alyssa Fink um, was a student who ran that project and um, against uh, serotonin 2A for depression and uh, molecules against the uh, serotonin transporter for abuse and um, COVID-19, that's we, you know, a big effort for many of us, and, um, and for um, homeostasis. And so against these targets, mostly uh, GPCR, some transporters, some ion channels, um, the, the large libraries have led to potent molecules um, that, uh, you know, with optimization are efficacious in, uh, in animals. Um, so, um, and I should say this, would, none of this would have been possible without um, fabulous collaborators who I'll, I'll try and mention as I go through as well. Okay, so um, I take it, I'll take you through one story where, which was driven around um, testing the method, you know, why should it work? And, and so um, Andy Cruz's lab, uh, Asafalon in Andy Cruz's lab had um, recently solved the structure, had just solved the structure at the time, this was just before the pandemic, of the Sigma-2 uh, uh, receptor, which is a sort of dark horse in pharmacology. Um, and uh, they wanted to come up with novel ligands for it, and we thought we could use it as a, a template for um, testing the method, so it was a good collaboration. And so uh, J.K. Liu, who's in the audience here, who was a postdoc in the lab, there he is at the back. Uh, and uh, he was a postdoc at the time, he's now gone on to found his own lab at uh, Rockefeller University, uh, screened uh, half a million compounds. Uh, that was sort of half a, half a billion compounds against uh, the structure of the receptor integral membrane receptor. It was just the size of the library as it was built out at the time. And uh, so each molecule was docked in thousands of conformations and thousands of, con of orientations in the binding site like we always do. And then we did something that unusual. Usually in structure-based screens in our lab, and really this is true I think everywhere, uh, we'll, we'll have, like we'll, we'll dock these large numbers of molecules and we'll test 50. Right? And, and they'll all be from the top, they're all high scoring molecules. This time we thought we would test many more so we'd get some statistical powering and we wouldn't only test the high scoring ones but we'd test the mediocre scoring ones and the bad scoring ones. And the question was would, there be, would we see a correlation uh, between docking score and the very first job of molecular docking which is to categorize molecules as likely or unlikely to bind. Would we see a correlation between docking score and hit rate? And um, so, uh, so anyways, we test. We had so when we test for each one of these 484 molecules uh, was synthesized de novo by enamine, and from from this large library, and um, and each one of them is a different chemotype. So there were no analogs in this. So each one was different scaffold basically, um, and th they were tested by uh, radio ligand displacement. I'm not going to show you. Here, I'll, uh, later on in the talk, I'll show you some dose response curves from this target, but the, the data were very good. Um, they were all SAF's data. He's now got his own lab at Yale. It's a very successful collaboration. <laughs> uh, uh, and just show you um, two of the molecules that came, came out. Um, they're both like low nanomolar. Uh, this guy, actually, I was, um, this molecule, uh, okay, uh, sorry, what I'm showing you is, um, here's the molecule, it came out of docking, and uh, here's, um, it's, 
predicted structure in yellow and it, the crystallographic result that Asaf subsequently determined um, in, in this sort of blue-green blue, blue -green color. And so this just says the, the docking was basically right. Um, and this is another one where Asaf solved the structure here. Uh, yellow is the dock, the, green, the blue is the crystallographic result. There's, there's more deviations, but it makes all the right interactions. And this is, by our standards, as good as we get. Um, and, but you can also see these two molecules are like, different scaffolds, and that was true of the set. Uh, anyways, the other thing uh, I saw in uh, this poster from the uh, Andres lab, that this molecule is now being used as a, as a, a probe for um, sigma-2 receptor. Uh, so that's a form of success, too. I was thrilled to see that. So thank you. Um, anyways, here's what, I, here's what I said I would told you, tell you about. This is, um, this is the correlation of docking score um, with hit rate. And so hit rate means here the um, number of molecules that are experimentally active divided by the number that were actually tested. So if we tested 100 and 25 were active, that'd be a 25% hit rate. Uh, and here, docking, the more negative the docking score is, um, the better. So, uh, so m m more negative is better. And so you can see that at these so just ignore this point for a second. Uh, as, the, um, as the docking score gets better, the hit rate improves. And uh, so up here, you know, you've got a hit rate of you know, close to 60%. And then as the docking score gets worse, the hit rate drops. The experimental hit rate drops uh, until it gets into this, you know, these are what we thought, from, right, without knowing what the results would be, we expected that this, this, these were bad docking scores. The fits didn't look great. Um, and here, the hit rate drops to zero. Um, and and at each, each little black dot is 30 compounds uh, pulled from this uh, range of scores in this region. Um, OK, so on one hand, that's this sort of correlation. It looks like a dose-response curve, right? That sort of correlation between experimental hit rate and docking score was, in some senses, far better than we expected. Um, but it, it's, um, it has some, there's some issues. One is we, we don't pretend even here, at least at this stage, to be able to rank order molecules. We're just saying likely to bind or not likely to bind. So the, the most potent compounds didn't always come from this top region. So that's, that's a problem. And then the second problem is, is it plateaus. And it plateaus, right, like in this region where you normally be picking compounds from. Uh, and, and if it was a really good scoring function, it would just keep, shouldn't, it shouldn't look like a dose response curve. It should just keep going up, right? And, and um, so that's speaking to issues with our, with our scoring. And, and, and it comes really, the reason it plateaus is it comes from this point here, which really pulls it down. Because you can sort of imagine, if you're feeling generous, that it would just sort of keep going up if we didn't have this point. And this point uh, reflects the emergence of artifacts that are molecules that score well because they cheat our scoring function. I'll come back to that. OK, so um, going back to the issue. So we've invested a huge amount. And anyways, the, like, it's, it's got problems, but this is amazing in some senses for us, right? So um, should we keep making the library bigger? Is bigger better? We invested a huge amount of effort in the last, I don't know, seven years building this library. And, um, and we th it seems like, like five billion's a lot. Maybe we should stop. Maybe, maybe five billion's enough. So um, we thought we'd ask the question, you know, how much are we get? Do we, as the library gets bigger and bigger and bigger, do things continue to improve? Hit rate, affinity of the molecules that are coming out. Or like, if they're plateauing, maybe we should stop. So um, we've asked this question both um, computationally and experimentally. So um, this is uh, this. So the, this paper came out just last year. Uh, I was going to say it's JK's last paper from the lab, but there's one more. <laughs> We're squeezing out of them. Um, but um, here's um, here's what uh, we the part of we that's JK did is um, for different receptors. He looked at how score changed as he docked larger and larger databases. So the database size is here on the, 
x-axis in log, so 100,000, a million, 10 million, so forth. And these are the docking energies. And just like in the last plot, the, the more negative is better. And you can see, this is for the dopamine receptor. So you can see as the docking, as the library gets bigger and bigger and bigger, for the tops, these are the top 5,000 scoring molecules in, in quartiles. And, and as the um, library gets bigger and bigger and bigger, the docking scores of the top molecules go, keep going down, and it's sort of log linear. There's this little jump here, which, you sh which I claim you should ignore, and just basically it's log linear, um, at no sign of plateau. And then this is, th we, we did this, um, the part of we, that's JK, did this early on when the library was small, and then the library grew, and it's, it, you know, it's, it stays log linear. Um, you can see this is the top scoring molecule here. So it's, these are the top 5,000. This is the very best one. And, um, and then he did the same thing for the serotonin 2A receptor with now bigger libraries. And same thing, log linear improvement in docking score as the library grows. And same thing for the sigma 2 receptor. And except you start to see this one molecule and, and probably the top few molecules start to deviate. Their scores become a lot better. What's happening there is we're getting these molecules that are cheating the scoring function. Okay. Okay. So what that says is the as the libraries grow, we're getting molecules that, according to the docking scoring function, fit better. But I've led you to believe, with good reason, that there's a lot of approximations in the docking scoring function. So how compelling is that? Maybe not so compelling. So how about experimentally? So this is um, work um, uh, led by um, Feng Yu Liu, a fabulous postdoc in the lab in collaboration with uh, Yorgos Kiniotis' lab, uh, uh, Chen Guo Wu, a uh, postdoc in his lab, who's also terrific. Um, and um, what uh, Feng, so this, uh, we, we were docking, we, this is a real project. We have um, CASR, um, calcium sensing receptor, as a, as a target. Um, and, but, but Feng Yu took the opportunity to ask a methods question, too. So she docked both a small library, this is really the size of the libraries we used to dock, 2.7 million molecule library and a 1.2 billion molecule library um, against the calcium sensing receptor. This is a family C uh, G protein coupled receptor. And, uh, and then she tested mo the top scoring molecules from each of them. Uh, and, um, and so here's what you, I've led you to believe should happen. So this is, this is from the two point, the, this sort of gray line is from the 2.7 million molecule screen and this 1.2 billion uh, screen is this scores. And this, so this is doc score and this is the number of molecules. Um, so as the, you get fewer and fewer molecules with higher and higher scores, that sort of makes sense. But, and, and, but the small screen plateaus around negative 45 and the, the bigger screen plateaus at larger numbers. But basically, it's the same thing as I showed you. As the libraries grow, you, start, you sample molecules that fit better according to the scoring function. But what about experiment? So um, here are, here's the hit rate. In green is the hit rate from the, the smaller screen. And um, it's, um, the hit rate, you know, it's okay. It's like 13% or something. But these are um, molecules that uh, have activities between 10 micromolar and 100 micromolar. And, and the, here's the, now here's the hit rate from the, the, the billion molecule screen. The hit rate's much, much bigger. But the other thing is, is that from the bigger screen, this, these, these are sort of weak binders. They're positive allosteric modulator, so there's reasons that they're weak. This is now the hit rate from molecules that are between one and 10 micromolar and between 100 nanomolar and one micromolar. And, and you, you don't see any green bars because we didn't get molecules with those potencies from the smaller screen. So the message so far from this experimental screen is the larger library leads to higher hit rates and, more, and population of more potent molecules. Okay, oh, and um, I should just say is, you know, more than a sanity check, we, um, we determined, the part of we that's Cheng Wo determined some cryo-EM structures of some of the docking hits um, against the um, uh, CASR. CASR is, um, is an obligate um, dimer, but both, but it's, it's not a symmetrical dimer. Each uh, binding site, each orthos, well, allosteric site is different. And, um, and the, the ligands actually, the same ligand that binds in the different monitors adopts different conformations. And that was predicted by the docking and, and, and corresponds to the um, cryo-EM results. So that was cool. 
Um, okay, so um, I'll take you through one more. Does this tell me how much time I've got? No? I've got plenty of time. Rock on. Okay, um, uh, okay so we, now we did the same thing. This is also um, Fung Yu's work. We did the same thing against uh, beta lactamase. Uh, where we docked a smaller library and a bigger, except the smaller library was a library that JK had docked, you know, uh, in, in the first large library paper, um, and he, he docked a uh, uh, hundred million molecules against beta lactamase and um, and tested 44 of them, and and Feng Yu uh, docked two billion and tested 1500, um, and uh, but I'm just going to compare hit rates so it's a fair comparison. Um, so Feng Yu, this is the same thing I've been showing you all along, but if you're like me, you have to see it three times. Uh, uh, so this is how, um, as the library size gets larger, the, the small library sizes are purple and the big library sizes is green. As the library size gets um, bigger and bigger, the, the scores shift to the left, right? If you look at the distribution of scores, they will shift to, to more and more negative values. This is what I've been showing you all along. As the library gets bigger, you've, the top scoring molecule, the scores, the fits of the best scoring molecules, which the molecules themselves are always changing, get better and better and better, just because you're sampling bigger chemical space and the docking program is able to select the better fitting molecules. Um, oops. Um, You'll notice um, that that for the at the like at, as, we, as we get into the billions, um, the scores like the scores look very. It's just like a shift left, shift left. The shape is the same, but for the very biggest libraries, you see these dog legs going out to these uh, re very high scores. Um, and th there's not very many molecules like this is a hundred molecules. So there's there's not very many molecules in this set, but they dominate the very top thin layer of the docking, and they're all artifacts. And um, which we've later shown by experiment. And, but Feng Yu brilliantly decided that she didn't trust any of them and she sort of drew a line where these distributions started to deviate and said, I'm stopping here. So her best scoring molecules are from the right of the line and she disregarded to the left of the line. Um, uh, she solved uh, crystal structures of um, some of her most potent molecules and uh, in, you know, there was as, uh, as ever some deviations but broadly they, they the docking prediction corresponded pretty well to the, uh, in this case, uh, X-ray crystallographic result. Okay, so here's what I said I would tell you about, um, which is how the hit rate and affinities um, change as you go, f as you increase the library si um, size 20-fold. So here I'm looking at hit rate in, in different tranches. This is better than one micromolar, better than 10 micromolar, better than 100 micromolar. And so in this, best range, you know, the basically 100 nanomolar to 1 micromolar range, the hit rate is pretty small, but it actually exists for the 2 billion molecule screen, and we didn't find any um, from the 100 million molecule screen. And um, same thing, at, at, at we start to populate from the smaller library the better than 10 micromolar, but there's not very many, and there's more from the, the from, as a percentage um, from the 2 billion screen, and, and same thing basically at every level. The, at every point, the hit rates are better for the larger library, the, the percentage of molecules that were active, and, and the affinities shift to the left to better affinities. Um, so um, here's a, this is um, a plot. It, it's, sort of, it's akin to what I showed you for sigma two, except, uh, well, yeah, it is. Uh, um, uh, th except we've divided it up into different affinity ranges. So this is molecule, the blue is molecules better than 150 micromolar, um, the red is 50 micromolar, the green is 1.5, and, and you can see that, like, the sort of interesting, so that the, there's a couple of interesting points here. One is um, there's no plateau. The, the, unlike what I showed you for sigma two, here where we, we cut off before we started testing what we thought and eventually found out were um, artifacts, um, here we didn't test any of them. And, here, and when you do that, none of the, these curves don't plateau. They, 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 all, they have different maximal hit rates, but there's no sign of them tipping over. Um, and, and we think that's because we cut the, the artifacts. 
Um, and then there's this other interesting thing, which, which I'll come back to, but th this, is, um, this is what happened. If you say, well, where do, the f where do they appear? Where do they start to appear? These blue guys, which are the weakest guys, start to appear at like minus whatever, 74 docking scores. And the, but, and the red guys, which are more stringent, only start to appear at better scores, and the green guys even later still. And it's, it's as though this is something we didn't expect to see, but it's as though that at least at a categorical level of different ranges of affinities, the, the, the docking score is actually starting to distinguish molecules in these classes. Um, and I think that why we're seeing that, something which we have never seen previously is Partly it's that we're testing over a big range of scores here. We're intentionally testing bad, bad scores as well as good scores. And also the scale uh, of testing is high enough to, to start to see this. Um, and then if we go back to, remember sigma two plateaued, um, but if we go back to sigma two and take out what we now realize are these molecules that are cheating the scoring function, uh, we see the same sort of trend, except the affinities are much better for sigma two. Okay, and so um, you can <laughs> plot that. Um, my, uh, my students and postdocs make fun of me for plotting, the, except the statistics guys, uh, for, for showing a graph like this, so you'll forgive me, I hope. But here, this is, um, what I'm plotting here is the negative log of the KI, the PKI. It says negative PKI, it should just be PKI. Uh, for, this is for beta-lactamase. And um, these are the molecules where we've measured an affinity for. These molecules, below the red line are too weak. They, they're, they're worse than 300 um, micromolar, and we don't know what their affinity is, so we just, uh, this is uh, Olivier Mayo's plot, and uh, a terrific postdoc in the lab. We just, we assign them random numbers between, you know, um, uh, a negative log Ki of, of zero and, and like two and a half. So they're spread out, and, and you know, you, be hard pressed to draw a line through this, but if you did, it would have like a really crappy R value. But one that's that's statistically significant, and the only reason I'm showing you this is that if then if you go to a higher level of theory, and this is work that we've done with Robert Abel's group at, uh, at Schrodinger, if you rescore these molecules um, using uh, um, absolute binding free energy perturbation, the R value is still not great, but it's much better. Um, and, and uh, what that, I think, starts to hint at is that if we were able to score these molecules, we've argued all along as docking as a categorizer, but it, what it suggests is that if we were able to score these at a higher level theory or just with better scores, we would start to see more signal. And what the more signal would buy us is better ability to differentiate and pick the, really, pick the winners, um, which is just super important. Um, how am, I, am I okay for time? Yeah? All right, one more story. Um, so, um, and that is um, uh, alpha fold for, for ligand discovery. So um, there's a lot of excitement about alpha fold, um, and uh, rightly so. Uh, it's had a huge impact. Jim showed some of it in his talk on um, modeling of, of the sort of things we're interested. But for predicting small molecule binding for ligand discovery, you know, drug discovery, um, there's been a huge amount of paper, like about 20 papers in the last 18 months that say, yeah, yeah, as good as it is, that it's AlphaFold's ability to get, to predict the detailed structure of the ligand binding site is flawed. And, um, and, and it's not perfect, and because of that, AlphaFold models do much less well than experimental structures at predicting how a ligand would bind or your ability to predict um, uh, new ligands, so they say. But, and, um, but it's all retrospective studies, actually. They're, they're all you know, retrospectively going back and saying, how well does the crystal structure do to predict the known ligand structure? Or how well does the crystal structure do to say, to be able to distinguish known ligands from decoy ligands this is something we do in docking a lot. Um, and um, and it's, it's sort of, the, there's the trap of the known there because the structures that they're using were all determined with the known ligands and so they're biased. So um, we thought we would try 
we were kind of thrilled, actually, that AlphaFold wasn't doing well for ligand discovery, because we thought, OK. Um, uh, but we thought, OK, well, well, we should test it prospectively. So um, the, we've tested it. The, the two systems we tested on Sigma-2, which I showed you before, and the, the serotonin 2A receptor. Um, Sigma-2 uh, was a good case because actually alpha, the AlphaFold prediction came out before um, uh, the, the uh, X-ray crystal structure was published, um, but but it did amazingly well at getting all the residues right. N not perfect. This is, I hope you can see, this is the RMSD of key ligand, uh, key binding site residues, and but most of them are below, you know, at or below one angstrom. Um, serotonin 2A was an, an, another case because um, although the fold is you know really right, there was more deviation in the binding site, especially these two residues here, this leucine. Uh, and, and, and this phenylalanine, which I'll come back to, um, deviated, the alpha fold prediction deviated from the cryo -EM structure from, from uh, Brian Roth's lab. So it was you know, mostly right, but important deviations. So we thought these were two sort of cases that, that, that we could do prospective screens on. Uh, there was a third category which, where the alpha fold models were, were really different, and we just didn't touch those. Um, OK. so. Um, we did the same, first thing we did is the same thing everybody else did, is we retrospectively asked how well um, the uh, alpha fold structure could capture known ligands um, compared to the experimental structure. And I'm just showing you this um, uh, ROC curve, basically, for um, the percentage of known ligands found on the y-axis and the, versus the number of decoys. And, and a perfect curve would like, look like that. Uh, and this is a very good curve for the experimental structure. And then we use the alpha fold structure for sigma 2. It's much worse. It's you know, right shifted and it's lower. That's it's sort of bad. And same thing for uh, serotonin 2A. And this is exactly what people have seen. Um, but it's retrospective. So here's the prospective case. We, we, took the, you know, so we took the alpha fold structure, no modifications. Uh, and I've already told you how the uh, experimental structure did. Um, and so we docked the same, about 500 million molecules against the alpha fold structure, um, tested 119 compounds, all synthesized de novo, and compared it to what we'd seen against the experimental structure. And basically, there was no difference. Uh, although the molecules were different, the identity, there was no overlap in the identity of the molecules. And the hits looked very different. Um, the hit rate was about the same. Um, the, Crystal structure docking led to um, better affinity molecules, but not by that much, actually. They were, like we got the very most potent molecule from either screen came from alpha fold. Um, so by our standards, uh, and to our great surprise, the alpha fold structure prospectively did just as good as the crystal structure. And oh, I, I promised you earlier on that I'd show you dose response curves. These are concentration response curves here. These are um, uh, ASAFs. This is a SAFS work. These are a radio ligand displacement. So the data, I think, are convincing. OK, now, then we did it for the um, serotonin 2A. And by this time, I think JK and I were kind of believers. Roth, Brian Roth, was not. He thought it would fall on its face, um, but it didn't. Um, th this, we, this is the, here we uh, docked uh, over a billion molecules, tested hundreds. And the hit rate was basically the same for both the alpha fold model of the serotonin 2A, despite those deviations, and, and, and based on the experimental structure. And actually, the um, selectivities and agonist efficacies were better for the ligands coming out of the alpha fold model. So just, um, OK, just believe me. I'm not going to go through this graph because I'm worried about time. So just believe me. We actually got more selective molecules, more biased molecules, and argue, I think more potent molecules. Uh, out of the alpha fold uh, model than the cryo EM structure. Um, so uh, then um, uh, 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 Brian's lab and, and especially Yorgo Skiniotis's lab um, determined the structure of um, the, one of the new selective molecules against serotonin 2A, this very hot antidepressant target. And so I, what I'm showing you here is the um, in blue is the cryo-EM result, the experimental result of one of these novel ligands. And in, um, in green, the, the predicted structure from the alpha fold. And um, 
and they correspond pretty well. And, and intriguingly, the, the leucine that I said, man, look at this leucine's out of position. In the, in the cryo-EM result, with the new doc structure, that leucine adopts a conformation closer to the alpha fold structure than to the original cryo-EM structure. Okay. All right, so I see I'm just about out of time, but um, so this is um, what I'd like to leave you with. Uh, uh, accessible, uh, chemical space is exploding. This is, these are molecules you can get in six weeks at a very reasonable price. And, uh, you know, right now we're at, I don't know, uh, 40 billion, but we expect it to get into the trillions pretty soon. Uh, meanwhile, what we're able to dock right now is about where the library was three years ago. And what I think we can ever expect to dock by brute force, which is what we're doing right now, is not that much bigger, actually, maybe 20 billion if we push it. Um, so we have enormous challenges. Um, we, what I've shown you is that everything we've, we can see experimentally and theoretically teaches that as the libraries grow bigger, we get better results because we're, we're sampling um, ever wider diversity of chemotypes, and for all of its problems, the, the docking programs, not just ours, others, are able to capture um, uh, more better fitting molecules. Um, but the problem is, is how do we get to 10 trillion? We can't do brute force. Um, I, the results I've shown support something that the field has believed for years, but has struggled with is, if we can improve the scoring, we'll get ever better results. And so that it, it motivates us to reinvest in that. Um, improving optimization, we, like, if you look below the hood, which I haven't shown you, how good we are at optimizing hits with, once we get them, it's a pretty mis we succeed, but it, it, it's pretty miserable. The, the, our, abil our ability to predict new analogs, we just throw a lot of analogs at it. Um, and it works, but it's, it's sort of demoralizing. And, and PK is a huge problem. So um, these are huge problems that I don't know how to solve, um, but I think they're the right problems to have. It's a super exciting time in the field. Thanks very much. Thank you so much for this uh, brilliant lecture. And we have uh, time for maybe one question. One single. Uh, thanks for the talk. Um, you'd mentioned you'd mentioned as you tested more, um, you had you had a lot of these molecules that were scoring really high, and they were like quote unquote cheating the um, scoring function. Is there like a is there kind of a sub motif that kind of led to a higher like an artificially higher score for certain molecules for some of those like really big sets? They, they like for any given target, you can see like chemotypes that cheat the scoring function, but they change target by target. So the trick is to recognize that they're cheating molecules, but, and, and that can be done. I didn't go into that, but as we've gone along, we start to realize, oh, this is how you get rid of those guys. Yeah. So very quickly, one more. Yeah, Brian, I wonder if you can do kind of real-time docking. By that, I mean you screen the first million, you look for the best hits, and then you essentially do SAR on the best ones. So yeah. you don't screen then everything. You focus in on chemotypes and, and dive deeply on those. Yeah, so that's, one of, that's our way of getting to trillions, actually. That's one of the ways we're exploring. So we're, we dock a small library and then look into the larger library and pick basic similar molecules and then keep going. And, you know, build those molecules, dock them, keep going. And we, it's basically a depth first search, but it will get us to trillions and in, these, this is fresh off the press, and we've, Olivier has shown that we can capture almost all of the good hits from brute force by doing that. So, very insightful question. Right, so thank you very much, and let's thank the speaker again.
All right. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Professor Christina Wu. She is the Morris Kahn Associate Professor in the Department of Chemistry and Chemical Biology at Harvard University with affiliations at the Broad Institute as well. We're really excited to have her here today and to share with us some of her work um, that's been pioneering in our understanding of post-translational modifications. Welcome. Thank you. All right, thank you so much for the introduction to Wanha and the uh, organizers for inviting me to participate in this symposium. It's been a really fantastic day of learning about the uh, different areas of drug discovery and contributions. And I hope to share with you a little bit about how we're thinking about being able to do that through manipulating protein modifications in our group. Um, all right, so in my lab, we're very interested in understanding a form of chemistry that nature uses, which is called post-translational modifications. These kinds of protein modifications can inhibit or enhance or impart new functions to our proteome. And nature uses these kinds of molecular events to really dictate the many functions of our proteins. So in my group, we use the tools of chemistry, protein engineering, and proteomics to first take a deep look at how these protein modifications are functioning on, and what their physiological function is in the context of cells, but then use that information to identify ways that we can mimic this with small molecules. We also have uh, picked up on a few different classes of molecules that can regulate protein-protein interactions with an eye towards understanding what the uh, minimal phenotypes are on how to get these compounds to be uh, new classes of protein-protein interaction modulators, but also use those molecules as ligands to investigate endogenous regulatory events in biology. And so of the hundreds and perhaps thousands of different protein modifications that our cells use, my group studies just a few of these um, with a primary focus on a class of protein modifications called nutrient sensing oglicnac modifications, sugar-based modifications. And a second um, area in our lab is focused on an underappreciated protein modification called the C-terminal cyclic imid. So we have uh, collectively in these areas developed tools to be able to understand the functions of these post-translational modifications on their target proteins, but also ways to manipulate them on induced substrates. And for the talk today, I'm really going to just focus in on one area of our work in the terms of um, and update you on our investigations of the C-terminal cyclic gamut digron. So this area of our program was inspired by a class of molecules um, that really were initiated by thalidomide and more recent analogs like lenalidomide and pomalidomide, amongst their many derivatives, which have influenced medicine multiple times over. Thalidomide itself was first developed in a post-World War II era, and this ligand um, was uh, initially used as a sleeping agent and to alleviate morning sickness. And it was through this latter use, it was discovered that these compounds really promote horrific off birth defects to the fetus, and was one of the most horrific um, medical disasters in our collective medical history. However, thalidomide was continued to be used in end-of-life care, and it was through this continued use that it was subsequently discovered, now several decades later, that thalidomide has um, potent and exquisite anti-inflammatory properties, and indeed curative effects for certain forms of blood cancer. And now, in, uh, in 2022, at least a few years ago, these compounds were um, some of the uh, top best-selling small molecule drugs for their ability to uh, cure these forms of blood cancer and have driven uh, new waves of therapeutic uh, innovation in the pharmaceutical industry as well as in, the indus in academia. So this question of how does thalidomide and its derivatives have so many biological activities has fascinated many scientists, myself included. And while these compounds have been attributed to multiple targets, it was really through their discovery that, they, that thalidomide and lenalidomide interact with an E3 ligase substrate adapter called cerebron that started to make molecular connections to specific substrates and um, targets, and ultimately the outcomes in, in terms of pathways. And so this finding from Ido Hanna and coworkers really showed that these molecules can influence, um, their can influence this E3 ligase called cerebron. And E3 ligases more broadly are involved in protein degradation 
And what's amazing about these compounds is that when they interface with cerebellum, they don't just inhibit its function, they actually induce new substrates to be recruited into proximity with cerebellum. And it's through this induced substrate um, recruitment it can um, promote the transfer of ubiquitin to the substrate, and the ubiquitin elution ultimately promotes proteasomal degradation. So these discoveries, both in terms of the identification of these molecules interfacing with cerebellum, as well as the induced substrates that are recruited, have paved the way for connecting how one molecule can promote either life-saving therapeutic outcomes, but also horrific off target effects. So before I dive into the talk further, I just wanted to um, introduce you to the E3 ligases and the proteasome, um, ubiquitin proteasome system. So E3 ligases, we in humans have about 600 of these. They are complexes that when assembled, um, uh, come together to remove and select substrates that are selected for removal. These substrates typically are recognized through a chemical mark that's termed a digron in the field. The chemical marks that are recognized by different substrate adapters then recruit those substrates into proximity for ubiquitin and protein degradation. And what the identity of these different chemical marks, or the digrons are, has been a major um, facet of study in the E3 ligase um, community. So these kinds of digrons are now known to be various types of chemistries that are marking our proteins for removal. These types of marks can be specific small molecules, like this molecule here, auxin, which is a small molecule that promotes um, the oxia factor to be degraded and is what causes plants to grow towards the sun. Another kind of chemical mark is one that we're all using here right now, which is um, an oxygen sensor that is a chemical post-translation modification found on proline. And upon installation of this uh, oxidation on proline, it causes the HIF-1-alpha transcription factor to be recruited to VHL, uh, the E3 ligase, for degradation but uh, under normoxia, but under hypoxia, the VHL, uh, uh, VHL will no longer recognize this chemical degron, causing HIF1-alpha to promote angiogenesis in our cells as they seek oxygen um, uh, uh, in, in vivo. And several studies have really identified a number of chemical marks that are just found on the NNC termini of our proteins that are recognized by their cognizant substrate adapters. So in addition to these kinds of studies, understanding the types of chemistries that E3 ligases are recognizing as their digrons, the E3 ligases have also been, uh, become extremely uh, attractive therapeutic targets um, for the field of targeted protein degradation. And so what's amazing about these compounds, thalidomide and lenalidomide and their derivatives, is that they interface with cerebellum to recruit and do substrates directly in a kind of molecular glue type of activity. But you can also take these compounds and link them up to other molecules and recruit your target protein of interest. And so here in this example, a DBAT6, thalidomide um, analog has been recruited to a molecule called JQ1, or linked to a molecule called JQ1, which can recruit a target protein, BRD4, for degradation. So although cerebellum is now recognized as this major therapeutic target of these molecules, like thalidomide and its derivatives, how cerebellum recognizes its endogenous substrates was a mystery. Cerebellum itself was actually first discovered for its genetic association with neurological development. And it turns out that specific point mutations right here in this deep little mind minding domain are associated with intellectual disability and seizures in humans. Given the conservation of cerebellum um, across uh, evolution and conservation of the thalidomide binding domain even further back, this implies that this domain might be recognizing a specific uh, event that's important for biology. And so as we thought about what kinds of chemical uh, events could cerebellum be naturally recognizing, what could that degron be? We started to think about uh, biological models that very much uh, mirrored how thalidomide can recruit and induce substrates. We thought maybe a metabolite could be interfacing with cerebellum to recruit a natural substrate um, as a metabolite sensor. Alternatively, we also thought about protein modifications being recognized on, uh, by cerebellum as a degron on these natural substrates. And so given that degrons are these, can be these very specific chemical marks, we thought, let's take a close look at the structural underpinning of how thalidomide interfaces with the thalidomide binding domain. And so here, looking at one of the structures from the Toma lab, what we see is that thalidomide 
shown here in red, interfaces with the thalidomide binding domain, shown here in purple, through a three hydrogen bonding event that utilizes this glutaramide functional group. This three hydrogen bonding event, if you look at it for too long as I have, it starts to look like a Watson Crick Franklin base pair. And that caused us and others in the field to start to hypothesize that maybe uh, cerebron is recognizing metabolites that are derived from uracil and its derivatives to recruit um, natural substrates based on a nutrient sensing mechanism. We also hypothesized that perhaps cerebellon is recognizing a protein modification called the C-terminal cyclic imid, even though there was very limited evidence for this form of protein modification in the human proteome. So we became, in my group, we became enamored with really taking a deep look into understanding how is cerebellon executing its um, physiological function and en route to uh, uh, really um, uh, investigating this further in our efforts to identify this degron for cerebellum, we really benefited from two key chemical insights. One of these chemical insights came from our early work where we were very invested in developing cerebellum ligands with the goal of understanding their molecular mechanisms. In some of our initial work, we began to develop photo affinity labeling versions of, uh, of, of thalidomide, such as this photolenolidomide analog here which enabled us to discover that uh, these types of cerebellum ligands can recruit target proteins like EIO3I for induced target sequestration, indicating and revealing that these types of molecules can recruit substrates that may or may not be degraded. And uh, this work was carried out by Zilin uh, and Dr. Yukomako, um, and uh, we heard, uh, she, she gained her training wheels on this work here, and we heard about her more recent work uh, in the Wells Lab earlier today. In addition to um, efforts to study the mechanisms of these molecules, we also uh, initiated work in collaboration with the uh, CARIS lab with Dr. Sumi Park, executed in our group by David Miyamoto and Nicole Kernett to really discover and understand how we can dial in and out different substrates that are recognized and removed by these ligands, resulting in molecules like Dyke 77 here, a potent tool compound to degrade target proteins like IKZF2 or CK1 alpha. And upon removal of these target proteins in the context of acute myeloid leukemia and other cancers, um, we can cause the promotion of differentiation and apoptosis mechanisms through P53-dependent apoptosis. These compounds and their derivatives are now being used by us and others to measure biological effects and identify biomarkers for um, how to identify uh, cancers that are um, sensitive to this type of therapy. Through this work, we both learned how to study and um, handle chemical ligands for cerebellum, but we also realized that in route to our efforts to discover Dagron for cerebellum and the endogenous substrates that it's carrying was the realization that all of our chemical efforts really led us to start from a, a biological source. And that was that all of these cerebellum ligands are derived from an amino acid precursor called glutamine. And so in the vast majority of, of, of efforts that derive cerebellum ligands, um, the uh, precursor molecules are glutamine amino acid, shown here, which is essentially dehydrated to a thalidomide derivative. And if you go back and you take a deeper look at what Kami Grunenthal, the pharmaceutical company that first uh, uh, delivered thalidomide to the uh, public, what they were trying to do, they were trying to develop um, analogs for barbiturates or, or uh, safer versions of, um, bar for barbiturates, which was the uh, choice sleeping agent at the time. And they were essentially making or trying to make peptidomimetics that would um, uh, be safer. And, and so they were heating up different amino acid mixtures and solutions and getting out molecules like thalidomide, testing them for activity or lack thereof. And this is how um, the thalidomide uh, uh, reached the clinic in the first case. So this observation that thalidomide der is derived from glutamine um, amino acids really led us to focus our subsequent efforts and investigations on glutamine or asparagine protein modifications. So that was our first chemical insight. The second chemical insight came when we realized that our efforts to functionally connect these chemical models to these biological, or chemical hypotheses, I should say, to these biological models could be made more efficient by capitalizing on studies and um, work in the field of targeted protein degradation. And that would give us a functional readout in cells. 
And so, as I mentioned earlier, molecules like DBAT6 that combine thalidomide and recruit you to recruit cerebellum to a target protein of interest, um, such as the recruitment of JK1 to BRD4, um, would allow us to monitor for protein degradation of a known target protein in a co cellular context. And so using this approach, and uh, we thought that we could take thalidomide and substitute it for some of our chemical hypotheses and thus give us a cellular readout. So using this approach, uh, Dr. Saki Jikawa, together with Hope Flaxman and Wen Ching Zhu, started to iterate through uh, different hypotheses that we had until we landed on and found that we could substitute thalidomide with a peptide. This dipeptide has at the C-terminus of the um, uh, substitution, a C-terminal cyclic image, again, that protein modification that can either come from an asparagine or glutamine amino acid. And at the N minus one position, we initially installed a phenylalanine amino acid, but subsequently investigated all of the different um, uh, 20, natural 20 amino acids. And when we did this, we found that we could substitute thalidomide with these dipeptides, and then it would result in a cerebral independent degradation of the target protein BRD4 in a way that would phenocopy the parent molecule DBET6. So these two chemical insights enabled us to generate this model where we hypothesize that susceptible asparagine or glutamine amino acids would go through some kind of cyclization chemistry, resulting in this C-terminal cyclic image, which would be the digron recognized by cerebellum on the substrates for um, binding, ubiquitination, and proteosomal degradation. This model also implied to us that these types of C-terminal cyclic images, which had not been previously well annotated in the human proteome, are more prevalent than previously assumed. So since coming up with this model, we've been very much dedicated and focused on studying and understanding both the non-enzymatic and enzymatic sources of these post-translational modifications. We've hypothesized that these types of protein modifications could come from forms of protein damage, could come from RNA hydrolysis in a non-enzymatic form or an enzymatic form, um, it could come from enzyme-promoted cyclization, or could occur C um, either internally to the protein or C-terminally. Um, on uh, proteins bearing C-terminal asparagine or glutamine amino acids. As we've begun to characterize these forms of, uh, or sources of protein uh, modifications, our long-term goal is really to understand better how the substrates bearing these modifications interface with cerebellum, both um, in terms of and, and the consequences of their removal as well as other pathways that are affected. We hope to connect these substrates to pathways and um, phenotypes in different types of cells, which we anticipate will have implications for how these molecules are used in the clinic, and of preliminary evidence for the fact that these protein modifications may also interface beyond cerebellum um, and exist in other forms, uh, now that we know to look for them. So the, for the rest of the talk today, I wanted to share with you and update you where we are on this, um, di uh, on this uh, roadmap um, here in terms of understanding the protein damage model. And so the protein damage model is one that we were immediately attracted to. Um, and in, in this model, what we um, hypothesize might be happening is that these protein modifications, these digrons that are occurring on substrates for cerebellum, might be coming from a form of protein damage where a side chain asparagine or glutamine amino acid will attack the protein backbone, causing a cleavage event. This type of protein damage was an attractive hypothesis for two reasons. The first was that cerebellum is genetically associated with intellectual disability and seizures in humans, and particularly, again, those point mutations in the thalidomide binding domain. And many uh, protein aging disorders are associated with neurological impairment. The second um, connection that drove us to um, really start to investigate this protein damage model in more detail was another form of protein damage called spontaneous deamidation. This type of chemistry has very similar chemical and biological hallmarks. The chemical hallmarks are that spontaneous deamidation also occurs on asparagine and sometimes glutamine residues. And this chemistry is simply an inversion of the chemistry we were proposing to form the cyclic imid. In this chemistry, the black bone uh, amide attacks the side chain amide, resulting in an internal cyclic imid, which is then rapidly hydrolyzed. When water adds in, it can add into one of these two carbonyls, either giving us an aspartate or isoaspartate post-translational modification. And it turns out that this isoaspartate post-translational modification is highly deleterious to our proteins. And we all require an enzyme called protein isospartyl methyltransferase, which is a SAM-dependent enzyme that methylates this side chain isospartate um, 
to promote it to recyclize into an internal cyclic emitting intermediate so that over time it can disproportionate to the aspartate. This uh, protein um, damage modification, or, or excuse me, enzyme, the PIMT enzyme, like Cerebon, is also associated, or its loss is um, associated with uh, uh, effects in the brain, um, and those effects are more severe for loss of PIMT as it results in epileptic seizures and premature death in vivo. And so to show that these types of protein modifications, the C-terminal cyclic image, is an overlooked form of protein damage, we first took a deep investigation of global proteomics data sets, found that these types of protein modifications are found across different tissue types um, from human samples and from tissue culture cells. And we then verified that many of these modifications were incur indeed occurring in vitro and in cells. We then, um, uh, we then aimed to investigate, um, I can't tell if you can see the blue coloring here. We then aimed to investigate that when it, these modifications are formed on substrates, that cerebellum will recognize them and degrade them. To do this in initial work, we used a protein engineering approach where we took GFP and we sort tagged out um, the C terminus of the protein to display one of these protein modifications. So the X group would equal one of the um, C terminal cyclic imids or some kind of um, control. And now when we take these proteins and we introduce them into cells, we can see that they are rapidly um, downregulated. But when lenalidomide is co-introduced, that um, blocks and prevents the degradation, implying that uh, the presence of this modification is being outcompeted through the thalidomide binding domain by lenalidomide, both for the six-membered and five-membered residues. And when these modifications, um, and, and when uh, lenalidomide is treated into cells, we see a broad increase in these modifications, indicating their response to cerebral and loss or inhibition. These data show that cerebellum recognizes and removes this c terminal cyclic image that arises from protein damage. Since, um, since making this uh, uh, finding, we've now really taken a deep look into both the intrinsic and extrinsic factors that go into the formation of this modification as a form of protein damage. So Wenching has taken a deep look into the various um, First, taking a computational purview of uh, where these protein modifications are occurring, we can tell from um, uh, aligning the consensus sequence around the uh, sparagene site that tends to form these modifications by global proteomics data sets that there seems to be a slight consensus sequence coming out and that this implies that certain parts of our proteome are more susceptible to this form of protein damage. When we took a deeper look at those uh, sequences, we realized we weren't looking at just one consensus sequence. We were actually looking at um, two clusters of consensus sequences, one that involved a, um, a glutamate at the plus one position and another that involves a hydrophobic amino acid at the plus one position and a lysine at the plus two position. When we um, compute using AlphaFold, and we've heard a few talks, uh, including uh, uh, Brian's talk just before, about the importance of, of and, and the abilities of, the, of uh, what we can do now with AlphaFold using both the um, PDB structures and AlphaFold structures, we were able to show that the surface exposure of this sparagene seems to actually be important for whether or not um, these modifications will form. And um, if we take a random select selection of um, Asparagine sites, as compared to deamidation, common deamidation sites, these tend to be more solvent exposed, where the, um, whereas the, uh, the, the cleavage sites tend to be a little bit more um, or less solvent exposed. Um, I think more importantly, uh, what we see is that um, these residues have, that, uh, in terms of the cleavage event, um, these residues have, happen to have a smaller distance between the asparagine amide nitrogen and the backbone carbonyl, indicating that the um, uh, let me show you pictorially, indicating that the, uh, uh, the um, lone pair amide um, to the uh, carbonyl on the backbone, and, and, and these two examples on common um, uh, modification sites that we see, um, is positioned in the right way to predispose these uh, types of residues for um, the uh, lone pair to pi star um, interaction, resulting in a cleavage event. Wen Cheng uh, has then taken these insights and these consensus sequence and actually experimentally derived them um, and shown that indeed uh, as a function of the NEX um, uh, consensus sequence and the NXK consensus sequence, we can see um, a fairly significant formation of these modifications across different peptides um, depending on this specific amino acid sequence. 
In addition to this peptide library, she's also taking a look at it in the context of some of the frequent peptides that we see in global proteomics data sets, both on the peptide and protein level. She's been able to calculate a half-life of formation across these peptides, allowing us to derive an approximately 1,000-day half-life for protein modifications across, uh, for, for this form of protein damage across the different um, asparagine sites that, we've, that, that she studied. Importantly, when these modifications form, they will bind to cerebellum. And so if we take a look at some of these peptides, both the ones that are in model peptides, but other peptides that come directly from these forms of protein damage, um, we can see that these um, peptides are um, uh, in the tens to hundreds of um, nanomolar binders um, using this tr fret displacement assay as a readout. And excitingly, um, by taking a look at how these modifications form as forms of protein stress, either an under oxidative stress, heat stress, or pH elevation, one thing is started to see that specific um, sites are coming out, and um, we're investigating these further for function. But now placing the um, understanding of this C-terminal cyclic image in the context of other forms of protein damage, including the deamidation form of protein damage, but others um, also in uh, uh, under investigation in the field, including dehydroalanine, pyroglutamate, or C thermocyclic anhydride. <clears throat> Taking a look at these forms of protein damage, um, not just in terms of how fast they occur, but particularly focusing in on what happens when their regulatory proteins are lost. We see collectively that when the regulatory proteins are lost, this is associated with phenotypes associated with the brain, including intellectual disability, seizures, and other effects. By contrast, loss of regulatory proteins associated with DNA tends to result in um, loss of uh, phenotypes or, or results in phenotypes associated with cancer, leading us to hypothesize that perhaps um, this protein damage response pathway might parallel DNA damage response pathways in our cells, and that um, perhaps uh, as we investigate the uh, protein damage modification, the c cyclic emit, and connect it to cerebellum further, that perhaps um, we may be able to identify downstream transducers, effectors, that are resulting in an overall cellular response through these protein damage events analogous to DNA damage response. So as we've begun to um, really, I think, go through these various models of where these protein modifications are coming from, we've really realized that we need to develop new tools and uh, methods to investigate this further, um, both in terms of chemical proteomics skill, uh, tools, chemical tools, as well as protein engineering tools and investigation of cerebellum as a protein as, at large. We hope that um, these types of uh, further investigations will be useful for both understanding how these substrates interface with cerebellum, but also how cerebellum can be therapeutically engaged. And in the remaining time, I wanted to just highlight um, and uh, update you on um, how the chemical tools that we've been using have enabled both discoveries of, um, of how uh, uh, cerebellum's endogenous substrates are being recognized, but also um, enabled, I hope, new concepts for the field of targeted protein degradation. Okay, so um, one of the first uh, concepts that, uh, w that we um, really sat and thought about uh, at length was the fact that this cyclic imid ring between thalidomide and our peptide, now, that, now termed a cyclamid, referring to um, these ligands as new boreheads for the cerebellum um, bind thalidomide binding pocket, um, was whether or not and why not um, the five-membered versus six-membered ring um, in thalidomide um, would function better or worse than the five-membered versus six-membered ring in, this, in these um, peptide ligands. And this was important for, first, um, there's much more evidence biologically for a asparagine ring to form um, than a, a cyclic um, aspartamide to form as compared to a cyclic glutaramide. But the thalidomide ligands in other studies had shown that going from a six-membered to a five-membered ring in thalidomide was really bad for the uh, biological effects. To study this, we teamed up with Ralph Mazachek and Connor Payne over at MGH to use their quantitative TR FRET platform um, that combines their core floor technology, the uh, terbium um, ligand, which is uh, installed var variously on um, either your protein 
um, uh, as shown here, and uh, developed this uh, core floor, or used this core floor technology um, to produce a FRET signal with the thalidomide FITSI tracer. Now as we titrate in our cerebellum ligands, we can compete this off and de derive both an IC50 but also a dissociation constant. And looking first at how DBAT6 compared to between the six-membered ring to the five-membered ring compares, we see a loss of two orders of magnitude of binding. Whereas by contrast, going from the six-membered FCQ from glutamine to the five-membered FCN from asparagine, we see an enhancement in the binding. This um, enhancement in binding corresponds with observed activity from both molecules, whereas the DBAT6 molecule is active, but DBAT6 um, with the five-membered ring is inactive in terms of the ultimate degradation event. This extends also from um, pomalidomide on its own to the pomalidomide with a five-membered ring, and so again, we see a st stark loss in the um, negative log KD, so the lower down on this graph, the worse binder, the higher up, the better binder. Pomalidomide is a fairly uh, tight binder in terms of its um, uh, KD, but the five-membered ring is, has lost that activity. By contrast with um, just the dipeptides alone, we can see quite a few of them are indeed binding to cerebellum. Interestingly, some of the better binders are these five-membered rings. That corresponds now to the full library of uh, protac molecules or bifunctional molecules, where we see, broadly speaking, that all of these molecules can bind to cerebellum, and so they all produce a uh, negative log KD between one micromolar to eight nanomolar. Although the um, negative log KD is occurring over this window of space, we think that this is all biologically relevant, implying that the minimal recognition of these ligands is through the C-terminal cyclic imid, and that cerebellum recognizes a broad range of amino acids at this minus one position. But the second um, infer insight that we could gain from these data is that, by and large, the five-membered rings tended to bind better than the six-membered rings, in line with our previous observations, but in contrast to how the thalidomide ligands behave. This corresponds also to the eventual protein degradation profile that we see, where at 100 nanomolar with the five-membered rings, we see that, by and large, the hydrophobic amino acids at this N-1 position, um, at, or this X position, um, are, are more active at this concentration, whereas at the 100 nanomolar concentration, concentration of the five-membered ring library, we see a push to the right in the degradation potency. Okay, so this is the binary complex where these molecules interface with cerebellum, and that seems to correlate with the uh, ultimate degradation potency. But if you work in this field, you know that um, the actual degradation really comes from how these molecules recruit their ternary complexes. I think Alex did a really nice job earlier telling us about how much effort is put into developing these ligands so that they are um, put integrators. And all of that effort really comes down to developing molecules that can recruit the target protein in a way that is cooperative or has a positive alpha factor. What this means is that if the alpha factor is positive, it means that the ternary complex that's produced is more thermodynamically stable um, than uh, if the alpha factor is negative, indicating that the ternary complex that's formed is more thermodynamically unstable. And so we started to investigate systematically, now using this tr fret platform, measuring for the ability to form the ternary complex with cerebellum with target proteins like BRD4, measuring now the um, uh, alpha factor um, for the five-membered rings on this, uh, on this um, arm and on the y-axis, the alpha factor for the six-membered rings. What was exciting to us was the finding that, by and large, these nonpolar hydrophobic amino acids, shown in blue, tended to produce a positive alpha factor on the BD1 domain of BRD4. BRD4 has two different bromo domains, of which one of those is BD1 domain. We can see some of them have a positive alpha factor, whereas DBET6 is a negative um, alpha factor, implying that some of our ligands, but not all of them, can produce this positive alpha uh, ternary complex. This corresponds, if we just look at um, some of the best ligands to some of the worst um, in terms of the alpha factor uh, uh, corresponds with an 80-fold uh, difference in the types of cooperativities or ternary complexes that we can tune. And I think, interestingly, by comparison or contrast with the BD2 domain, we see that, um, we don't, uh, we, we see that all, overall there's a negative alpha factor across these ligands. But now zooming out, um, what we care about ultimately is how these ligands interface with cerebellum to form that ternary complex, resulting in proteosomal degradation. And um, 
to measure this, we turn to the uh, tier fret platform um, from Connor and Ralph to actually measure the BRD4 um, overall levels directly from cells now in this breast cancer cell line. So after titrating and identifying the exact um, uh, IC50 values for um, these compounds and their ability uh, and, and their ability to uh, modulate the levels of BRD4 directly from cells. We corresponded, we correlated that first to the binary complex that we were measuring, and we see a weak correlation generally positive, but more importantly, when we correlate that to the ternary complex, we see a very strong correlation between a um, tighter ternary complex dissociation constant with the ultimate degradation event. This goes beyond degraders for BRD4 to ligands that um, can target other target proteins like FKBP, where we see again um, now with a, a smaller subset of, of ligands, um, a uh, log KD that across these different compounds indicating tunability, but also um, when we measure the actual levels of the protein, again a correlation between the ternary complex and the ultimate degradation event. Um, and I just like this slide here, uh, showing again a third example now for a different um, target protein now, the CDK4 or 6 target proteins. The parent molecule, DCDK1, um, developed by Cray and coworkers, um, can degrade both CDK4 and CDK6. I just love this example because the six-membered ring, the PQC, uh, proline with a cyclic glutamine, um, has a selective potency for the CDK6, but does not affect CDK4, um, whereas the five-membered ring, again, plus or minus one carbon, now we can affect both target proteins. Um, so uh, all of this work has uh, inspired us, both in terms of the biological insights, but also giving us new ideas for how we can ser uh, selectively modulate the warheads and the types of ternary complexes that can come out of these types of ligands. And I think um, many of the other uh, efforts in the field of targeted protein de degradation have really capitalized on E3 ligases and their degrons, including the parent uh, or initial molecules of the Cruz lab uh, uh, and, and Shuli lab uh, on, on VHL ligands. And now more recent efforts have capitalized on other degrons um, for other E3 ligases and utilize them um, for targeted protein degradation approaches. So all of this work has really opened our eyes to the existence of other forms of protein chemistry that may be interfacing with biology, and that these tools that we're developing to study the cerebellum digeron may enable us to study these forms of protein chemistry in the future. So in summary, I've shared with you today how our investigations of molecules like thalidomide, small molecule that engages cerebellum to promote um, and do substrates for targeted protein degradation, has enabled the discovery of new protein motifs used in our cells for substrate recognition um, endogenously. And in the long term, as we understand more about other digrons um, recognized by our cells, we hope that this will catalyze new opportunities in basic biology, but also therapeutic innovation. Um, finally, I'd like to uh, thank my whole lab. Um, I've tried to highlight the key players uh, along the way, um, including Saki Ichikawa, who's now at um, Cornell in her independent position, Hope Flaxman, who's at um, C4 Therapeutics, Wen Ching Zhu, who's still in my group for at least a little bit, um, and, uh, and, and others who have contributed along, uh, on this slide. Um, these sources of funding and all of you for your attention. I'm happy to take questions if there's time. Thanks. All right, I think we have time for one question. Please, in the back. Thank you, that was really provocative. And I was just wondering about the consensus sequence, the minimum decron, and when you mine the uh, genome, how often do you see them? Do you see them on endogenous cerebellum substrates? And could you use that to identify new substrate that were undetected before? Yeah, a great question. So we've mostly looked at this in the form of which proteins are forming the, or we've mostly looked at this in terms of which proteins have been annotated to have the cerebral and digeron, um, mostly from proteomics data sets. We've then um, now analyzed that from a computational standpoint, as I showed here. What we need to do next is go back to your question and say, which sites are now, like, would we predict to form and do they form? Um, 
And I, I should say, of the ones that we've studied, we tend to see them um, pan out, but we need to kind of go see if we can now use this uh, information um, as more, in a more predictive sense. So hope to answer your question more thoroughly in the future. All right, I think that concludes this part of the program. We're gonna have a coffee break. Oh, no, yes. Yes, I'm getting a nod. I think we have a coffee break. So thank you to all the speakers.
Uh-huh. Yep, let's wait just a couple more minutes. How <laughs> Right, so let's uh, start. Uh, our next speaker is uh, my colleague uh, Yuri Polikanov, and Yuri is a structural biologist, and he's interested in bacterial ribosomes in both structural and functional aspects, especially uh, you know in the uh, mechanistic aspects of protein synthesis and also interaction with uh, you know ribosome binding uh, antibiotic natural products, as well as a mechanism of resistance to these antibiotics. All right, well, thank you. Can you hear me well in the back? Yeah. Good, super. Um, well, thank you very much for the introduction, Alex. And I also would like to uh, take this opportunity and thank the organizers for inviting me to give, this, uh, to give a talk at this uh, symposium. So, uh, yes, as Alex just mentioned, I mean, the lab is my, uh, the research in my lab, I mean, is revolving around the structure and function of the bacterial ribosome. Um, so we determine high resolution structures of bacterial ribosome in complex with, for example, natural ligands such as tRNA molecules, uh, in, in complex with various translation factors, or as well, I mean, with, in complex with ribosome antibiotics. Uh, and we also try to understand how these antibiotics work and how the resistance, how the resistance mechanisms operate to prevent those antibiotics from acting. So we can uh, view ribosome as a molecular 3D printer that uh, prints proteins in a cell. So uh, of course my opinion is very much biased, but I would say that what ribosome is doing is one of the most important fundamental processes in the, uh, in the cell. So what it does, I mean, it uses information from the messenger RNA to translate it into the sequence of amino acids uh, and make proteins. So we all made out of proteins, and those proteins are made by the ribosomes in our cells. And not only our cells have ribosomes, but also the nasty bacteria uh, that try to uh, infect us and sometimes kill. So the ribosome is actually interesting not only because of its fundamental function of protein synthesis, but also because uh, there is a lot of uh, molecules, which we call antibiotics, that target that very ribosome. So there are several major targets in bacterial cell that, uh, that are targeted by antibiotics such as cell wall, for example, or DNA gyrase. But the ribosome, perhaps, I mean, is the, uh, the most, uh, I mean, popular target among antibiotics. I mean, so there are more than half of all clinically used ones today are the ones which target bacterial ribosome. So antibiotics that target ribosome uh, follow the same trends as any other antibiotics. So that bacteria that uh, we're trying to kill with these antibiotics quickly develop resistance. Not quickly, but they adapt, I mean, to the, uh, to the presence of the drugs and they evolve various mechanisms to uh, counteract uh, antibiotics, I mean, that we use to kill them. So, and this is nicely shown, I mean, by this timeline. So, which shows, I mean, that the years, I mean, when the different drugs we introduce onto the market, and uh, the years when the particular, uh, like the first type of resistance have been, uh, have been recorded or have been noticed for this particular, uh, particular drug. Sometimes, I mean, there are bizarre cases, I mean, that the drug have not even made it to the market and the resistance was already recorded. So, um, is there any way or is there something that we can do to tackle this problem? Uh, before uh, trying to answer this question, uh, we need to understand how the antibiotic works and how the mechanisms of resistance work as well. 
So uh, as you can imagine today we're going to be talking mainly about ribosomal antibiotics and those guys target functional centers of the ribosome. There are, main, uh, there are three main centers such as decoding center on the small ribosomal subunit. This is a place or the spot where the uh, basically where the sequence of nucleotides in the messenger RNA is being recognized by the uh, trans RNA molecule that carries an amino acid. And basically this is the genetic function of the ribosome. Another important uh, functional site is the peptidyl transferase center. That's where the chemistry occurs. So this is where the amino acids are polymerized to form the, uh, to form the polypeptide chain that emerges through the, uh, through the uh, uh, nascent peptide exit tunnel. This is another uh, site. All of the sites are targeted by, uh, by antibiotics. But as you can imagine, as in the case with many peptides for which uh, main inhibitors target the catalytic site, Many drugs target the catalytic center of the ribosome, peptidyl transferase center. So here just only, uh, this is just the tip of the iceberg. So there's just only a few of, uh, uh, of those molecules. Each of them represent a particular chemical class. All of these chemical classes are unrelated, such as phenicols, lincosamides, oxidolidinones, pleuromutilins, streptogramin C, and many more. So what unites all of this, uh, all of these molecules is that they all, despite being completely different in terms of their chemistry, they all bind in that spot shown by the, uh, by one yellow representative here, but this is a chloramphenicol. So they all bind in exactly the same spot in the uh, bacterial ribosome. Uh, and what is important for us to know uh, in terms of resistance is this nucleotide uh, 2503, adenine 2503 of the 23 s ribosomal RNA that is adjacent to the site of most of this, to the adjacent to the binding site of most of these antibiotics. Again, this is just a regular adenine nucleotide in the 23 s ribosomal RNA. But what is interesting is that this nucleotide is normally methylated, uh, post transcriptionally methylated by an enzyme called RLMN. And uh, in all bacterial ribosomes, it's, an, uh, it's usually present in the form of the uh, methylated, uh, uh, I mean, C2 methylated adenine 2503. However, there is an enzyme called CFR, standing for chloramphenicol fluorphenicol resistance, that also can modify this nucleotide at position C8. So, and when this nucleotide is methylated at position C8, uh, such ribosome becomes resistant to all of these drugs, I mean, that I showed you in the previous slide. Again, it's important to mention that these are, it becomes resistant not just to one drug, not to several drugs, but to many classes, each of which contains many, many molecules. So, so one methyl group on a giant ribosome, uh, resistance to, uh, I mean, I won't say hundreds, but at least many dozens of uh, various antibiotics. Let's see how it, how it is manifested. Uh, uh, basically microbiologically. If we take, let's say, a gram-positive strain of Staphorius and try to uh, inhibit its growth with one of these uh, molecules such as lincomycin or clindamycin, we will need two micrograms per mil of uh, this or point 0.125, I mean, of the other one to stop the growth of this bacteria. And if we express this enzyme, CFR, in the same strain, we would need hundreds, if not thousands of times more uh, drug to uh, basically to achieve the same effect. Which, I mean, yeah, that still means that we can inhibit the growth, but I mean, in, practi uh, in practical terms, uh, these concentrations are not achievable, let's say, in the blood of a, uh, of a human, I mean, so that they are therapeutically irrelevant. So essentially, this is, this is how resistance is manifested. And if we look structurally, we can see uh, that, uh, that the methyl group on this nucleotide 2503 simply uh, sterically clash, I mean, with the ribosome-bound clindamycin. And as we know, uh, two objects cannot take the same space, so, so that one of them or the other or both have to make some concessions. I mean, so if uh, in most cases, I mean, so that results in basically displacement of the drug, so it does not bind the way it's supposed to. There is another type of resistance which is very similar to the one which I just mentioned. It's called ERM, erythromycin resistance methyl transferase. So in this case, another nucleotide, also in 23S ribosomal RNA called A2058, which is next to it, is methylated either at position 6 
or two times at position six. So it's dimethylated adenine. So and when it's uh, dimethylated, it actually uh, becomes strongly resistant to another class of antibiotics called macrolides. But what is important uh, for us is that it also uh, operates against lincosomites, against that clindamycin that I just showed you in the previous slide. So and again, structurally, it's also very similar. So the presence of the methyl group uh, on the nucleotide 2508, and you can see 2508 is really close to 2503. Uh, in the, again, in linear sequence, they're far away, but in 3D space, they're almost next to each other, and actually they form the same staking. Uh, uh, so and we can see that the methyl groups on the uh, nucleotide 2058 essentially clash with the ribosome-bound drugs, so causing the same effect, so displacement of the drugs. So either CFR or ERM, each of them can cause high levels of resistance to lincosomites. And as a result of that, I mean, these are the most common clinical types of resistance to these uh, drugs. Uh, and as a result, the current use of lincosomites is limited due to, due to these uh, genes being spread out among clinical pathogens. So, and uh, uh, there are actually only two uh, clinical, rep clinical drugs, I mean, from this class, uh, lincomycin and clindamycin, so which were introduced into the market back in 19, uh, like in 60s, at the end, in the end of 60s. And ever since, there were many attempts to improve and come up with the better ones, nothing. So these are the only ones which are still using. So uh, perhaps, I mean, you heard this name, uh, uh, clindamycin, because it's still being used. So in collaboration with our colleagues uh, from, uh, from Harvard with the, with the group of Andrew Myers, so we, uh, uh, we basically started to study these uh, molecules and to see what can be done to improve them. And arbitrary, this molecule can be subdivided into two parts. So if we hydrolyze them in this amide bond uh, right in the middle of the molecule, it will, will get two fragments. The one uh, on the top would be an amino octose. That, that is arbitrary called northern hemisphere. And there is this uh, sophisticated proline residue which, uh, which, which constitutes southern hemisphere. So in the previous work with, uh, with Professor Myers and his colleagues, I mean, so they came, they came up with this molecule called iboxamycin. As you can see, the northern hemisphere is uh, unchanged. It's the same as in clindamycin. And the only part that has been uh, evolved, that has been changed, I mean, is the southern one. So now instead of just this uh, extended proline residue, we have an oxypanoprolinamide here. This molecule started to wear, work uh, impressively well against drug-resistant clinical uh, isolates. So, so the main strain where, where you can observe a clear clindamycin resistance shown by red here. So iboxamycin was already overcoming. So and in that work, which was published back in, uh, a few years ago, we, uh, we basically uh, done structural and chemical studies and microbiological studies to see why, what makes this molecule uh, so good. But we continued the research and we looked at the molecule more closely and we noticed that in many structures of the ribosome-bound uh, uh, lincosomites, the positions of these uh, substituents at the sulfur and this uh, chlorine are almost identical in all of them. And Basically, we came up with an idea, well, of course, more like our Harvard colleagues came up with an idea uh, to make the breach between these two uh, parts of the molecule. So what if we make a molecule that is already pre-set for binding to the ribosome? What if it will, from the beginning, would look like as if it's bound to the ribosome? So in this case, we will essentially pay the entropic cost of binding at the time of synthesis. And this is how we arrived, I mean, at this a uh, molecule we named chrysomycin, which stands for very, I would say, nerdy name, conformationally restrained microbicyclic iboxamycin, essentially. So uh, quite often, uh, trying to find, uh, trying to make the, mole the, the good molecule, try to find the uh, try to, trying to make it the best one, results in a molecule that stops working at all. So fortunately, we were lucky to improve it substantially. So chrysomycin, uh, uh, noticeably exceeds the activity of the iboxamycin. So what is important to mention here is that um, the iboxamycin was working really well against, against gram-positive uh, multi-drug resistance strain of various uh, bacteria, but still in gram-negatives it was not as active as, uh, as in gram-positives. 
in case of chrysomycin, it became like really, I mean, really much better in gram positives and also started to work really well in gram negatives. So overall, so this, uh, this molecule became, uh, shows like excellent microbiological profiles. As mo many of us know, I mean, sometimes killing bacteria or stopping the growth in a flask and killing the bacteria or stopping the growth in the bloodstream of an animal are two different tasks, I mean, so, and quite often the molecules, I mean, that do, uh, that do inhibit bacterial growth in a flask, well, do not act in animal at all. Again, fortunately, chrysomycin uh, works in animal models really well. So, for example, uh, in, uh, uh, in a sepsis model using staph aureus with CFR determinant, so resistant ones, so there is 100% survival rate, while uh, in, the, in case with the uh, vehicle control, I mean, so there is basically only one mouse out of 10 managed to survive somehow. So all other died. And the same were in the other models. But perhaps uh, the question that uh, you have in your uh, mind right now is like, what makes this molecule so much better than, uh, let's say, clindamycin or iboxamycin or all previous ones? So, and this is where the structural biology can help. So we have determined uh, several structures of chrysomycin bound to bacterial ribosome, so to wild type ribosome, and we see it very well in the electron density, and we also can see the nucleotide, which nucleotides such as 2058, where it interacts, and 2503 nearby. But we also determine the structure of the drug-resistant ribosome carrying the methylated nucleotide 2058, so, and the, and the drug bound, I'm sorry, ribosome bound molecule, as well as the methylated nucleotide 2503. So, uh, so we, have, uh, we have determined all the structures. Uh, according to the, I mean, uh, in, in basically uh, um, in, uh, in agreement with the design hypothesis, so we noticed that the structure of this molecule in solution in the uh, crystal by itself, so without the ribosome, just the drug itself, and in the ribosome bound state are almost indistinguishable. So, uh, which is again uh, exactly as we uh, were kind of uh, uh, thinking about. So the binding site of chrysomycin is identical to clindamycin and to aboxamycin, so there are no surprises here. And uh, instead of showing you the static image of how this uh, molecule interacts with the ribosome, I would rather show you a 3D movie, which kind of gives a much better impression uh, of uh, how this molecule binds to the ribosome and how it managed to evade the resistance mechanisms. So, so we have a bacterial ribosome with a small and large subunit with three tRNA molecules and the messenger RNA shown in magenta. Uh, and we see the antibiotic shown in yellow bound at the beginning of the uh, ribosomal tunnel. So, so this molecule binds in the peptidyl transferase uh, center of the, uh, of the bacterial ribosome right next to the amino acid of the uh, tRNA. So as we can see, this molecule uh, forms a lot of interactions with the nucleotides. So uh, for example, its oxypanoprolinamide group shown here uh, in, uh, intercalates into the acyte cleft. That's where the amino acids normally come in. And this is what makes it a competitive inhibitor, essentially. So it also forms a number of hydrogen bonds with various uh, nucleotides uh, lining the peptide exit tunnel of the ribosome. So it, it really anchors itself extremely well in the, uh, in the active side of the ribosome. But now let's focus on this particular interaction with the nucleotide 2058, these two hydrogen bonds. So if this nucleotide would be methylated by the ER methyl transferase, obviously those hydrogen bonds would be impossible. And the drug, I mean, so shouldn't be even be able to bind to such a ribosome because there are clear uh, clash with those methyl groups. However, what happens in the methylated ribosome is that this nucleotide makes a concession and moves away. So, uh, uh, so, it, uh, so the drug, I mean, can still engage the methylated ribosome uh, and, and bind well. And now, I mean, uh, what was even more surprising is that a very similar thing happens, I mean, on the other side, I mean, uh, in case of the 2503 methylated nucleotide. So, so here, the only difference is that it's not only the nucleotide that makes a concession, but also the drug makes a, makes a little change. I mean, this carbonyl group deflects. So now we have a clash, but uh, once I mean this, uh, uh, but once we'll transition it to a structure with the uh, 
uh, with, the, with the drug bound, I mean, we will see that this group will deflect and the nucleotide will move a little bit. So basically, both the drug and the methylated nucleotide can make concessions to allow accommodation of each of them. So uh, long story short, so what was impossible to predict uh, using, I mean, uh, the available data is that uh, the nucleotide, okay, the drug in the ribosome, I'm sorry, in the, in the wild type and the drug-free ribosome are exactly the same, has exactly the same conformation. And it's a nucleotide that makes a, uh, that makes a move. So the same thing happened with the CFR modified ribosome. So that the uh, drug and uh, in the wild type and the modified ribosome exactly the same. And the, only the uh, nucleotide makes, a, uh, uh, makes an adjustment. So, I would like to uh, finish here with the take -home, main take-home message, so that uh, what's important is that neither the spectrum of activity of this new molecule, chrysomycin, nor its potency could have been in the uh, resistance strain, could have been predicted by prior knowledge. So that basically shows, I mean, how important sometimes to do the actual experiment and determine the actual structures uh, of the molecules bound to their targets. Because based on all previously available structural data, there is no reason to think or believe that the nucleotide will move because they're always the same. Uh, due to lack of time, I will just skip through the other part, I mean, and go straight to acknowledgments. Of course, yeah, that was important message from the other. I'm sorry, here that's sulfur in lincosamides is the most important part. I would like to thank uh, uh, my collaborators, Andrew Myers and his team, Kelvin Wu and Ben Tresco, his graduate students, who are absolutely amazing organic chemists. So also I would like to thank uh, Shura Mankin from UIC, Jim Atkinson from Sweden, from Lund University, and Steve Gregory from uh, Rhode Island, and also uh, people in my lab, Alona and Igor, who actually did all the structural work, and Max Svetlov for all the uh, uh, biochemistry work. All members of my team uh, and those who paid for this research. With this, I would like to finish and I would be happy to take any questions. Well, Yuri, thank you for this uh, stunning uh, short talk and um, we have uh, maybe uh, time for one question. Yeah, Yuri, so awesome. Um, so are there any of these other antibiotics that bind the ribosome that can, you can use the same trick of kind of conformational restriction to prove? I mean, if you look that, that was far? the first of its kind, I mean, so. Right. So, uh, so you can do it again, is that right? Huh? You should be able to do it again then, right? Just... Probably, yeah. So, but, but what was interesting, so that conformational restriction apparently improves, I mean, the KD. So it, so it improves the affinity. And I would say that I even have a publication, I mean, a few years ago in which we showed, I mean, that not, I mean, the, the higher KD does not necessarily translate in better activity. So in, over there in that study, we got a molecule which has 10 times better KD, but uh, does not work at all, actually. So like, does not even inhibit protein synthesis in vitro, not even talking about uh, uh, inhibiting bacteria. So. Uh, I think, I mean, here we were just lucky that it worked. I mean, so it probably will not work in every single case. So, so, but apparently it's an interesting concept. I mean, that you make the molecule look like it should be on the target. And if that molecule can get in the cell and will not be metabolized and destroyed before that, so then its engagement with the target would be better so it can be translated into better activity. Right, yeah, great stuff. Right, so let's uh, thank uh, Yuri again.
All right, welcome everyone to this last talk of this series. Uh, my name is Terry Moore, I'm an Associate Professor of Pharmaceutical Sciences here at UIC, and it's really a pleasure today to be able to introduce my postdoc advisor, Dr. Dennis Leota from Emory University. You know, I think one of the best things that we've done in medicine over the last maybe 50 years is the invention of HIV therapeutics. So if you think about the 1980s, it was effectively a um, it, you were going to effectively die if you had HIV. And now, in the 90s, people were taking a pill a day and leaving, leading normal lives. And so this was a huge advancement, partially thanks to Dr. Leota, who discovered emtricitabine, um, which is one of the first reverse transcriptase inhibitors. Um, beyond that, though, he's done other things, including founding the Emory Institute for Drug Development, as well as Drive, which is a company that I think I'll tell you a bit about today. He's also done some drug discovery efforts with Africa, and then he was also the founding editor of ACS Medicinal Chemistry Letters. Um, he's incredibly well respected in the field and just a, a really good and nice person as well. And so uh, please join me in, in welcoming Dr. Leota today. First, thank you very much to the organizing committee for inviting me. Um, and also, thank you for the fantastic group of speakers here. I, was, um, I learned a lot today, and uh, so I hope I can continue to um, the trend and, and uh, keep, keep you awake in this final minutes of, of the presentation. Um, so, uh, most of us here are academic scientists, and uh, we love doing what we do. But I thought in the beginning of the talk, I would step back from just plunging into research and do a little overview of academic drug discovery so we could um, put it in proper perspective, because I think the stuff that goes on here is quite amazing. First, just in general, what about academic research? What is the public's perception of academic research? Well, a long time ago when I was in elementary school, um, one of my teachers said, well, if you don't, if you don't know what, what's going on, just look up the definition in the dictionary. So I, before I came here, I pulled out an old dictionary that I had, and I looked it up. So here's research, and research is the kind of activity that you can be very, very proud of. A careful or diligent search, studious inquiry or examination. Uh, it's, it's, it's quite a noble task. When you look up academic, the record is a little more mixed. Um, it's um, associated with the academy, but C, very learned, but inexperienced in practical matters. Okay. Uh, but they do say thinkers, so that's not bad. But then when you get to the bottom, really bothers me, having no practical or useful significance. And the, uh, the synonym is pedantic, right? So that, and, and, and uh, I, I once said that's a pejorative term uh, in a, a foreign country, and people didn't know what pejorative meant, so I thought I'd throw in one other definition for the record. Uh, but I decided a long time ago that I didn't want to do work that had no practical or useful significance. And that's how I got into um, academic drug discovery and development. By the way, you'll always hear me throw in the and development part, because I like the idea of taking a concept, an idea, a conception, and bringing it to the end point, a product or service that benefits the health of the public. So let's look at what we're up against. Let's look at our competition. So if we look at pharma and biotech, they have huge amounts of earmarked funding. They have clear commercial goals, an integrated pipeline, large multidisciplinary teams, 
rigorous project management practices, business development, a skill we lack very dearly in, in academics, intellectual property strategists, not just people who process our, our, our uh, disclosures, but strategists who plan out uh, an intellectual property picket fence so you can have exclusivity, and the willingness to invest in high risk, high return profits. That is an awesome list. If you look up the list I've compiled for academia, it's a little more aspirational. There's not a lot of things here, but there's one really important point. Basic scientific research without the per pressure of commercial viability. And we, we saw example after example today of how that basic research is now laying a foundation from which others can build um, new therapeutics that can address unmet medical needs. So don't ever forget that, but also realize that what we do is really uphill in terms of our competition. Um, and we're not really competitors in the sense that at some point, if we discover something good, we're always going to have to pass the baton on to commercial sector partners because we can't afford to do clinical trials in general. But while we're still in that uh, preclinical stage, they are our competitors, and we have to find ways of dealing with that competition so that we have a chance to be successful. Uh, and just for those who haven't thought about this in economic terms, when you go talk to an investor uh, and you tell them your idea, if I said, you know, um, I had this idea at 3 o'clock in the morning, it, it, I think it's the best idea I have ever had. And I tell it to an investor, they're going to say, well, that's nice. Uh, but as far as I'm concerned, the risk associated with your idea is 100%. You have no data, you have nothing. So I go back to my lab and we start um, doing experiments, we start getting data, and we start lowering risk, and we start adding value to our technology. And in the beginning, we're doing it at relatively low cost. Now, value is kind of a funny thing in, in terms of technology because it's not linear. It's a step function. And there are well-determined uh, points where you will see a value increase. And we call those value inflection points. So as you're going along, you can be doing 20 different experiments, but maybe the first value inflection point is you show that your compound is active in cell culture and not very toxic. And then you go and do other experiments, and then you, you do an in vivo experiment, and you show that it's active in vivo. And that's a value inflection point. And these go along, and, and so uh, you, have to, you have to plan for these value inflection points. And the problem is that none of us, at least I wasn't trained in any of these uh, skills, and that's where having people who understand business development, who understand intellectual property, can be so valuable to the efforts that we're all trying to do. And it's one of the things I like to preach to deans, for example, uh, that th these are good things to do. Um, and, and if we look at our competitors, there's, these are pretty heavy duty people. When I was getting started, the biotech companies were all small little startups. Now we have biotech companies like Moderna. My goodness, they're worth you know, hundreds of billions of dollars. And, and, so, and of course, our academic colleagues uh, have some heavy, heavy duty um, uh, drug discovery units here. So we better be very good at what we do if we're going to do it. Uh, so this is a, a the, the top is boilerplate, uh, just a little description of my team. I've tried to build it out. We have almost 40 people in our group made up of scientists, postdocs, graduate students, undergrads. We have a, a, an administrative support team, a bioanalytical team to do profiling, uh, a formulation team, an excellent computational team, as well as an in-house IP manager, I do a lot of patenting, and he drafts all our, our patent applications. 
Uh, and uh, some of you know these are the, um, the, the drugs that, or drug combinations that achieved uh, FDA approval. And um, every one of them had their own NDA. Uh, so this is a, a serious business. And these are other compounds from our lab that uh, either had made it into clinical trials or currently are in clinical trials. So we've done a pretty good job in getting there. And I'd like to tell you a couple of stories about this because I think they can be instructive in terms of how we actually um, can address our competitors and from time to time beat them. All right. So first, um, look at the title, Having Superior Enabling Technology. So when we got started, um, the, these compounds on the, you see on the bottom right, uh, these were oxythiolene nucleosides. Um, they were unnatural compounds. There was a couple of reports of them that were scattered around, but nobody knew how to make them. And there was a poster at an international AIDS conference that said that these compounds were uh, potent and reasonably non-toxic. The poster dealt with a racemate. Uh, but the compounds were very difficult to make using traditional technology. So we developed a method that worked exceptionally well. The, the, the problem, the first problem was a diastereoselectivity problem. The, um, the oxythiolene ring, um, thank you, that's great. The oxythiolene ring is, is basically flat and the only uh, facial differentiating agent is this protected hydroxymethyl group. And if you, if you do almost anything, you get about a 50-50 mixture of attack from the top and the bottom, and these were almost impossible to separate. So I, I knew that um, uh, high valent tin had a high affinity for sulfur, and so we simply threw in stannic chloride. Um, now uh, this stereodifferentiating group has its effect amplified because when the tin is on top, there's severe steric clashes, so it, it complexes on the bottom and it basically blocks the bottom side and glycosylation occurs exclusively on the top, exclusively, 300 to one. The second step was to resolve this and uh, it doesn't seem very innovative um, in 2024 to use an enzyme to resolve it, but back in 1990, um, we were able to do this on a multigram scale. We scanned uh, a series of commercially available enzymes and used pig liver esterase. And this was, uh, to me, very uh, so much fun because you do this in an in aqueous acetonitrile, this, this PLE uh, resolution. And it goes, it's almost textbook. It goes to about 50% and basically stops. There's about a thousand fold reactivity difference uh, with one enantiomer versus the other. And that, um, and then what happens is that the hydrolyzed material is very water soluble, but the unhydrolyzed butyrate ester is still quite soluble in organic solvents. So we separate the two enantiomers by just partitioning them in a separatory funnel. So that was really, really simple. We got access to both enantiomers. We found out the, uh, the so-called unnatural enantiomer was very potent and very active. And the outcome of this is, um, is shown here. Um, we started this work in 1989. Um, Emtricitabine, its generic name, or Emtriva, its brand name, is now still uh, one of the most widely used therapeutics um, for HIV therapy. It's still first-line therapy. Uh, we received uh, $525 million and a, uh, a royalty right, rights monetization in 2005. Um, also, the related compound where this is a hydrogen, Epivir was the first approved drug for treating hepatitis B. And we made about $150 million 
in intellectual property revenue from this. Most importantly, these things uh, continue to be impactful. The money that we made was nice, it catalyzed a bunch of things in the university, but millions of people stay alive because these are first-line therapies that uh, we estimate um, about 90 plus percent of patients on HIV therapeutics take or have taken one of these drugs. And one of the most interesting parts of this was in the mid-90s, um, this idea of highly active uh, antiretroviral therapy, we now call it C-ART, um, where people took combinations because the combinations were the only way to suppress the onset of resistance. Uh, well, uh, patients were taking um, 15 to 20 pills every eight hours, okay? Now, imagine every day of your life having to take pills every eight hours. It's not just the tedious part of it. It is if you miss it, you might get to a sub-therapeutic dose that allows the emergence of resistant mutants and maybe those therapies don't work. So there are, there are better combinations now, but to, to most of us who are in this game, uh, atripla, which was approved in 2006, three drugs in one pill, once a day, was the game changer, right? And this allowed people um, who used to have death sentences when they received the notice they were positive for HIV AIDS, uh, could, they could lead a normal life. So this was um, very exciting. Here's a second case I wanna talk to you about. Hepatitis C uh, was also quite a scourge. Um, we, we used to call it in the 80s non-A, non-B, and that was because they knew there was a virus there, but it, they couldn't identify it, and if they couldn't identify it, they couldn't exclude it from the blood supply. So many people who had blood transfusions in the 70s and 80s contracted hepatitis C. And um, in, in Egypt, uh, during some vaccination campaign, uh, they decided to reuse needles. Uh, they were cleaning them in between, but apparently not uh, sufficiently enough. And so if you looked uh, at the percentages of HCV positive patients in Egypt, it was off the charts. And it's because um, the uh, transmission of body fluids is how the, the virus spreads. So this was a really serious problem. And um, we, by 1998, uh, I had been working in nucleoside analogs for a long time. I knew these compounds um, pretty well. And since the polymerase associated with hepatitis C is an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, um, I knew we were gonna need a, a ribonucleoside analog of some kind to, um, to solve the problem. Um, from an intellectual property perspective, however, it was a, it was a nightmare because there were, there were so many hundreds, thousands of ribonucleosides that were already known that it was gonna be very difficult to get a novel structure. So um, I, I knew that uh, the carbon-fluorine bond was isosteric with the carbon-oxygen bond, and this helped us from an IP perspective, there, are, there were some, but a much smaller number of two prime uh, fluoro derivatives. And also, the methyl uh, had been used in uh, antisense oligonucleotides, and we knew that, at least in many cases, uh, the methyl could be accept, uh, acceptable. What we didn't know at the time until, uh, but we were, it was very fortuitous, is that addition of this methyl uh, made these compounds very poor substrates for endogenous um, uh, ribo ribonucleotide polymerases. So we wiped out an entire potential class of toxicity by just having this methyl group in there. And so this was really quite an important 
achievement, we then handed this over to uh, the guys at Pharmaset, a company that my colleague Raymond Shinazi and I started, and uh, they had a really good group of virologists, and they found out that this uracil derivative um, had a kinase blockage. That is, that first phosphorylation was very, very inefficient, so we never formed a, a lot of the required triphosphate. So what the Pharmaset guys did was they made a monophosphate prodrug, which unravels first by um, proteolytic cleavage and then uh, a nucleophilic attack of phosphorus, uh, of oxygen on phosphorus, loss of phenoxide, uh, chemical hydrolysis, and then finally um, cleavage of the PN bond by a phosphoramidase. Uh, and, and that now led to this, uh, what can only be described as a blockbuster drug. So prior to this, patients on hepatitis C were treated with pegylated interferon and ribavirin, and uh, the, the therapy went from 30 to 50 weeks, and they had flu-like uh, flu symptoms the entire time. Um, on the label that FDA gave them, it, they had um, suicidal ideation. Uh, and uh, this compound, as a monotherapy, surprisingly enough, um, uh, cured about 80% of the patients. It's taken once a day uh, for 12 weeks, and um, uh, about 80% were cured uh, as other hep C drugs became available and combinations became available they were able to clean up uh, many of those other more serious uh, cases. And so this worked out well. Um, the company that we started uh, was acquired by Gilead Sciences for $11.2 billion. Um, I used to say $11 billion until one of my colleagues reminded me that $0.2 billion is $200 million. And, and so I don't do rounding off anymore on that. Um, so this was, this was quite a good success. And then one more story. Um, uh, I showed you this, di uh, this slide before, but we wondered if we could do something to level the playing field. Um, and I've, I've highlighted these four boxes. So suppose we had some, some larger uh, multidisciplinary teams and some project management, and some business development specialists, and some IP strategists. Um, could we do something faster than we were able to do? Because m tricytabine that saga took 13 years. The Pharmacet story took 12 years. Could we somehow compress the time timeline? Um, and so we started something we call DRIVE, it stands for Drug Innovation Ventures at Emory. And, um, uh, and we brought in people from the commercial sector, all who were experienced in drug development. And, um, and then we set up uh, a parallel unit called the Emory Institute for Drug Development uh, that was managed by the DRIVE uh, uh, leadership team. And this group really worked very well uh, and I'll show you just one of their successes. So how do you prepare for a pandemic? We've been asking that for the last four years. Um, and um, we started to think about that in 2014. Um, my colleague George Painter, who was the, the, the leader of this project, um, noted that single-stranded RNA viruses uh, account for about 80% of the viral disease burden worldwide. And so if you're thinking about it, um, if there's a chance that we're, we're gonna have a pandemic, then it seemed like there was probably a, a good chance that one of these single-stranded RNA viruses would be the problem. But of course, which ones? Because there are hundreds, maybe, maybe even thousands of different viruses. Uh, so 
uh, we said, uh, oh, and by the way, uh, sorry, uh, if we leave out hep C, and we leave out, of course, HIV, which are RNA uh, viruses, and all the other, and there are, there are a huge number of them, we really don't have any drugs for those viruses. Um, and you might ask why. They're potentially catastrophic. But of course, from a commercial perspective, there are no markets for these drugs. Uh, pharma isn't going to invest a uh, billion dollars or two billion dollars to prepare a drug when there's no market. So how do you create a market? Well, unfortunately, you create it with a pandemic, right? We started looking early and we said, well, uh, what if we look for something that's broadly active? If it's broadly active, then we stand a chance that whatever that particular virus is, we might be able to s suppress it and control it. So uh, here's a compound that we found uh, fairly early on. We, it's, it's an old compound, anhydroxycytidine. We, we used our EIDD number, 1931. We found that it was active against many single-stranded RNA viruses. And um, with a little modification, this compound doesn't have the best permeability. Uh, but if you make an isobutyrate ester, um, it, is, it is active against many of these, uh, importantly, including SARS-CoV-2. And the outcome was that um, Merck developed this, uh, and it got emergency use authorization. Uh, so far, we've made $400 million from this. Uh, it was one of two uh, oral SARS-CoV-2 drugs that was approved. Um, it operates by a unique mechanism of action that I'm very interested in, because this is the error catastrophe mechanism, or uh, sometimes referred to as lethal mutagenesis, where uh, you create so many mutants, so many mismatches, that the, uh, the viral strains in question are not, uh, they no longer replication competent. And, and you can think about this mechanism in a simple way. This, uh, this imine-like double bond is uh, in uh, a tautomeric equilibrium with the oximino derivative, and they're, they're energetically close. So these two things, you can, uh, the, the polymerase can think it's an incorporating a U, but after incorporation, it can tautomerize to a C. And, uh, and so you get massive mismatches. And why this is important is it circumvents the needs for, for combination therapy, right? Every time, if there's a pandemic, we don't have the luxury of saying, okay, well, we have one drug, now give us a little more time, we'll get two others, and we'll get the combinations that we need to control this, right? So something that, that can work as a monotherapy is really super important, and that's what we were able to do over at Dry VIDD. Um, now, my group right now is doing many projects, um, and so for the next two hours, no, just kidding. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna, I'll just tell you a little bit about um, two projects. The last one is very quick, but I think it's interesting. Uh, the first involves uh, a surface receptor, CXCR4, and it's, um, it's, it's a, I've been fascinated with this uh, for a while. It was discovered in the mid-1990s as one of two co-receptors that allow uh, HIV to enter into immune cells. And um, it is important in regulating the movement of hematopoietic stem cells. CXCR4 is the only functional surface receptor on hematopoietic stem cells. So when you want to do, when you want to mobilize them for a variety of factors, uh, it involves CXCR4. Um, it only has one endogenous ligand, CXCL12, and these cells with it on the surface migrate around 
by following a chemical gradient. Wherever there's a large amount of CXCL12, they'll migrate to, they'll home to those sites. And those sites happen to be the sites that we typically associate uh, with metastases, lung, liver, lymph nodes, bone marrow, et cetera. Um, so this is an important part of the metastatic phenotype. Um, it, it also plays an important role in, in, um, in leukocytes uh, and how they, how they mature and how they mobilize. And uh, overexpression of CXCR4 drives proliferation, angiogenesis, and metastatic expansion by highlighting this gradient uh, driven um, movement of, of the cells. Uh, there are over 48 different um, tumor types that uh, have CXCR4 overexpressed. Um, and th so there are opportunities in HIV entry. Uh, for a long time, we've thought about the fact that there is this CCR5 antagonist that's already approved. If we had a good CXCR4 antagonist, we could make a combination therapy that could shut off entry. Um, uh, we've known about this for a long time. The question was, did we have something safe enough to do it? And uh, we, the answer is yes, we do. I, I, it remains to be seen whether it's still worth doing. Um, but there are still opportunities here. Um, uh, some of you may have heard uh, recently that due to uh, um, gene editing techniques, uh, they were able to, uh, uh, to cure a, um, a sickle cell patient. And a sickle cell uh, cannot be mobilized using the traditional GCSF that is, is often used. Uh, it, it, it can lead to um, um, severe morbidity and often death. So having a good CXCR4 antagonist to mobilize these could be very, very useful. And there are, there is one approved, Mozabil, uh, but uh, as I'll show you, uh, we have stuff that is much better. And um, let me just move on. There, so there are a lot of opportunities. I'll spare you all the chemistry, but uh, we started out with this um, pretty good, from a potency perspective, um, CXCR4 antagonist, uh, but it had some, some serious liabilities. Uh, it had a, a, a 2D6 liability, uh, so you can't use it if, uh, if, you, if, you're, if you're taking, if you were taking this compound and then you were taking another drug that was normally metabolized by 2D6, then this would inhibit it and the, the levels of the other drug could go up to toxic levels. So, so clearly that could work. Worse, it had uh, very bad permeability, and if you can't get your drug through the intestinal wall, it's not going to be orally available. Um, so we, um, and you notice it's got all these rotatable bonds, so that's a red flag. Clearly, we, we don't want that. We tried various rigidification mechanisms, and then one day I had this idea, well, instead of however this amino group is hanging out in space, maybe we could put a nitrogen in a similar uh, uh, position in three-dimensional space by just hooking a, uh, a heterocycle to this position of the aromatic ring. And we did that. Um, the profiles of these compounds now became dramatically better, and we got some really excellent compounds. And um, uh, the, the only point of showing you all these numbers, uh, this is our, this is, um, a competitor that uh, is ahead of us. It's uh, uh, completed phase three trials. Um, and um, uh, in, in just about every respect, we're better. We have a bunch of backup compounds that we hope to be able to use for other things. Notice it, it's, it's chemokine specific. It doesn't affect any of the other uh, chemokine uh, that we might deal with. And notice that we've been able to correct uh, many of the defects here in our competitors' compound that are shown in red. Um, and um, this, um, 
I don't know how many of you have ever talked to venture capitalists. It's a really fun experience. Uh, and uh, they'll, they'll, you'll go there with a lot of exciting results, you think, and they'll say, great. So you're hitting this target. You'll show them the animal uh, data that you have, and they'll say, what is your evidence for human target in, in, uh, engagement? And the first time I heard that, I said, well, didn't you see all the animal data? No, no, human target engagement. Well, how can I engage human targets if I don't have an IND yet? And they said, yeah, I guess not. <laughs> so it, it, it's sort of a, a catch-22, right? But we can, we can take... Um, uh, this 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 is mouse, but we can uh, we can get um, the human counterparts, and we can look at these things ex vivo and demonstrate that we can get uh, uh, target engagement. And you can see again this this compound, uh, our competitors' compound. If we just look at hematopoietic stem cells, um, uh, this has a nice nice enough number, 52 nanomolar, but you can see we're much more potent. Uh, and uh, we have much better oral availability, et cetera. Um, also, we can, we can mobilize other leukocytes. So here's neutrophils. And uh, when people get chemotherapy, they suffer uh, a problem called chemotherapy-induced neutropenia. Uh, so for about a five-day period, they don't have any neutrophils to uh, defend themselves against any kind of pathogen that might attack. It's a very dangerous situation. And, um, uh, and there's no really good way of, of dealing with it. There are patches, new last the patches, and other things you could put on. But they take a long time to start to, to, um, to generate new neutrophils. Uh, uh, we can use these compounds to, um, uh, to mobilize neutrophils. And I, I, just to show you, uh, this is, of course, dose-dependent. But I, if you look way down on the bottom here, this dotted line, that's the IC90 for these compounds. So even at, even at 3 milligrams per kilogram, we're well above the IC90 for these compounds. So that we think they have some really interesting uses. And one more thing, uh, we think they'll be useful in immuno-oncology settings. Uh, this is a, an immunocompetent animal model for renal cell carcinoma. And just to show you what happens when you give this CXCR4 antagonist, um, you, if you look at effector cells, and of course you want the effector cells to end up in the tumor, right? You look and you see how many, how many CD8s are still in bone marrow. Um, our competitor has, uh, not, hasn't done much. Uh, we've exhausted all the CD8s in bone marrow. We've, we've mobilized them out of bone marrow. How many are in blood? We've, we've gotten them out of blood, and we've allowed them to infiltrate into the tumor. So we think this has a lot of interesting opportunities. One more, um, uh, there's an angiogenic component here, and when we combine our compound with doxataxel, uh, which is a, a, a clinically approved uh, anti-angiogenic compound, uh, we can see that uh, we're, we're down at the, the baseline. We've completely shut off any blood supply growth here. So these compounds have very good potential. And if, if I could be allowed two minutes to tell you one other very quick story, I think you might enjoy it. Um, we, we, have, we have a pretty good portfolio here. Um, a subject I've been interested in in a long time, uh, which is traumatic brain injury and stroke. Uh, you know, there are no drugs available to treat these, and, and, and these have tremendous um, uh, morbidity and mor mortality associated with it. Strokes oftentimes occur in the evening for some reason I never fully understood, and many people will say, well, if I don't feel better in the morning, I'll go into the hospital. Well, you have about three or four hours before a massive um, inflammatory cascade occurs, and that's where all the tissue damage that's so debilitating occurs in a stroke. 
So we, we have a, a problem associated with it. A colleague found uh, that progesterone uh, might be an excellent compound for, um, for uh, treating traumatic brain injuries and strokes. Um, and this was based on epidemiology. Um, he found that pregnant women had a much better recovery rate from traumatic brain injuries than men. And if you look at uh, their baseline levels versus uh, at trimester one, two, and three, you can see that some of the levels of progesterone go through the roof. First thing it tells you is progesterone is very safe because uh, people survive pregnancies every day, uh, you know, unless you live in Texas or something like that. Uh, but um, but uh, the, the problem, uh, and, and they, they actually did some clinical trials, phase two clinical trials, and it did show a significant reduction in morbidity and mortality. Um, but the trials ultimately failed in phase three, and um, the, the problem, I seem to have lost my hair. The, the problem is that they were given, let's see, huh, it's not showing up very well, but notice here that the um, um, total infusion time was 96 hours, 120 hours. Uh, there was never enough drug on board in that, in that critical period of time to, to deal with them. So um, we asked the question, um, can we make progesterone more soluble? Seems really simple, right? Um, and so what we did briefly was we added this oxime, and we used that to put solubilizing agents on. Uh, the best one I initially was this palm derivative, which gets cleaved by a phosphatase, and then the uh, acetal just uh, hydrolytically cleaves to generate progesterone. And this worked very well. We saw a large reduction in animal studies in brain edema, uh, and we got material that was very highly soluble, and this is now in a phase one clinical trial uh, for stroke. Um, for those of you who, who use to target enzymes, enzyme levels differ sometimes uh, in different uh, groups, ethnic groups, sometimes from individual to individual. So we tried another strategy, which is also very interesting, and it's based on pH. Uh, that is, we, we, uh, we built a self-emulative um, prodrug, which when the nitrogen is protonated, does nothing. When it's free, it can cyclize to free up the material, and in fact, uh, we see we can tune this depending on the structures to get any release profile that we want. So this one is almost instantaneous. This one is slower. Whatever the profile the, the, the meds tell us they, they want, we can get them. And just to end up, um, we find that the, the POM derivative, which is in clinical trials, the, these new compounds are twice as soluble. Why do we care about the solubility? Well, we'd ultimately like to be able to treat concussion. It's a, it's a terrible problem. There are no good tr treatments for concussion. So my dream is to have um, every EMT have an EpiPen filled with one of these compounds. And if there's an, uh, a, a collision on the soccer field or a football field, or if you happen to be in Florida and somebody's riding along uh, on their motorcycle and gets in an accident, and there's no helmet law in Florida, and then Florida man wins again, uh, then, uh, <laughs> then, you know, uh, uh, we can stabilize them on the spot and, and then get them to treatment. And I, I, I'm, I'm very excited about that opportunity. So uh, I've gone over, I apologize, and um, I hope you've enjoyed our little tour uh, in, uh, in drug discovery and development. And once again, thanks to the UIC people for having me here.
All right, any questions? Yeah, Tashi. Uh, good talk, uh, very nice talk. Um, just, uh, I guess, personal or like general question, like what's your secret of um, like getting so many drugs in the clinic trial? Is it like knowing your way around pa uh, patent or like what, what other things would help? <laughs> yeah, so it, it's, uh, it, it's many things, but ultimately um, it's resilience, right? You, uh, it, I'm telling you the successful parts of the story. There have been so many impediments, so many setbacks, and um, you, you stumble a lot. But if you believe in what you're doing, you get up and you go forward. Um, now, you have to be data-driven. If, if the data is telling you it's not gonna work, then put it to bed. But if the data is still saying it's, wor it's, it's workable, then find a way around whatever problem you're having. And, and uh, you just be, be driven by that. And, um, but then also surround yourself with a really good team. Because if anybody t tells you that they've done something on their own, they're lying. It's, it's always about the team, and it's always about the ability for the team at any given point in time, someone with the right expertise can handle the problems that need to be handled, which is why a little infrastructure here could go a long way, why you guys have such a great opportunity to really do something special, uh, and all you need is a little bit more help over and above uh, what you have. Question in the back. Have you ever visited Kitty yet, or have you ever been back? Yes. Uh, so, have I ever visited Gilead? Uh, yeah, my, my, my friends at Gilead, yes. Uh, I went there one time, and uh, it's kind of a funny story. Um, I, I, I was, we were kind of talking about war stories with my host and with some of the other people, and um, then the general counsel for Gilead came over and he said to my host, um, I hope you're not going to discuss anything proprietary with our competitor, Dr. Leota. And I, I said, your competitor? I said, I have a little lab. You've got this massive unit. Uh, and, um, and but I, I kind of got uh, some polite conversation got shown out early, and uh, they, but you know, between m and Sofosbuvir, um, they made a lot of money on my lab. And uh, I've done fine, I'm not complaining, but I, you know, it would be, uh, it would be nice every now and then for them to acknowledge that. But, uh, but thank you, yeah. Um, yeah, thank you for the presentation. I, I just have a boring medchem question. Um, so, when you, so for the pro, uh, progesterone, when you're talking about trying to increase its solubility, it, I imagine it has to pass the blood-brain barrier uh, to get into, so, oh, okay, so does it? Yes. Does it it's not a problem. It, it, it readily permeates the blood-brain barrier. It's, it's synthesized in the brain. You know, it's, it's, um, these neurosteroids are really important, and the progesterone, is the, is the tip of the iceberg. Uh, we can do the same kinds of things with many other neurosteroids. You may know that the first um, metabolite of progesterone is allopregnalolone. So the, um, the uh, ketone is reduced to an alcohol, the double bond is, is reduced, and that's allo. And allo was approved to treat postpartum depression, um, except it requires a 60-hour infusion, and for the privilege of that, I, that a woman who's suffering from postpartum depression now being separated from her newborn for four days, uh, they charge it $35,000. Um, so I think 
we can easily take aloe, well, I know it, we've done it, take aloe and make it much more soluble and create an oral uh, drug which now could be given to people, uh, to women who, who uh, are suffering from postpartum depression. Uh, they can take, they can go home, be with their newborn, and still have the benefits. And there are many other neurosteroids or neurologically active compounds that work on these same principles. You've all heard about psilocybin, the active ingredient in, in magic mushroom uh, that's being showing wonderful um, uh, outcomes with major depressive disorders. Um, and uh, um, it's, it is a natural prodrug. It's got a phosphate that gets cleaved off. Uh, there are, we can do much better because it doesn't have a long enough half-life. So there are so many things we can do with these, uh, this technology that um, uh, it, it's, that's, that's why we only show you a little, but the possibilities of just fixing a simple defect can make these drugs so much more user-friendly, so much more beneficial. Yeah, thank you. All right, and I think that we're just about at time, so um, there are a few. So let's thank Dr. Leota once more. <laughs> thank you. All right. Um, I have the honor of reminding you um, that we have a reception after this meeting on the East Terrace, so please consider joining us. Also, look around. Don't forget your items, because they are going to flip this room over for another event. Um, and then invited speakers, we ask that you stay after for just a few moments to take a group photo. Um, that is everything I have. So on behalf of uh, Dean Freeman, LAS, Professor Cho and the, um, and the organizing committee, we thank you for coming. We appreciate all of our guest speakers sharing their work um, and their time. And thank you for a wonderful day.